Section 20 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 7, Chapter 3, Part 3. Reconciliation that reconciliation to the church which was represented as a loving mother eager to welcome back to her bosom her erring children should be regarded as a punishment seems a contradiction in terms yet so it was and the suprema did not hesitate to speak of those quote, who had been condemned to reconciliation end quote. it would not be easy to invent a more emphatic illustration of the perversion of the spirit of religion by persecuting fanaticism the apostate or the heretic who had abandoned the church after admission through the waters of baptism could only be reincorporated by abjuring his errors and applying for reconciliation in the case of conversos who secretly adhered to the mosaic or mahometan law there could be no question as to this nor was there with such heretics as protestants to what extent other errors might constitute formal heresy requiring reconciliation or might infer suspicion of heresy light or vehement was a problem for the calificadores and sometimes was an intricate one for the gradations of theological error are infinite and subtle in the tumultuous proceedings of the early period when under edicts of grace penitents came forward by the thousand confessing their errors and begging for reconciliation the ceremony was naturally simple under the instructions of fourteen eighty four the form prescribed by joan andrea was to be used the inquisitors declared that the penitent had been an apostate heretic who had followed the rites and ceremonies of the jews and had incurred the penalties of the law but as he now says that he has been converted and desires to return to the faith with a pure heart and faith unfeigned and is ready to accept and perform the penances to be imposed they must absolve him from the excommunication incurred through the said crime and must reconcile him to holy mother church if as he says he is converted to the holy faith truly and without fiction no mention is made here of any subsequent ceremonies although at least abjuration must probably have followed when procedure was less hurried and there had been time for its elaboration the process became impressive the sentence recited that the penitent was admitted to reconciliation that as penance he was to appear in an auto de fe without girdle or cap in a penitential habit of yellow cloth with two red aspas or bands forming a st andrew's cross and a candle in his hand when after his sentence is read he should publicly abjure the errors confessed and all other errors and apostasy after which quote, we order him to be absolved and we absolve him from any excommunication which he has incurred and we unite and reincorporate him in the bosom and union of the holy mother catholic church and we restore him to participation in the holy sacraments and communion of the faithful end quote. to which was appended a recital of the various punishments to which he was condemned after the auto de fe was ended the abjuration was administered this was similar to the abjuration de vehementi already given and in it he consented in case of relapse to submit to the penalties of the canons on the conclusion of this he was formally absolved and the next day his abjuration was read over to him with a warning that in case of relapse he would be burnt as described in an account of the madrid auto de fe of 1632 this ceremony was imposing the penitents to be reconciled were brought before the inquisitor general who was presiding while they kneeled before him he read a short catechism comprising the creed with some additions to each question of which they answered yes i believe then the secretary recited the abjuration in which they followed him the inquisitor general then pronounced the exorcism and the customary prayers and the royal chapel chanted the miserere 
during which the chaplains of the Inquisition struck the penitents with rods on his shoulders. After this, the Inquisitor General recited the customary verses and prayers, and the royal chapel sang a hymn, while the black cloth was removed from the cross, which had been covered as a sign of mourning, and the Inquisitor General concluded the ceremonies with a hymn. Superficially, there is nothing formidable in this reception of a wandering sheep back into the fold, but the serious aspect of reconciliation, justifying its characterization as a punishment, lay in the penalties which were virtually inseparable from it, and were customarily included in the sentence, imprisonment, san benito, confiscation, and disabilities, with occasionally scourging and the galleys, some of which we have already considered, while others will be treated hereafter. There was further the fact that the canons pardoned the heretic but once. If, after reconciliation, he was guilty of reincidence, there was no mercy for him on earth, although the church in its kindness would not close the portals of heaven on him, and, if truly contrite, would admit him to the sacraments, although it would not spare him the stake. The crucial question of relapse, however, will be considered in the next chapter, and meanwhile it should be said that the Spanish Inquisition did not always enforce this cruel precept. In the later period, second reconciliations were by no means infrequent, and, even in the earlier time, men sometimes shrank from the holocausts which the strict enforcement of the rule would have caused amid a population terrorized into suddenly forswearing their ancestral faith. In Majorca, under the Edict of Grace, there were 338 reconciliations, August 18, 1488, followed by 96 on March 26, 1490. Soon after this, an Edict of Mercy was published, under which there were reconciled a second time no less than 288 of the previous penitents. One of these, Antonia, the wife of Ferrer Prats, was even reconciled a third time, June 28, 1509. Scattering cases of second reconciliations can also be found elsewhere. There was a rule that the reconciled were not to be subjected to scourging or the galleys, even though they might have deserved them by varying and revoking confessions, but I cannot find that this was observed, for, in both the earlier and later periods, cases as we have seen were numerous in which reconciliation was accompanied with these corporal punishments. On the other hand, although the principle was absolute that reconciliation carried with it confiscation and perpetual prison, cases sometimes occur in which these penalties were lightened. In the Toledo Auto of November 30, 1651, there were nine reconciliations, in which the accompanying punishments were mostly trivial. In one case, the San Benito was removed immediately on return to the Inquisition. It seems almost a travesty on solemn religious observances that effigies of the dead should be admitted to reconciliation, but, as the grave afforded no refuge from the Inquisition, this was a logical outcome of the system, when a defunct heretic had recanted and sought reincorporation with the Church. As he could not be reconciled in person, he had to be reconciled in effigy especially as the sentence was necessary to secure confiscation of his estate. The only occasion of this was the death, during trial, of a prisoner who had confessed, professed conversion, and received sacramental absolution on his deathbed. His trial would necessarily be continued and result in reconciliation, and the Inquisition saw no incongruity in parading his image before the people, and performing with it the solemn farce of reconciliation. There was a somewhat inexplicable instance in Majorca of three Judaizers, who had died in prison during their trials, in 1678, after manifesting the necessary signs of repentance. They were not included among the 212 reconciliations in the Autos de Fe of 1679, but, thirteen years afterwards, their effigies were reconciled in the auto of July 2nd, 1691, and no theologian seems to have asked himself what was their spiritual condition during this prolonged interval. 
this reconciliation in effigy was not as llorente states an innovation introduced under philip the third but was practised from the beginning for there was an instance of it in beatrix senner deceased thus reconciled may second fourteen ninety nine at barcelona apparently the age of responsibility was the only minimum limit in reconciliation in the madrid auto of sixteen thirty two catalina mendes a child of twelve was reconciled with san benito and six months imprisonment at toledo in 1659 beatrice jorge and ana pereira portuguese judaizers each ten years old were reconciled the former had her san benito removed at once the latter was sentenced to confiscation and four months in prison reconciliation brought with it one alleviation for the reconciled as penitents were entitled to the fuero of the inquisition this was derived from the penitential system of the middle ages which deprived the penitent of bearing arms during the long series of years for which penance was imposed and no one could be expected to assume it unless protected by the church against his enemies in this the inquisition stood in place of the church and cast its jurisdiction over its penitents during their term of penance in 1501 we find a certain pan basante of teruel a reconciliado to whom ferdinand had restored his confiscated property complaining to the king that he was persecuted and maltreated by his debtors and his neighbors and that the inquisitors to whom he had appealed for protection neglected to aid him whereupon ferdinand promptly ordered them to come to his assistance to enforce by their officials the payment of his just claims and to punish the aggressors so far was this carried that at granada in 1654 the reconciled penitents had an advantage in trade over the faithful by proclaiming exemption from the alcavala or royal tax on sales when the citizens complained of this discrimination the fiscal of the tribunal admitted that the question was a difficult one to subject the penitents to the royal jurisdiction would give rise to great embarrassments yet at the same time the inquisitorial jurisdiction ought to be a punishment and not a reward that it was a reward we have seen from the eagerness with which it was claimed by all who could put forward the slenderest pretext End of section twenty. Section twenty one of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume three, by Henry Charles Lee. Book seven, chapter three, part four. The Perpetual Prison imprisonment for life was the penance imposed by the canons on the heretic who under the persuasive methods of persecution sought reconciliation to the church it was so decreed indeed by pope and emperor before the inquisition was organized and that institution relentlessly enforced the laws that the spanish holy office should accept it was a matter of course its expense however had proved a source of tribulation in the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries and it was none the less so in spain for large as were the confiscations and pecuniary penances they were squandered as fast as they accrued in torquemada's supplementary instructions of december fourteen eighty four the receivers are ordered to provide for the maintenance of the prisons which shows that the sovereigns admitted their responsibility but, in the chronic financial disorder of the time, no regular provision was made, either for their establishment or support. It is true that, in 1486, at the earnest request of the inquisitors of Saragossa, Ferdinand ordered the receiver to construct a perpetual prison in accordance with their desires, but it is safe to assume that he prudently postponed replying to their inquiry as to the maintenance of the captives in fourteen ninety two when the tribunal sentenced brianda de bardaxi to five years imprisonment 
it was to the tower of Saliana, and this, in a few days, was changed to the convent of Santo Sepolero in Saragossa. In fact, for want of prisons, the custom was general of consigning reconciled penitents to strongholds, hospitals, convents, or even to their own houses, the latter presumably being such shelter as friends or kindred could afford to those who had been stripped by confiscation. The instructions of 1488, indeed, authorize inquisitors, in view of the multitudes condemned to perpetual imprisonment and the lack of prisons, to designate to the penitents their houses, where they must confine themselves under the penalties provided by the laws. But this, it was added, was only meant to be temporary, and the sovereigns were supplicated to order that, at each tribunal, the receiver should provide a large enclosure with little huts and a chapel, where the prisoners could hear mass, and could each work at his trade and earn his living, and thus relieve the Inquisition from heavy burdens, due care being taken to keep the sexes apart. The only answer to this prayer seems to have been the device of relieving the prisons for the benefit of the galleys. The laxity of quartering penitents on public institutions, or in private houses, led to impracticable rules in the effort to counteract its evils. An instruction issued about this time by the Suprema orders that no one be admitted to reconciliation without condemning him to confiscation and perpetual prison, if he has been a heretic, and those thus condemned must perform their penance most rigidly, not speaking with any one except on the days when they go to Mass and hear sermons. On other days, both in going out and in eating, they must show themselves true penitents, holding no intercourse with wives and children. This seems to have received scant obedience, and in 1506 the Suprema ordered that San Benitos be placed on all prisoners, and that they must not leave their houses, and then in 1509 it prescribed that perpetual prisons must be provided. Apparently this was partially successful, for it was followed by instructions that all who had been or should be condemned must be placed in them, where they can ply their trades, or their kindred can supply them with food, or they may beg alms for their support. Thus, in 1510, Urena selected two pairs of houses for the purpose, which Ferdinand ordered the governor of Leon to have appraised. Cuenca also seems to have obtained a prison, but an inadequate one, for in 1511 the Suprema authorized the tribunal to permit all the sick, and all who had been confined for two years, to betake themselves to their homes. Where such prisons existed, the discipline must have been exceedingly lax, for in 1512 the Suprema issued a general provision empowering the tribunals to allow the destitute occupants of the perpetual prisons to go out by turns to beg in the cities, but they must wear their sanbenitos and return by nightfall, under penalty of relapse, and this was repeated in 1513. Then the further effort to provide prisons seems to have been abandoned, for, in 1514, Jimenez issued an order permitting the reconciled to fulfill their penances in their own homes. This fluctuating policy, and the extraordinary laxity which it reveals, were not due to any humanitarian impulses. It was simply a continuous effort to shirk the responsibility of maintaining those whose property had been confiscated, and who were required by the canons to be incarcerated for life. The Inquisition obtained the plunder, it inflicted on its victims disabilities, which increased enormously the difficulty of self-support, it rendered them odious to the population by making them wear the San Benito, it was in duty bound to provide prisons where they could be immured, and prevented them from infecting the community, but it neglected this duty, and virtually told them that they might beg or starve. That death by starvation, indeed, was not uncommon, is asserted in the project of reform drawn up in 1518 by order of Charles V. Still, the tribunals seem to have made some progress in providing themselves with penitential prisons, for in 1524 the Suprema deemed it worth while to order that they should be inspected monthly, and the results be recorded in a book to be kept for that purpose. 
By no means all had done so, however. Barcelona, which occupied the royal palace, had found room there in 1489 for its penitents, and in 1544 we hear of Jerónimo de Cuadras as alcaide on a salary of fifty ducats, out of which he was to pay for a person to conduct the prisoners to mass and to bring them back. Valencia was less advanced, for it could have had no prison in 1540 when it sentenced three women to keep as a prison such place as should be designated to them, but in 1546 it secured the services of Jerónimo de Cuadras as alcaide at a salary of thirty ducats. In 1550, however, he complained that he had never received his pay, and in 1554 we find the perpetual prison of Brianda de Garcete commuted to confinement in her own house, or other designated place, which would indicate that the attempt to establish a prison had been abandoned. In 1553, Legroño apparently had none, for it assigned, to Juan Prebost, Bilbao and two leagues around as a prison, with the San Benito. This need not surprise us, for, if in some tribunals there was an attempt to provide a perpetual prison, it was exceptional. In 1537 the Suprema had formally declared that it would be a novelty to support the penitents at the cost of the fisc. This could not and ought not to be done. There was no objection to their performing their penance in their own homes, and the tribunals could arrange it accordingly. A few months later this was repeated. The reconciled could be sent to their houses to perform their penance, if they had no other means of support. At length, the instructions of 1561 endeavored to introduce some system in the scandalous state of things. The sentence of reconciliation condemned the penitent to prison in San Benito for a specified term, during which he was to wear the abito publicly over his other garments. He was to be confined in the perpetual prison, going to mass and sermon on Sundays and feast days, and on Saturdays performing certain devotions at a designated shrine. To enforce this discipline, the instruction stated that, as many tribunals had no perpetual prison, houses should be bought for the purpose, as without them there were no means of knowing whether the reconciled performed their penance. The alcaide should help them in their necessity by giving them materials to work at their trades and help to support themselves, and the inquisitors should visit the prisons several times a year. This seems to have been followed by an effort to induce the tribunals to provide prisons, for, in 1562, Toledo was taken to task for having none. It not only did not supply the deficiency, but demurred to the suggestion that it should at least furnish a person to see that the penitents performed their penance, and it was told that for three or four thousand maravedis of extra pay, the portero could attend to this. In 1570, the Suprema resumed the attempt to bring about this much-needed reform, it told the tribunals that they could rent houses until they should be able to purchase, and they must appoint proper persons as alcaides to watch over the penitents. The result of this pressure was gradual. In 1577, the Cistercian convent of Santa Fe in Saragossa made formal complaint to the Pope of the number of penitents quartered upon it, and Cardinal Savelli, the head of the Roman Inquisition, interposed with the Suprema to relieve it of this oppression. It was not until 1598 that the Mexican tribunal, nearly thirty years after its foundation, built a capacious prison adjoining its own structure. In 1600, for the first time, there is an allusion in the Toledo record to a Carcel de la Penitencia, and in 1609, Valencia was busy in erecting one at a cost of 5,110 libras. It had been planned to have three floors, but was economically reduced to two. Whether all the tribunals yielded to the pressure and established penitential prisons, it would be impossible to say, but they probably did so, if only in some perfunctory fashion that justified the appointment of an alcaide. Simultaneously with this, there came a change in the name, and the carcel perpetua was known as the Casa de la Penitencia, or de la Misericordia. 
it does not follow that the establishment of prisons was attended with any increased strictness of discipline. The Inquisition persistently refused to accept the burden of supporting its prisoners, and left them to shift for themselves. Where prisons existed, there were few penitents in them, although condemnations to imprisonment were frequent, and in 1641 Philip IV conceived the idea of liberating them all. The Suprema sent his decree to the tribunals with orders to report whether they had any prisoners and what were their cases, to which Valencia replied that it had one, imprisoned for persistent sorcery, whereupon the Suprema ordered the sentence to be commuted and the prisoner to be discharged. The royal project fell through. All prisons were not as empty as that of Valencia, and a discussion occurring in 1654 at Granada, to which allusion has already been made, illustrates the character of the imprisonment rendered necessary by the refusal to support the prisoners. They gained their living chiefly by hawking goods around the city. This at length aroused the shopkeepers, and the corregidor represented to the tribunal that scandals were occasioned by their entering houses and committing indecencies. There was loss to the king, for, as penitents, they were not subject to the alcavala and other imposts. Thus favored, they undersold the shopkeepers, who had lost half their trade, while the penitents grew rich, for they came almost naked from the secret prison, and, in a short time, they were well clothed and enriched. The tribunal admitted the force of this, and, on December 24, 1654, issued an order that, for two weeks, they might cry their wares through the streets, but not enter houses, and subsequently be restricted to selling in shops. At this the prisoners complained bitterly of the deprivation of a privilege of long standing in all places where there was a tribunal, for without it they could not earn a living or support their wives and families. Thereupon the fiscal, Dr. Joseph Francisco Cresco de Escobar, seeing that both sides would appeal to the Suprema, printed for its enlightenment a memorial which reveals to us the character of penitential imprisonment. He states that, in accordance with the instructions of 1488, the tribunals had provided penitential prisons, the one at Granada being of ample capacity for the observance of the instructions of 1561. He quotes the canons and conciliar decrees to show that recanting heretics are to be immured for life, whence he argues that the prison should be afflictive and penal. Now, however, it is only nominal. The so-called prisoners go out at all hours of the day, without restriction, without a companion, without labor save what they voluntarily undertake, all of which is liberty and not captivity. They wander at will through the city and suburbs, they amuse themselves at the houses of their friends, they spend, if they choose, only part of the night in the prison, which serves them as a comfortable lodging house free of rent. The instructions require that the alcaide shall see that they perform their penance, but this has become impossible, and there are no means of restricting their intercourse with the faithful. As for their plea that they leave the secret prison broken in health and stripped of their property, that they have no chance to learn trades, and must support their families by trading, the answer is that only through the mercy of the holy office do they escape burning, and they should be thankful that their lives are spared. Their poverty is a trifling penalty for their crimes, and their children only share the punishment of paternal heresy. With all this laxity, there was a pretense of maintaining the old rigor, which regarded prison-breaking as relapse, but the real offence lay in the fugitive throwing off the San Benito. There seems to have been little desire to recapture those who absented themselves, for the formula of the mandate to search for and arrest fugitives only concerns itself with those who escape from the secret prison and who thus are still on trial. But when, from any cause, penitents were returned to the tribunal, their treatment is exemplified in the case of Juan González, who escaped from the Casa de la Penitencia of Valladolid, July 3, 1645. His story was that, having gone out to collect some money due to him, he gambled it away, got drunk, 
went to sleep under the walls of the Carmelite convent in the suburbs, and, on awaking next morning and fearing punishment, he wandered away, throwing off the San Benito and seeking work. Thus he reached Irun, and designed passing into France, but was recognized by a priest who had seen him in Valladolid. He was handed over to the commissioner, and was passed from familiar to familiar, till he was lodged in the secret prison of Valladolid. The fiscal claimed that his flight and throwing off the San Benito proved him to be an impenitent and pertinacious relapsed into Judaism, who must be relaxed, but his sentence was only two hundred lashes and irremissible prison. Sentences to imprisonment continued as usual, but growing indifference as to providing for their execution is indicated by a correspondence between Barcelona and the Suprema in 1718. At that time, the tribunal had but four cases under trial. It still occupied the ancient royal palace, but, after it had condemned for Judaism Maria Menses to irremissible, and her daughter Catalina de Solis to perpetual prison, it did not know what to do with them, and applied for instructions. There was, it said, no penitential prison, nor could it find that there ever had been one, neither was there an alcaide. It possessed no house that could be used for the purpose, and no official could be spared from his other duties. The Suprema replied by inquiring whether there was a prison for familiars in which a room could be used for the women, or whether some little house near the palace could be had, and some official or familiar could serve as alcaide. The tribunal rejoined, negativing the proposed use of the prison for familiars. It would see whether a house could be had, but there was no money for the purpose. As for the officials, they were all fully occupied, and no one would take the position without salary. This the Suprema met with a peremptory order to rent a little house and appoint an alcaide at the ordinary wages. Under this pressure some kind of provision must have been made, for, in an auto of January 31, 1723, the tribunal condemned four Judaizers to irremissible prison. During the recrudescence of persecution at this period, the number of condemnations to imprisonment was large. In the Granada Auto of December 21, 1720, there were 27, and in 64 autos between 1721 and 1727, there were 740. How these numerous prisoners were accommodated, it would be difficult to guess, for the neglect of the penitential prisons was progressive, and, in the census of all the tribunals, about 1750, but three reported to have alcaides, Cordova, Granada, and Murcia. It does not follow that others had not prisons, but only that they had no prisoners and cared to have none. For instance, in 1794, when the Suprema inquired of Valencia whether its prison would suit for the priest Juan Fernández Sotelo, whose health required a change from the convent where he was recluded, the tribunal craftily replied that its prison was constructed with cells and dungeons, and that, in the eyes of the people, confinement in it produced infamy, so that quarters for Sotelo had better be found in some convent in the suburbs. Apparently it forgot all this, when, in 1802, it complained that the salaries of its secretaries had not been raised in 1795, while that of the alcaide of the penitential prison had been increased from a hundred and twenty to twenty-two hundred reales, although he had nothing to do and enjoyed the use of a house in the prison as good as those of the inquisitors. In fact, by this time penitential imprisonment was virtually obsolete. After the subsidence of the active persecution of Judaism, the Toledo Tribunal, which, in 1738, pronounced twelve sentences of prison, did not utter another until 1756. Then a long interval occurs, of thirty-eight years, before the next one, which was for heretical propositions. It would not, perhaps, be safe to say that, in the concluding years of the Inquisition, this form of punishment was wholly unknown, but no cases of it have come under my observation." There was the same reduction in the duration of imprisonment as in its severity, 
owing presumably to the same economical motive. As we have seen, the medieval church recognized only lifelong imprisonment as the fitting penalty for the heretic who saved his forfeited life by recantation, and, in recognition of this, the penitential prison in Spain was officially known as the perpetual prison, the sentences being always for perpetual imprisonment. At a very early period, however, it was clearly recognized that the literal enforcement of this was a physical impossibility. Bernaldes tells us that in Seville, up to 1488, there had been 5,000 reconciled and condemned to perpetual imprisonment, but they were released after four or five years with San Benitos, and these were subsequently removed to prevent the spread of infamy throughout the land. At Barcelona, the tribunal had scarce been established when we find it drawing a distinction in its sentences to perpetual imprisonment, some being cum misericordia, and others absque misericordia, thus anticipating the so-called irremissible perpetual prison, and from the sentences it would appear that, without mercy, was exceptional. This inevitable laxity provoked opposition on the part of the more rigid authorities, and in 1509, while Jimenez was in Oran, there was a discussion on the subject in the Suprema, when we are told that his temporary representative, Rojas Archbishop of Granada, stood alone against the other members. What was the nature of the decision is not recorded, but it probably favored the laxer view, for Jimenez and the Suprema in 1516 deemed it necessary to order that all sentences to prison and San Benito must be perpetual, in accordance with the canon law, if, in any case, the inquisitors thought that there should be a remission, it must be left to the discretion of the inquisitor-general. The tendency to shorten the term was irresistible. The conservatives had to yield, and, by the middle of the sixteenth century, Simancas tells us that perpetual prison was customarily defined to be three years, if the penitent was repentant, while those condemned to irremissible prison were usually released after eight years. So purely technical did the term perpetual prison become, that inquisitors saw nothing incongruous in such sentences as perpetual prison for one year, or for six months, which are constantly met with, as well as perpetual prison followed by terms of exile. The real infliction was therefore much less severe than it appears in the records, and, when periods longer than eight years were intended, they were specified, as when Salvador Raso, for Molinism, was sentenced in the Granada Auto of July 4, 1745, to ten years, of which the first five were to be spent in the galleys, a hardship remitted on account of his infirmities. The terms of imprisonment were frequently shortened, moreover, sometimes from humane motives, but more often from financial considerations, for the dispensing power in this, as in the other penalties, was a source of profit. Thus Mayor Garcia, a Morisca of Daimiel, condemned in the Toledo Auto of September 21, 1550, to perpetual prison for six months, on January 13, 1551, petitioned the tribunal for release, as was customary with others, saying that her husband would pay what the inquisitors should demand. The matter was promptly arranged with Inquisitor Alonso Perez for four ducats, to help to build the staging for an auto de fe, a somewhat heavy payment for two months' relief. This dispensing power was the subject of a prolonged struggle between the tribunals and the Suprema. In the early period, at Barcelona, the former endeavored to secure it by the device of discretional sentences, which inquisitors could curtail or extend at will, and this was recognized in a letter of the Suprema, October 4, 1499, authorizing them, under such sentences, to dispense with the imprisonment, but not with the San Benito. In 1513, however, Jimenez forbade this without his consent, and the repetition of the order in 1514 and 1516 shows that it was difficult of enforcement. In spite of this, when the Valencia Tribunal, February 25, 1540, 
condemned five Moriscos to habit and prison for as long a time as we shall determine, the Suprema insisted that, when discretion was specified, it must alone be that of the Inquisitor-General, a mandate that had to be repeated more than once, even as late as 1592. The question of this, as of all other commutations, was inevitably settled, as we have seen, in favor of the Inquisitor-General. In many cases there was no concealment that it was purely an affair of bargain and sale, but it is pleasant to record that often it was prompted by humanity. Petitions for abridgment of the penance were numerous, and were usually sent in at the time of the greater feasts, which are alleged as a reason for mercy in addition to the misery of the penitent. As an example of these petitions may be mentioned the case of Violante Rodriguez, who, with her husband Duarte Valentin, was arrested for Judaism March 15, 1664. After three years' trial, she was sentenced at Granada, February 24, 1667, to two years' imprisonment, while her husband was similarly sentenced at Cuenca. About August 10th, she petitioned for commutation, alleging that she had eight little children deprived of both parents. The Suprema promptly sent to Granada for the details of the case, but the tribunal delayed until October 8th, when it accompanied its report with the suggestion that she should be released with spiritual penances after the expiration of the first year, as she had manifested true repentance. Growing impatient, on December 24th she again petitioned the Suprema, alluding to her seven children, thus showing that one had meanwhile died. That she was duly discharged in February there can be no doubt, and there is no trace in the correspondence of any pecuniary consideration. Some of the petitions for release, in truth, were well calculated to inspire compassion, such as that of Simon Mendes Soto in 1666, wherein he describes himself as eighty-four years old, blind, deaf, crippled on both sides, with many infirmities, and penniless, and he supplicates release that he may seek for cure. There would appear to have been no minimum age for imprisonment, short of irresponsibility. The Toledo Tribunal condemned for Judaism Garcia, son of Pedro the Potter of Aguda, a boy eleven years of age, to perpetual prison. In the Cuenca Auto of June 29, 1654, for the same offense, Escolastica Gomez, aged twelve, and Isabel Diaz Jorge, aged fourteen, had the same penalty, and in the Toledo Auto of October 30, 1701, José de León, a boy of sixteen, was sentenced to irremissible prison. End of section 21section twenty two of a history of the inquisition of spain volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. a history of the inquisition of spain volume three by henry charles lee book seven chapter three part five the san benito the San Benito, or penitential garment, was the invariable accompaniment of reconciliation and prison, constituting together the carcel y abito of the sentences, although it was not exclusively reserved for such cases. It was not invented by the Spanish Inquisition, even though we can scarce agree with an enthusiastic writer who traces its origin to the fall when God made the delinquents put on penitential habits of skins, corresponding with the sacos benditos now used in the tribunals. The penitential habit of sackcloth sprinkled with ashes, customary in the early church, has passed into a proverb that the penitents of the Inquisition should be required to wear such a garment was inevitable, and, from the foundation of the institution, in the thirteenth century, they were distinguished from other penitents by two yellow crosses, one on the breast and the other on the back. From Americh we learn that in Aragon, 
This garment was like the scapular worn by the religious orders. This saco bendito became known as the San Benito, or more commonly, Abito, and was necessarily inherited by a new inquisition. In 1486, at the Toledo Auto of December 11th, 200 penitents, reconciled under the Edict of Grace, were required to wear in public such a garment for a year under penalty of relapse. For those reconciled after trial, the infliction was more severe. In 1490, Torquemada ordered that they should wear during life a San Benito of black or gray cloth, 18 inches long and 9 inches wide, like a small tabard, hanging on breast and back, with a red cross before and behind, occupying nearly the entire field. This was hung over the outer garment, and was a conspicuous indication to all beholders of the shame of the wearer, rendering it a punishment regarded as exceedingly severe. In 1514, Jimenez changed the cross to an Aspa de San Andres, a St. Andrew's or Oblique cross, of which the bars traverse diagonally the breast and back. Finally, the instructions of 1561 describe the abito penitencial as made of yellow linen or cloth, with two red aspas, although in some parts of Aragon there are particular customs as to colors which must be observed, referring probably to the use of green cloth in place of yellow, which seems to have been the case in Valencia and Sicily. In some tribunals there was also in use, for those who abjured de vehementi, a San Benito de media aspa, or half-cross, consisting of a single diagonal band. Those who were to be relaxed appeared in the auto de fe in a black San Benito, on which were painted flames and sometimes demons thrusting the heretic into hell. Llorente tells us that abjuration de levi was performed in a samara, or yellow San Benito without aspas, but i have met with no allusion to its use the distinction between the san benito de dos aspas and the one de media aspa was maintained and the former was understood to indicate that the wearer had been guilty of formal heresy that he and his children were subject to the consequent disabilities and that he was liable to the stake in case of relapse the latter was worn only during the auto de fe after which it was laid aside. Although, in the early period, the San Benito was imposed perpetually, the expression is to be taken in the same sense as imprisonment. As a rule, the two were coterminous, and the sentences are almost invariably habit and prison for two years, or perpetual or irremissible, as the case may be. Where, indeed, the heresy was trivial or technical rather than real, or the conversion seemed genuine and spontaneous, the San Benito was merely a symbol to be worn only during the auto, or even for a briefer period, although it none the less left its ineffaceable stigma. There were gradations suited to every case, as is well illustrated in the Granada auto of May 27, 1593, where, in three cases, it was removed after reading the sentence in two, after returning to the Inquisition, in two, after twenty-four hours, one of these being the licentiate Juan Fernandez, who had Judaized for thirty-six years, in one case it was imposed for two years, and in another for three, and Leonor Fernandez had two years of San Benito and four of prison. It was even put on the effigy of Doña Inés de Torres, from which it was removed after reading the sentence, because she had confessed and died as a Catholic, with ample signs of contrition. Thus the tribunal could vary the penalty at its discretion, and was not bound to the rule of coterminous abito y carcel. In the Toledo Auto of March 15, 1722, two girls of fourteen, Manuela Diaz and Maria de Mendoza, were sentenced to six months of prison and two months of San Benito, while in that of February 24, 1723, Manuel Jimenez had perpetual prison and one year of San Benito. From the fact that, in the sentences, 
the penitents are told that they are not to go out of their prisons or their houses without the San Benito, it is inferable that it was not worn within doors. Discarding it, as we have seen, was a grave offence, punishable as non-fulfillment of penance, and in the edicts of faith, the denunciation of this, as of other infractions, was required. There was one occasion, however, in which this was done on a large scale with impunity, for in the Palermo Rising of 1516, against the Inquisition, there was a universal throwing off of San Benitos. When order was restored and the tribunal was re-established, there was a fruitless effort made to reimpose them. In 1522, the Suprema wrote to inquisitors Calvete y Cervera, calling attention to this as a great disservice to God and a heavy charge on the souls of the penitents, who must be compelled to resume them, and all secular and ecclesiastical authorities were commanded to assist. Then again, in 1525, Inquisitor General Manrique insisted on the resumption of the San Benitos, but at the same time he cautioned the inquisitors not to cause scandal or trouble, and we may assume that the attempt was practically abandoned. Cruel as was the imposition of the San Benito, it was a punishment inherited from the elder inquisition, but Spanish ingenuity invented a still more cruel use of it to stimulate the detestation of heresy. This was the preservation of the San Benitos, with suitable inscriptions, conspicuously displayed in the churches, thus perpetuating to future generations the memory of the crime and punishment of the delinquent. The origin of this may perhaps be traceable to the ceremonies observed in the early period, when penitents were relieved of the abito. As described in 1490, at Barcelona, they were assembled in the Inquisition and preached to by the Inquisitor. A fortnight later they gathered in the parish church of Santa Maria del Pino and heard Mass. Then they marched in procession to the chapel of Our Lady of Montserrat, again heard Mass, offered twelve dineros apiece to the Virgin, and passed the night, after which their San Benitos were taken off and hung in a prominent place near the door. Of course, in the case of those who were burnt, the San Benito was hung up at once, and this remained the rule, as we learn from the instructions of 1561. The San Benito of the Reconciled was hung when it was removed, whether during the auto or after years of prison, that of the relaxed immediately after the auto. The custom must have been of gradual growth. There is no allusion to it in the Instrucciones Antiquas, nor have I found any indication as to the time when it became imperative, except that, in 1512, there is a decision of the Suprema expressing the will of the king and the cardinal that the San Benitos of the relaxed and reconciled of the Campo de Calatrava shall be hung in the churches, except those of the reconciled in the time of grace, and that, if any of the latter have been hung, they are to be removed. This indicates a custom favored by the authorities, spreading, but as yet subject to question. It had already passed to Sicily, where one of the incidents of the rising of 1516 was the tearing down of the San Benitos in the churches, and so great was the popular detestation of it, that, at the end of the century, it had not been possible to restore the practice. It mattered little to the descendants that the San Benitos of the victims in the early years had escaped this publicity. The perversity which inspired it developed into such malignity that, in 1532, the Suprema ordered the tribunals to make from their records lists of all burnt or reconciled, even under edicts of grace, and to suspend in the churches whatever San Benitos were found to be lacking. The inexcusable cruelty of including the voluntary reconciliados under edicts of grace caused this portion of the order to be revoked in 1538, but, in 1539, it was declared inapplicable to those which had already been hung. If they had been removed, they must be replaced. The question was revived in 1552, and opinions were divided, but the decision to retain them prevailed. Meanwhile, in 1548, the Suprema stimulated the tribunals to fill all vacancies, 
whether arising from omissions or the surreptitious removal of old ones, and it ordered the hanging of new ones as soon as the autos were held, in order to anticipate the complaints and importunities of the sufferers and their kindred. Then, as though the tribunals were slack in their duty, in 1555 the order of 1532 was revived and repeated. The willful viciousness of this is indicated by the instructions of 1561, which point out that, as those reconciled in time of grace are exempt from wearing the San Benito, so their San Benitos ought not to be suspended in the churches. The object was the cruel one of perpetuating the infamy of the victim, and rendering it as galling as possible to his kindred and descendants. As the San Benitos wore out, or became illegible with time, they were replaced, and finally superseded by yellow linen cloths, bearing full details of the name, lineage, crime, and punishment of the culprit. Originally they were hung in the cathedral of the city of the Inquisition, but this did not bring the disgrace sufficiently close to the descendants, and, in some places at least, they were ordered to be transferred to the parish churches of the delinquents, whose infamy was thus kept alive in the memory of their neighbors. A single instance will illustrate the spirit actuating this. In 1519 the Suprema ordered this transfer made by the Tribunal of Cuenca, but the command was slackly obeyed, and was repeated in 1529. Then the descendants of Lope de Leon and Alvar Hernández de Leon, residents of Belmonte, petitioned the Suprema, saying that the wives of Lope and Alvar had been reconciled. They were natives of Quintanar, where they had committed their heresy, and the descendants now begged that the San Benitos be hung in the church of Quintanar, and not that of Belmonte. To this the Suprema replied, April 15, 1529, by instructing the tribunal to hang the San Benitos in the residence of the descendants, in a place so public that the reconciliation of the women should be notorious to all. It is true that the descendants secured delay until the pressing orders came of 1548, when, on November 9th, the San Benitos of the women were hung in the church of Belmonte. This policy of distribution cannot have been universal, for, when the Toledo Cathedral desired to be relieved of the great accumulation of San Benitos, the Suprema forbade it, adding that if it was desired to have them in the parish churches, it must be done with new ones, leaving the originals in the cathedral. At length, in 1538, the inquisitors Yanez and Loaisa distributed them among the parish churches, when Sebastián de Orozco tells us that it caused infinite misery to the descendants, leading them all, or nearly all, to change their family names, so that in Toledo the names actually borne by the conversos disappeared. Change of name was not the only device resorted to by the descendants, for they were constantly at work removing surreptitiously the evidence of their infamy. As early as 1518, the Saragossa Tribunal was ordered to prosecute with rigor those who had abstracted them from the Dominican Church. Their zeal was stimulated by the fact that the inquisitors, in making up the records, included all who had been reconciled under Edicts of Grace, thus affording legitimate ground of complaint, as shown by a long-continued struggle at Frejenal. In 1556, Dr. Ramirez, inquisitor of Urena, protested to the Suprema against the efforts of the people of Frejenal for the removal of the names of those reconciled in time of grace. It would leave but few, for, in 1491, there had been 357 reconciliations there, of which 354 had been under the edict. To render ancestral infamy more accessible to the public, besides the San Benitos, the names and details were inscribed on a tablet of parchment. This became torn and nearly illegible, and, on August 23, 1563, it was solemnly replaced by another, written in large letters, with printer's ink, and varnished to ensure its preservation. The secret warfare waged against this perpetuation of infamy is described, in 1572, in a deposition of the familiar Rodrigo Carvajo. 
The people of the town, he said, were mostly descendants of conversos, resorting to perjury and every other means to conceal their origin. The sacristans were generally conversos, who connived at the methods employed to destroy the evidence, and the sanbenitos were stolen. There used to be five hundred and ninety-nine, and now there were only ten or a dozen, worn and torn and so placed that they could not be read, while the tablet with the names was gradually being defaced and rendered illegible. Thus it continued until 1576, when Inquisitor Montoyo brought to Frejenal a new set of San Benitos prepared from the records, which were duly suspended, and a tablet containing names and details was placed where all could read it. This list shows the obstinate persistence with which the names of the spontaneously reconciled were retained. It contained a hundred and sixty-two relaxed, and four hundred and nine reconciled, all, with very few exceptions, in the years from 1491 to 1495. There were none between 1499 and 1511, and none later than 1511. Struggles similar to this were doubtless on foot in numerous other places. The churches themselves do not seem to have looked with favor on this desecration of their sacred precincts. At Cuenca, there was apparently an attempt to hide the San Benitos, of which the tribunal complained in 1571, when the Suprema ordered it to see that nothing was put before them, even on feast days. The parish church of San Salvador, at Cifuentes, went further, and in 1561 appealed to Pius IV, explaining to him the Spanish custom, and representing that not only was the attractiveness of the church marred by the prominence assigned to the San Benitos, but that they led to many scandals, all of which would be prevented if they were removed to some less prominent place or laid away altogether, but that license from the Holy See was requisite for this. The Pope gave the required license, subject to the assent of the Inquisition, to the removal, which, of course, rendered it inoperative. The Cathedral of Granada was more fortunate, for when, in 1610, Inquisitor General Sandoval consecrated as Archbishop Pedro González de Mendoza, the latter asked him, as a special favor to his bride, that she should be relieved of the San Benitos. Sandoval assented, and the permission came soon after Mendoza had reached Granada. It was celebrated with great rejoicings and ringing of bells. The San Benitos of the Moriscos were transferred to the Church of San Salvador in the Albicene, while those of the Judaizers were hung in the Church of Santiago, which was the parish church of the Inquisition. Even when there was not this open antagonism, there was apt to be neglect which was practically more damaging. In 1642, the Valencia Tribunal learned that some of those in the cathedral had fallen and were allowed to lie. It made an investigation, and, from the report, it would seem as though every available spot was thus decorated, and that all required attention for their preservation. The sacristans promised to do what was necessary, but apparently they had been quite willing to see them disappear. Conscious of this ecclesiastical indifference, and of the constant effort of those interested to make way with the visible records of their infamy, the Suprema was incessantly active to counteract the results. The instructions of 1561 insist imperatively on the duty of hanging the new San Benitos and renewing the old, so that the memory of the infamy of heretics shall be preserved for ever. And inquisitors, on their visitations, are commanded to see that the parish churches are kept with unbroken lines of the montetas and insignias of their culprit parishioners. Philip II was no less urgent. In his instructions of 1595 to Manrica de Lara, he calls special attention to the subject. There are San Benitos now to be hung, and others which have never been hung, apparently through favoritism, for which the inquisitors deserve rigorous punishment, for this is the severest penalty which the Holy Office can inflict on heretics and their descendants, and Manrique is to see that all deficiencies are made good. 
In fact, the most pressing business of the inquisitor in visiting his district was to attend to this. In 1569, the Suprema ordered everyone, before starting, to have full lists made out of the relaxed and reconciled of the region to be traversed, and, in each place, these lists were to be compared with the existing sanbenitos, and all that had disappeared were to be replaced. In 1600 and 1607, these instructions were repeated with still greater urgency, as a matter not to be neglected for a single day, in view of the evils that would follow. That nothing was to be allowed to interfere with this pious duty is seen when Valencia had no money wherewith to defray the expense of renewals, and was told to borrow it from the Depositario de los Pretendientes, the sacred deposits of those seeking to prove their limpieza, which were thus used to preserve the muniments that might destroy their hopes. How, in fact, the Sanbenitos were employed for this purpose is indicated in a perquisition conducted at Tortosa in 1577 by the inquisitor Juan de Zuniga. The Sanbenitos were carefully examined and lists were made out, classified firstly into those of which the trials could be identified and those of which no trace could be found in the records, and secondly into the penalties inflicted. Then two of the oldest residents, a notary and a priest, were summoned. The lists were gone over with them, and their evidence was taken as to the descendants of the culprits, especially whether any had changed their names so as to elude disabilities. Thus a close watch was kept on them, and every care was taken that the infamy of their ancestors should be lasting. As the seventeenth century wore on, it would seem that the zeal of the tribunals in the matter of San Benitos was flagging. A general carta acordada of February 27, 1657, assumes this, in calling their attention to the instructions of 1561, and to subsequent orders of similar import. As many autos de fe had recently been held, and as it was understood that, in some places, the sanbenitos had not been hung in the churches, the tribunals were commanded forthwith to make out lists of the relaxed and the reconciled, and to have corresponding sanbenitos suspended in the churches, as well as to renew the old ones which were worn out. In view of the importance of this to the service of God, a full report in detail was imperatively required to be furnished within four months. This may have excited the tribunals to spasmodic activity, but, if so, its influence was but temporary, for, in 1691, we find the Suprema ordering reports as to the length of time that had elapsed since San Benitos had ceased to be hung in the churches. Lists of deficiencies were called for. The old San Benitos were to be examined, and statements were to be rendered as to what were lacking and what had become illegible, so that the Suprema might take requisite action. This looks as if the custom had been falling into desuetude, but it was by no means abandoned, and as late as August 26, 1753, when a deceased delinquent named Horstman was burnt in effigy at Valencia, two San Benitos were ordered to be suspended, one in the cathedral and one in the parish church of San Lorenzo. Still the same tribunal furnishes, in 1783, a refreshing evidence of the decline of intolerant zeal in the gradual diffusion of enlightenment. The cathedral had been undergoing restoration, during which the San Benitos had been carefully stored in a room of the Inquisition. On the completion of the work, the tribunal suggested to the Inquisitor General Beltran that it would not redound to the service of God or of the public to hang them up again, to which Beltran assented. If the chapter did not ask for them, the tribunal was not to raise the question, or to do anything in the matter, and, from an endorsement on the letter, it is to be inferred that the San Benitos were allowed to repose undisturbed. It was not to be supposed that, when the Cortes of Cadiz, February 22, 1813, abolished the Inquisition, it was satisfied to permit the continued existence of the San Benitos which perpetuated so many dreadful memories. 
a decree of the same day recited that article three hundred five of the constitution provided that no punishment should extend beyond the criminal to his family that the means by which in public places the memory of penalties inflicted by the inquisition was preserved brought infamy on families and even exposed to evil repute persons of the same name therefore all portraits pictures or inscriptions recording the punishments imposed by the inquisition existing in churches cloisters convents and other places were to be removed or blotted out within three days after receipt of the decree the condition of spain was not such as to ensure any wide obedience of this decree although it is scarce likely that the french armies had left many san benitos hanging in towns occupied by them during the war what occurred elsewhere may probably be guessed by the example of majorca when the constitution of cadiz was enthusiastically received and the san benitos were removed from the church of san domingo but they were providently stored away and were again hung up after the restoration in eighteen fourteen in the revolution of eighteen twenty however they were torn down and burnt and the inquisition was levelled to the ground the custom of suspending in the churches the habitelli or san benitos of the reconciled and relaxed seems to have been borrowed by italy from spain at least in some places it is to the credit of the roman inquisition that it disapproved this barbarous practice as appears from a decree of sixteen twenty seven ordering them to be removed from the cathedral of faenza and to be secretly burnt End of section 22section 23 of a history of the inquisition of spain volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a history of the inquisition of spain volume 3 by henry charles lee book 7 chapter 3 part 6 disabilities disabilities have already been considered in their relation to the finances of the inquisition arising from the sale of dispensations but they formed too important a portion of the penal system not to require further treatment in this connection they differed however from other punishments in that although specified in the sentences they were the inseparable consequences of condemnation for heresy and thus in some sense self-operative for the severity of the laws for the suppression of misbelief was not content with confiscating the property of those whose lives were spared the reconciled heretic was not only turned adrift penniless but was subjected to restrictions incapacitating him from earning a livelihood as this refinement of cruelty could not be applied to those who were burned it was visited on their descendants this latter provision was derived from the imperial legislation against treason which disabled children of traitors from holding office and succeeding to collateral estates frederick the second in his ravenna decree of twelve thirty two made this applicable to the children and grandchildren of heretics which was eagerly incorporated into the legislation of alexander the fourth and honorius the fourth although boniface the eighth mitigated it slightly by exempting grandchildren in the female line as part of the canon law this of course governed the spanish inquisition and if there were those who questioned the justice of punishing orthodox children for their parents heresy they were triumphantly silenced by alfonso de castro who pointed to original sin as an irrefragable proof that this was in accordance with the will of god the application of these restrictions to reconciled penitents apparently originated with the council of Bézier in 1246 which ordered that penitents should not hold public office or serve as physicians or notaries or wear silk garments or gold and silver ornaments or other vanities in short that their apparel should befit those whose lives constructively were to be passed in repentance these provisions were not carried into the canon law but apparently became traditional in the holy office in the instructions of fourteen eighty four there is nothing said as to the disabilities of descendants 
but inquisitors were instructed to order penitents, after completing their penance, never to hold public office or benefices, or to serve as procurators, tax collectors, farmers of the revenue, grocers, apothecaries, physicians, surgeons, bleeders, or brokers, thus prohibiting the professions which they had specially made their own. Moreover, they were not to wear gold or silver, coral, pearls, or other precious stones, or garments of silk or camlet, or other finery, or to ride on horseback or bear arms, and all this during life under penalty of relapse. There was evidently doubt as to the application of these restrictions to the descendants of those relaxed, but that there was an effort made in that direction is shown by their procuring, in 1486, from Innocent the Eighth, a brief enabling them to farm the revenues of churches. In the Assembly of Inquisitors, in 1488, the matter excited considerable debate, resulting in instructions that each tribunal in its own district should enforce, under heavy penalties, the disability of children and grandchildren to hold any office or dignity that could be considered public, and the list of prohibited callings was enlarged by including those of merchants, notaries, scriveners, advocates, farmers of revenues, and some others. The sumptuary restrictions were not extended to them, for they were not penitents, but they were forbidden to wear the insignia of any dignity, secular or ecclesiastic. The omission was made good in a decree issued by Torquemada, April 22, 1494, but it was so slackly obeyed that when, in 1502, the sovereigns ordered its enforcement, they allowed a certain time for those affected to become acquainted with its provisions. Ferdinand himself had an occasion to recognize the hardship of the rule, for in 1500 the mother of Pedro Ruiz, a member of his royal guard, was condemned and consequently he was incapacitated from riding and bearing arms. Unwilling to lose him, Ferdinand wrote to Torquemada for letters of dispensation to be brought back by the messenger. We have seen how, in the struggle over the profits of dispensation, the sovereigns abandoned to the Inquisition the cosas arbitrarias, or sumptuary restrictions, and assumed to themselves, by the pragmaticas of 1501, control over the disability to hold office and to follow certain professions and trades, which limited so greatly the ability of the reconciled and of the children and grandchildren of the condemned to support themselves. A humane exception was made, however, in 1502, under which children reconciled below the age of fourteen were exempted from the operation of the pragmaticas. As these were municipal laws, they were subject to the secular officials, who were ordered to enforce them under pain of confiscation and loss of office for negligence. It was easier to publish edicts than to get them executed. The civil magistrates seem to have paid little attention to the pragmaticas, while the Inquisition did what it could within its allotted sphere. The Suprema issued orders to the tribunals to punish with all rigor those who disregarded the sumptuary restrictions, who were said to be numerous, in great contempt of the holy office. It was probably to stimulate zeal that, in 1509, it modified the penalty of relapse to a pecuniary penance, which it authorized the inquisitors to impose at discretion, bearing in mind the gravity of the case and the wealth of the offender. The sums thus realized were considerable enough to tempt the cupidity of the courtiers, for in May 9, 1514, we find the king making over to four of his ushers the penalties levied on the sons of Alonso Gallo of Toledo, and on April 1st he ordered Vasquez de Busto, alguacil of Toledo, to collect all the penances of this kind, to pay one half to the receiver for the tribunal, and divide the other half between the fiscal, Martin Jimenez, and a servant of Secretary Calcena. The punishments decreed in the pragmaticas were also modified to fines, as we learn from a letter of June 20, 1515, dividing those incurred in Seville between Calcena and Aguirre, after setting aside one-third for the tribunal, and from another letter of January 8, 1516, 
bestowing on Fernando de Hoyos, portero of the Cuenca Tribunal, the penalties incurred by the wives of Pedro de Vaguera and of Quiros and Jaime Boticario, for exercising the profession of apothecary. At length it was recognized that the Inquisition was the only instrumentality to be depended upon for the enforcement of the pragmaticas, and Charles V, in a cedula of March 30, 1528, placed the whole business in its hands. He recited the laws of Ferdinand and Isabella with their severe penalties for negligent officials, in spite of which he was informed that, in many places, they were disregarded, wherefore he granted to the Inquisition all necessary powers and ordered it to see to the execution of the law. Possibly there may have been some opposition by the secular authorities to this invasion of their jurisdiction, which called for a repetition of the cedula, March 2, 1543. In pursuance of this, the Suprema, in Cartas Acordadas of 1548, 1549, and 1566, called the attention of the tribunals to the number of persons engaged in prohibited callings, or wearing forbidden articles, and it urged them to be active in detecting and punishing the offenders. The construction of the laws was rigorous. There was a nice question whether, when a parent was condemned in absentia as contumacious, the children were subject to the disabilities, for the heresy was presumptive and not proven. Farinacci held that they were not, for the absentee, even though burnt in effigy, could always return and prove his innocence. Peña represents the stricter Spanish view that the fugitive was condemned as a heretic and his children were incapacitated. The matter was threshed out in the case of the son of Antonio Pérez, who was deprived of a pension on the Church of Cuenca. This was the final decision of the Rota after full argument. It served as a precedent, and the sentence of the absent contained the same enumeration of disabilities as that of one who was burnt in person. Some doubts arose as to whether the pragmaticas prohibited trade in general. All such points were reserved to the king, and when, in 1566, it was proposed to prosecute some merchants, the Suprema ordered the cases to be suspended until he should be consulted. It was less cautious when, in 1542, it forbade all reconciled penitents to keep schools, or even to teach children their letters. A question arose whether the prohibition to ride on horseback comprehended mules, but Simancas decides it in the affirmative, and even desires to include vehicles, as it is fitting that all such persons should walk on foot. Even the limits of the canon law were disregarded in the panic occasioned by the discovery of Protestantism in 1559, for in the Seville Auto of September 24th, when Juan Ponce de Leon was burnt, the disabilities of his descendants in the male line were extended to the fourth generation. An ecclesiastical career was closed to penitents and their descendants, who were forbidden to enter holy orders. There was some question raised whether those who were in orders could obtain or retain benefices, but it was decided in the negative. The practice, as stated about 1640, was that, on their visitation, the inquisitors dealt summarily with cases concerning the cosas arbitrarias, while those which involved the holding of benefices or public office were sent to the tribunal for trial. In the edicts of faith which they published, denunciations were invited, and all persons were required to give information as to any infractions of the laws of which they were cognizant. As every one who had the misfortune to fall into the hands of the Inquisition was a marked man thereafter, and was liable to the suspicion that he had incurred disabilities, a suspicion apt to grow stronger with time and to affect his descendants, it became important for those who were not thus affected to have some evidence of the fact. In the earlier time the Inquisition was chary about affording this relief, but did not absolutely refuse it when the sufferer applied to the Suprema. It was not every one, however, who could obtain the intervention of the Suprema. Popular prejudice was strong, and no one knew what took place within the precincts of the tribunals. Blighted careers were thus numerous. 
Escobar, in his work on limpieza, tells us that, at the origin of the Inquisition, it punished the lightest offenses with extreme severity, and this, after the lapse of a century and a half, was still disastrously affecting the descendants. It was inhuman that a word inadvertently spoken through levity or anger, or in jest, should bring infamy on the delinquent and his posterity without limitation of time. The memorial of 1623, by a member of the Suprema, discusses the same evil. The writer says that the Inquisition is surrounded by enemies who are daily multiplied through those afflicted by the tribunals. It is not merely those who are relaxed or reconciled or compelled to abjure de vehementi, but there are many well-affected old Christians punished with lighter penalties who, if they remain defamed and their posterity disabled from honors, must necessarily add to the number of enemies, and it is pitiable thus to afflict them for trivial causes. The tribunals did not cease to afflict the people, but some relief was afforded by a practice, which gradually came into use, of including, in a sentence for light offenses or of acquittal, a clause declaring that the party and his descendants were not subject to disabilities, and that he could have a certificate to that effect. Two examples of this, occurring in Valladolid in 1638, will suffice. In the case of Agustin Lopez, tried for blasphemy, the consulta de fe could not agree, and the Suprema sentenced him to reprimand in exile, adding that the sentence should be no bar to offices of honor or in the Inquisition. So a sentence, acquitting Miguel Ruiz of a charge of sorcery, says that his imprisonment shall not be an obstacle to him and his children, and that he shall have a certificate to that effect. That Ruiz had not even been confined in the secret prison, but in the public jail, shows how sensitive was the popular mind. These certificates, de no obstancia, as they were called, would appear as a rule not to be issued unless specially applied for, and yet how important they were to the individual and his posterity is manifested by a petition presented, January 17, 1818, by the licentiate Mariano de Santander y Álvarez, setting forth that, twenty years before, in 1798, his father had been arrested and prosecuted by the Valladolid Tribunal, because, in his trade as a bookseller, he had sold prohibited books. In the final sentence, it was declared that his imprisonment and prosecution did not prejudice him or his descendants in the enjoyment of their civil rights, but the secrecy of the Inquisition, and the loss of the certificate given to the father, prevented the petitioner from furnishing the proofs necessary to his admission as an advocate in the royal chancellery, wherefore he begged for a proper testimonial. The Suprema had the statement verified, and ordered a certificate to be duly issued. From this, as well as from the memorial of 1623, it appears that not merely reconciliation, but even abjuration or lesser penalties inflicted disabilities, if not as to the cosas arbitrarias, at least as to the attainment of an honorable career. In the closing years of the Inquisition, this sometimes led to a merciful moderation of the sentence, as in that pronounced, August 27, 1817, on Francisco Mosquera Villa Marino of Santiago, quote, Bachier Clásico y Profesor del Sexto Cuerpo de Canones en su Real Universidad, end quote, for certain propositions. He escaped with a reprimand in the audience chamber and without abjuration, it being expressly stated that he was treated with this benignity in order not to prejudice him in his career, though he was warned that the Inquisition would keep a watch on him. Popular prejudice, as we have seen, intensified the cruelty of the cruel laws. How inveterate was this is manifested in the case of Joseph Callot, who in 1791 sought in marriage the daughter of Pablo Bordo, a merchant of Valencia. The parents refused assent, and the lovers eloped. Bordo brought the matter before the royal audiencia, showing that Calot was the great-grandson of Clara Munoz, 
who at the age of nineteen was reconciled for judaism in the barcelona auto de fe of april two seventeen twenty four and was sentenced to irremissible carcel y abito although after two years her husband antonio antonelli obtained her release in view of this dissent the audiencia decided that bordo's opposition to the marriage was reasonable and just thus inflicting an indelible stigma on Colot and his posterity. In some way the affair reached the Suprema, who wrote to Valencia for details, and, in transmitting them, the inquisitors added an expression of sympathy for Calot in the dishonor cast upon him. The punishment of his great-grandmother did not disable him from the professions, but it would be difficult to restore him to his good fame without calling in question the justice of the sentence of the audiencia even the inquisition did not venture to repair an injustice caused by its assiduous training of the population in an unreasoning abhorrence of heresy the penalty for disregarding the disabilities settled down to the thrifty one of a fine as regards those imposed by the pragmaticas the suprema in fifteen thirty one replied to an inquiry from the tribunal of Avila y Segovia that, although the laws prescribed confiscation for infractions, yet the practice was to penance culprits in accordance with their wealth and station and the degree of the offense. So, in respect to the cosas arbitrarias, it decreed in 1536 that although the instructions of 1484 provided the pain of relapse, they did not require the inquisitors to condemn the infraction as such, and the practice was to impose pecuniary and spiritual penances. Cases of prosecution for infraction are not very numerous in the records, chiefly owing, we may presume, to the customary sale of rehabilitations. In the tribunal of Toledo they amount only to ninety-one, and of these it is noteworthy that there are only three posterior to fifteen eighty six two in sixteen hundred and one in sixteen sixteen when they occurred the penalty was at the discretion of the tribunal and toledo exercised this with great moderation in fifteen seventy nine when bernardino de aldana a ribbon weaver spontaneously denounced himself his mother isabel alvarez had been burnt by the Cuenca Tribunal, yet he had worn a velvet cap, had carried a sword, and had ridden on a mule with a saddle. He was married, and had done this to satisfy his wife and her kindred, and besides his brother had told him that they had been rehabilitated. His artless story seems to have moved his judges, for he escaped with a reprimand and a fine of two ducats. In 1703, the tribunal of Madrid was more severe with Simón de Andrade, a reconciled penitent, who had worn the prohibited articles. He was harshly reprimanded, was fined in fifty ducats, was banished for a year, and was required to surrender the cosas arbitrarias, but we are told that he was permitted to keep the garments which he had on to cover his nakedness, especially as they were of ordinary cloth clerical offenders in a land where theocratic influence was so strong it was inevitable that there should be a special favor shown to erring ecclesiastics the church has ever sought to conceal from the public the knowledge of weaknesses that might diminish veneration for its ministers and scandal has been more dreaded than sin the inquisition established its jurisdiction over both the secular and the regular clergy but it exercised that jurisdiction in accordance with the general policy of the church. Every care was taken to keep clerical offenses from public knowledge, except in cases of formal heresy or of administering the sacraments by those who held only the lower orders. As a rule, in place of being confined in the secret prison during trial, they were housed in some convenient convent, where their presence need excite no surprise. When convicted, they were not exposed in the public autos de fe, but their sentences were read in the audience chamber with closed doors, though in certain cases a prescribed number of other clerics were summoned to be present as witnesses. Even then they did not wear the penitential habit, as did laymen. For aggravated offenses, 
the ordinary punishment was reclusion in a designated convent for a specified term, a penalty which might be infinitely varied. Perhaps six months or a year was to be passed in a cell. The culprit was to be last in choir and refectory. He might be suspended for a term, or perpetually, from some or all of his functions, and of the right to vote or be voted for. Spiritual penances might be superadded, or, at his entrance, he might be subjected to a zura de rueda, or circular discipline, in which all the members of the house, including the lay brethren, took a hand. All these greater or less aggravations could be varied or accumulated to meet the exact shades of guilt. This conventual reclusion was adopted, perhaps, partly for concealment, and partly as a milder form of incarceration, but the mercy was doubtful, if we may trust the story told by Llorente, of a capuchin guilty of aggravated abuse of the confessional, who, when condemned to five years' reclusion in a convent of his order, begged to have it changed to incarceration in the secret prison. He had been, he said, provincial and guardian, he knew how the brethren treated those thrust upon them as criminals, and it would cost him his life. His prayer was refused, and his prevision was correct, for he died within three years. I have met, however, with cases in which the recluded fraile survived longer terms. As a rule, no doubt, life was not rendered pleasant, but it depended on circumstances. The Franciscan, Francisco Ortiz, sentenced to confinement for two years in a cell in the convent of Torre Laguna, without intercourse with his brethren, refused to leave his retirement on the expiration of the term, and remained there until his death twelve years later, the object of veneration to all around him. There might or might not be sympathy for the penitent, and his treatment naturally corresponded. When, however, the offense was formal heresy, entailing reconciliation or relaxation, the cleric was obliged to appear in an auto de fe like any other culprit. Cases of the kind were common enough in the early period when many conversos had entered the church, but, after the thorough weeding out by the Inquisition, they became rare. An essential preliminary was degradation from the priesthood, which was of two kinds, verbal and formal, the former sufficing for cases of reconciliation, while relaxation required the latter. Verbal degradation effaced the orders, but not the priestly character, and, in the later period, publicity was often avoided by executing the sentence in the audience chamber, as in the Toledo cases of Jacinto Vasquez Aranzo, a priest convicted of Judaism and condemned to the galleys, December 4, 1688, and of Buenaventura Frutos, cura of Mosejon, sentenced February 19, 1722. Originally, the ministration of a single bishop sufficed for verbal degradation, while two were required for formal, until Gregory the Ninth, to facilitate the operations of the Inquisition, decreed that, in cases of heresy, the bishop of the culprit could perform the ceremony in the presence of some abbots and other learned men, and finally, in 1551, the Council of Trent permitted a single bishop to officiate in all cases of formal degradation, and his vicar-general in verbal degradation. The ceremony of public formal degradation was impressive. The culprit marched in the procession bearing the mitre and San Benito of relaxation, which were removed on the staging in order that he might be seen in his priestly vestments and tonsure. In the case of Fray Joseph Diaz Pimiento, a relapsed Judaizer, burnt at the Seville Auto de Fe of July 25, 1720, we are told that an immense crowd was assembled, for no degradation had been witnessed there since 1623. The auto was celebrated in the church of San Pablo, but as soon as Fray Joseph's sentence was read, he was taken by a number of officials to a scaffold in the Plaza de San Francisco, where the bishop of Lycopolis, the assistant of the archbishop, performed the ceremony. His tongue, the palms of his hands and fingertips, were scraped and rubbed with tau. 
the tonsure was erased by cutting his hair and he was deprived of his orders one by one in the reverse order of their bestowal he was then handed over to his superiors of the mercenarian order who stripped him of the habit after which the mitre and san benito with painted flames were replaced on him and he was taken to the juzgado or secular court and delivered to the deputy assistente of the city to be formally sentenced and conducted to the bracero end of chapter three end of section twenty three Section 24 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 7, Chapter 4, Punishment, the Stake, Part 1. The condemnation of a human being to a death by fire, as the penalty of spiritual error, is so abhorrent to the moral sense, and so oppugnant to the teachings of Christ, that modern apologists have naturally sought to relieve the church from responsibility for such atrocity. On the surface, a tolerably plausible argument can be made. The ministers of religion, the spiritual courts, the inquisition itself, rendered no judgments of blood any ecclesiastic who might be concerned in them incurred irregularity requiring a dispensation before he could validly perform his functions or obtain preferment the execution of heretics was a matter purely of secular law and burning them alive is not prescribed in canon or decretal the earliest recorded example of concremation is that administered by robert the pious of france to the Cathari of Orléans in 1017, and its embodiment in positive law has not been found earlier than in the decrees against Waldenses by Pedro II of Aragon in the Council of Gerona in 1197. In 1231 Frederick II included it in the Sicilian constitutions, and in 1238, by his Cremona decree, extended it throughout the empire, while alfonso the wise of castile in 1255 adopted it for christians who turned jews or moors it thus became part of the public law of christendom not so much from the initiative of rulers as from a recognition of what had become a custom through the spontaneous ferocity of popular fanaticism the inquisition through whose agency heretics were consigned to the stake did not itself condemn them to it but merely pronounced them to be heretics of whose conversion no hope was entertained. It cut them off from the church, which had nothing further to do with them, and abandoned or relaxed them to the secular arm for due punishment. It assumed that it condemned the crime and the civil judge the criminal, and, in relaxing him, it adjured the judge to spare his life and not to spill his blood. This latter was a device invented by Innocent III, before the inquisition existed to preserve from irregularity the spiritual courts in degrading clerics guilty of forgery and handing them over to the secular authorities for execution this shifting of responsibility to the civil power was not through any sense that the laws punishing heresy with burning were cruel or unjust for the church taught this to be an act so eminently pious that it accorded an indulgence to any one who would contribute wood to the pile, thus assuming the responsibility and expending the treasure of the merits of Christ in stimulating popular ferocity. That this indulgence was well known in Spain appears in the evidence in the trial of Jan of Antwerp for Lutheranism at Toledo in 1561. In fact, when Luther argued that the burning of heretics was contrary to the will of the Spirit, leo the tenth included this among his heresies condemned in the bull exerge domine consequently the secular power had no choice as to what it should do with heretics delivered to it its act was purely ministerial and if it listened to the hypocritical plea for mercy it was liable to prosecution as a fautor of heresy and to deprivation of its functions 
The Church enforced this by embodying in the canon law a provision that princes and their officials must punish duly and promptly all heretics delivered to them by inquisitors, under pain of excommunication, which became heresy if endured for a year. And inquisitors were required to proceed against them, but were cautioned to speak only of executing the laws without alluding to the death penalty in order to escape irregularity. As elsewhere, so in Spain. The Inquisition abandoned the unrepentant or relapsed heretic to the secular arm, which was bound to sentence and execute him. In the hurried informality of the early period, it seems to have been indifferent whether the magistrate pronounced a sentence or not, a contemporary account of the Toledo Auto of August 14, 1486, describes the reading of the sentences of the inquisitors and the condemned being carried at once to the Vega for execution, where they were burnt till not a bone remained, without any allusion to the formality of intervention by the secular power. When, however, the form of a condemnation by the alcalde was observed, as at Cordova in 1484, he uttered it by virtue of the sentence of the inquisitors, which rendered unnecessary anything more than condemning the culprit to be burnt alive, wherefore he ordered the alguacil mayor to carry it into effect. In the inquisitorial sentences of the period, the adjuration for mercy is generally lacking. In that of Mencia Alonso, condemned at Guadalupe, November 21, 1485, not only is it absent, but the duties of the secular officials are treated as purely ministerial, for it ends, quote, As a limb of the devil and a cursed and excommunicate, she shall be taken to the place of burning, so that by the secular justice of this town, or by any other layman, justice shall be executed upon her according to the custom of these kingdoms. End quote. That the function of the magistrate was not judicial is manifested in the refusal to communicate the trial to him. When those of Brescia, in 1486, refused to execute the sentences of the Inquisitor without seeing the trials, Innocent VIII ordered the Inquisitor to excommunicate them if they delayed more than six days, no matter what the local laws might be, for heresy was a purely ecclesiastical crime. In accordance with this is the assertion in the Repertorium de Privatate Hereticorium, printed at Valencia in 1494, that the magistrate has no right to have the process shown to him that he may judge as to the justice of the sentence. Inquisitors are not to concede any such right, for his sole duty is to execute it without delay, and if he hesitates he is subject to deprivation of office and condemnation as a heretic. This principle was fully admitted by secular jurists themselves. Torre Blanca, who was attached to the Royal Chancellery of Granada, states that the duty of the civil magistrate is purely executive, and he has no right to examine into the merits of a case or to act in a judicial capacity. In fact, the secular power could be dispensed with altogether, the Venetian seigneury was not always as prompt as it should be in suppressing heresy, so, to avoid delays and embarrassing questions, the papal nuncio there, with his fiscal, auditor, and other officials, had faculties to condemn to mutilation and death all heretics without incurring irregularity or other ecclesiastical penalties, notwithstanding all canons and decretals to the contrary. Such provisions were issued in 1547 by Paul III, and in 1550 by Julius III, and were doubtless customary. Peña reduces this to a general principle, for, without referring to special papal faculties, he asserts that the intervention of the secular judge is unessential, and that, if he were not accessible, the tribunal can condemn the heretic to death, if accessible, he must execute the sentence if he wishes to escape the heavy penalties of foutership and impeding the Inquisition. There was little danger of such reluctance on the part of secular officials in Spain, where the oath exacted of them by the Inquisition obliged them to execute whatever sentences the tribunal might require. In fact, the only indication I have met with of possible hesitation involving punishment, 
occurs in a mandate, September 5, 1725, to the Toledo Tribunal, directing that, in autos de fe, the first sentences read should be those of relaxation, thus reversing the usual order, so that the convicts might be delivered at once to the royal judge, without permitting delay in the execution of the sentences, under any pretext, since the tribunal had complete jurisdiction to compel him, by censures and other penalties, to its exact performance. The Inquisition regarded the sentence of the magistrate as a mere perfunctory formality. The doctors had pointed out conclusively that heresy was a crime over which he had no jurisdiction, and if he were to assert it he would render illusory the sentence of the bishop or inquisitor. Consequently, in preparation for an auto de fe, the tribunal, in advance, gave to the secular authorities a list of the condemnations, so that the sentences might be drawn up, and the wood, the stake, and the garrots be prepared for immediate execution. It is true that thrift induced a certain amount of equivocation, when, in 1579, the royal aguaciles of Saragossa claimed payment from the confiscations for their services and for the cost of the wood, and Philip II emphatically rejected the demand as unexampled, adding that the inquisitors could not order such payment without irregularity, and that the executions were in virtue of the sentences of the secular judges, and not of the inquisitors. This, however, was the merest quibble. In autos generales, the magistrates were asked to be present to receive the convicts, and, quote, execute on them the penalties imposed by the canon law of the kingdom, end quote. In autos particulares, held in churches which must not be polluted by judgments of blood, the Suprema pointed out, in a consulta of April 7, 1690, that the secular judges could wait at a designated place when it sufficed that a notary informed them in writing that, quote, N had been declared a heretic by sentence of the Holy Office, end quote, simultaneously delivering the convict when they must accept this assertion, and without delay execute the sentence, unless they wish the holy office to prosecute them as fautors of heretics, and impeders of its free jurisdiction. At the same time, the judges are to continue as usual to pronounce the formal sentence. Still, the estilo of the Inquisition required the ghastly comedy of asking mercy. In the official formula of the sentence, the clause announcing relaxation to the civil magistrate proceeds, quote, whom we ask and charge most affectionately to treat him benignantly and mercifully, end quote. In sentences of the absent and dead, where the effigy alone was abandoned to the secular arm, there is no prayer for mercy, as there was no effusion of blood to create irregularity. In the rigid formalism of inquisitorial procedure, after the Suprema had established its minute control, it is safe to assume that this official formula was universally followed. All this affords ample proof that the avoidance of irregularity was the only motive that actuated the Inquisition in this matter, but if further evidence is required, it is furnished by the fact that still greater scruple existed in the exercise of the temporal jurisdiction acquired by the Spanish Holy Office over all matters concerning its officials, because such cases were not provided for in the commissions of the inquisitors general, from which were delegated the powers of the tribunals. In 1514 the question arose when Miser Castillo, assessor in the Saragossa tribunal, was murdered, and two of his assassins, Joan Ugue and Pere Gasco, were tried and convicted. The inquisitors dared not deliver them to the secular arm for execution, and various devices were discussed, but the matter was settled by procuring from Leo X his motu proprio, cum sicut asepimus, January 28, 1515, in which he granted faculties to the inquisitors to arrest, try, and deliver for punishment to the secular authorities any one who had struck, mutilated, or slain an official of the Inquisition, even if it entailed effusion of blood or mutilation or death, without incurring any note of irregularity. Under this the tribunals acted when such cases arose, 
notably in Granada about 1545, when seven persons were thus relaxed, six Moriscos and an old Christian, who, while in prison, killed the alcaide and his assistant, and who were hanged before burning. In time, the cardinals of the Roman Inquisition were beset with similar scruples, and, to relieve their consciences, Pius V, October 9, 1567, granted a decree empowering them to participate in the sentences of blood without incurring irregularity. This applied only to Italy, but it was otherwise with the terrible bull, Si de Protegendis, April 1, 1569, commanding the delivery to the secular arm, for the punishment due to high treason, of any one maltreating or even threatening an official of the Inquisition, or destroying or altering its records. This was ordered to be published throughout the world. The Spanish Inquisition claimed the benefit of it, and had a Castilian version of it published every year. It made no allusion to irregularity, tacitly assuming that none was incurred, and it was often cited in Spain to that effect. Still, when in 1579 the Toledo Tribunal desired the death penalty for Francisco de la Bastida, for personating an official of the Inquisition, and there was no secular law to that effect, a special brief was obtained from Gregory the Thirteenth, empowering it to find him guilty of death and deliver him to the secular arm for execution without incurring irregularity. There seems to have arisen a fresh sense of insecurity about 1605. The brief of Leo X was well nigh forgotten. Some tribunals had copies of it, but most of them had not, and the bull C. de Protegendis did not specifically meet cases that arose. Supplication was therefore made to Paul V to extend to Spain the 1567 decree of Pius V, which he granted by a brief of November 29, 1605, repeated in 1607. In this he bestowed the fullest powers, not only on inquisitors, but on all their officials, in all cases, whether of faith or not, coming within their competence, to participate in sentences of torture, mutilation, or death, without incurring irregularity. This would appear ample enough to remove all possible scruples, and yet subsequently contingencies occasionally arose which excited debate, or called for papal intervention to quiet sensitive consciences. In the work of exterminating heresy, the rules which governed the Spanish Inquisition were more merciless than those framed by its predecessor. At first, in the medieval tribunals, it was only the pertinacious and impenitent heretic who was consigned to the stake. He who recanted and professed conversion, even at the last moment, was admitted to reconciliation. Then gradually, as it was found that these enforced conversions were frequently insincere, relapse was regarded as proof of impenitence and pertinacity, and was subjected irremissibly to the death penalty, and this included those who had abjured for vehement suspicion. The treatment is exemplified in the case of Fray Bonato, the head of a little body of spiritual Franciscans in Catalonia. He was pertinacious until the flames had roasted him one side, when his resolution gave way. He professed conversion and was rescued, but some years later he was found to be still cherishing his heresies, and in 1335 he was burnt alive. The number of burnings in the Spanish Inquisition, during its first half-century, could never have occurred under the old rules. Indeed, in the first rush and fury, the case of Juan Chinchilla, in 1483, volume 2, page 468, indicates that even frank confession failed to save from the stake those who had sought reconciliation in a term of grace, but had been prevented by causes beyond their control. Even when rules began to be framed, the instructions of 1484 placed the lives of those on trial at the discretion of the tribunal, for they required that repentance and asking for reconciliation must be expressed prior to rendering the final sentence, to entitle the culprit to mercy. While even then, if the inquisitors considered that the repentance was feigned, and they had not fair hope of genuine conversion, 
they were empowered to declare him an impenitent and relax him to the secular arm, all of which was left to their consciences. The rule thus expressed presents two points, the development of which requires separate consideration. As regards the time of confessing and begging mercy, which the instructions limit to the period prior to the rendering of the sentence, this was extended to the time of reading of the sentence at the auto de fe. Yet this was grudgingly admitted by the instructions of 1561, which say that often when convicts on the staging profess conversion, the inquisitors receive them to reconciliation, but this ought rarely to be done, for it is a very perilous thing which should be suspected to come from dread of death rather than from true repentance. Yet, in spite of this warning, it was customary to suspend proceedings with those who, at the auto de fe, before the reading of their sentences, claimed to be penitent. They were remanded to the Inquisition, and, if they confessed fully as to themselves and others, they were reconciled with appropriate punishment. Such cases were of constant occurrence. In the Cordova Auto of April 12, 1722, there were four. Even while the sentence was being read, the doubt was thrown in favor of the culprit, as in the Murcia Auto of May 17, 1722, when Inés Álvarez Pereira, convicted as an impenitent Judaizer, begged mercy during the reading of her sentence, professed that she wished to confess and be converted, and was sent back to prison where she was reconciled. In fact, in public autos, where there were convicts to be relaxed, there was always a room arranged under the staging to which the repentant culprit was at once transferred, and one of the inquisitors descended to take his confession before he should have time to change his good resolutions. In such cases, reconciliation was accompanied with confiscation, irremissible prison, and San Benito, and usually one or two hundred lashes for tardy confession. The instructions of 1561 were justified in claiming that little reliance was to be placed on conversions thus obtained. For the most part, the awful experience led penitents who thus escaped to cherish their beliefs in secret, but occasionally there was one whose conscience could not pardon the weakness that led to a betrayal of faith. Diego Lopez Duro, an humble retailer of tobacco, condemned for Judaism, recanted while on the staging, and was reconciled with imprisonment. In 1700, one day when hearing Mass, he stood apart from his fellow prisoners, and in a loud voice told the priest that he lied, for the law of Moses was the only true one. He would have been slain on the spot had he not been hurried out to save him from popular wrath, but for him there could be no mercy. The inquisitors labored long to save his soul by inducing him to recant without success. He was pertinacious to the last, and was burnt alive in the Seville Auto of October 28, 1703, one of those martyrs whose constancy explains why Judaism has been indestructible. After the reading of the sentence was concluded, recantation did not avert the death penalty, as in the Elder Inquisition, but it was modified to garroting or strangling before burning, for it was received as a principle that a Christian was not to be burnt alive. This was recognized at least as early as 1484, when in a Saragossa auto a culprit is recorded as strangled before burning, porque murió reducido. In addition to this, the traditions of the old Inquisition introduced at first a certain irregularity in practice, and it did not follow that delivery to the secular arm inevitably inferred execution. In a list of quemados y relaxados at Ciudad Real, there are several cases up to 1523 of those who were relaxed and yet had penances of various kinds, showing that they had recanted after delivery to the magistrate, and yet were spared the death penalty. In fact, it continued for some time to be a matter of debate, in which opinions were divided, whether a man who had been returned by the secular judge to the inquisitors, because he recanted and promised full confession, could be again relaxed for execution. The older doctors inclined to the merciful view, and Simancas tells us of such a case in Cuenca, 
which was referred to the Suprema, when many experts held that the culprit could not be again relaxed, for he had made a true confession, and the secular arm had renounced its rights. Even as late as 1640, an inquisitor says that the rigor of executing a man who repents after delivery to the magistrate is not customary in Spain. In this he would seem to be mistaken. I have never met with a case, later than those alluded to, in which conversion professed after sentence secured reconciliation. The tendency to rigor was too strong. The instructions of 1561 make no allusion to such a possibility, as they grudgingly allow mercy for earlier confession. Peña forbids it. He admits that it was the ancient custom, but such conversions are not to be trusted, and experience shows that such penitents are only rendered worse. It was the universal practice to garret those who professed repentance after sentence, and the dreadful alternative of death by fire, when thus impending so imminently, wrought so many conversions on the way to the brasero, even among those whose resolve had held out thus far, that burning alive became comparatively infrequent. In the first three autos held at Barcelona in 1488 and 1489, all the converts professed a desire to die in the Christian faith, and all were strangled before burning. At the great auto of May 21, 1559, at Valladolid, where Dr. Casaya and other Protestants suffered, there were fourteen relaxed in person, of whom only one, the Bachiller Eresuelo, is characterized as a pertinacious heretic, and consequently burnt alive, the rest being garroted as repentant converts. In 1571, there were hanging, in the parish church of Logroño, 157 sanbenitos, of which 101 were of those reconciled, and 56 of those relaxed. Of the latter, nine were in effigy, and 47 in person, of whom only four were specified as burnt alive. The weakness of human nature afforded but rare examples of those who could stand the final test of fiery martyrdom. Notwithstanding the practice of executing all who delayed conversion until after hearing their sentences, there still were those who argued that they should be admitted to reconciliation, basing their contention on the ancient rule and on the silence of the instructions of 1561 on this point. In 1674, the Suprema felt called upon to quiet the doubts of the Granada Tribunal by insisting that this rigor had been the invariable custom of the Holy Office. Still, the question was debated until a Carta Arcordada of May 24, 1699, disposed of it authoritatively. This declared that, in consequence of existing doubts, the Suprema had examined the matter carefully, reaching the conclusion that technically the delivery to the secular arm was coincident with the reading of the sentence. The Inquisition thus remained without jurisdiction, which had passed to the royal justice for the execution of the sentence. Therefore, if the convict was not converted before the reading of the sentence, he was not to have mercy or be admitted to reconciliation, even if he begged for it, but the royal justice was to execute and fulfill the sentence. If the conversion was real and not feigned, the latter being presumable at such a time, any of the confessors who assisted the culprit could reconcile him to the church and confess him sacramentally. Thus his body was irrevocably forfeited, although his soul might be saved. After so formal a definition, no arguments in favor of mercy could be urged. In the sixty-four autos de fe between 1721 and 1727, there was a total of seventy-seven cases of relaxation in person. In the relations, it is not always stated distinctly whether the victim was burned alive or garroted but, from the details given, the estimate cannot be far wrong that not over thirteen, or about one in six, endured the severer punishment. In the Granada Auto of January 21, 1722, there were eleven relaxed, all of whom professed conversion after their sentences were read, and all were garroted before burning. So rigid was the interpretation of the rule that it could not be dispensed with, 
even to gratify the intense longing for expiation which sometimes possessed the eleventh-hour convert. In the Cordova Auto of April 12, 1722, Antonio Gabriel de Torre Savallos, relaxed for Judaism, was converted after the reading of his sentence. At the Brasero, with copious tears and signs of repentance, he loudly proclaimed his Christian faith, praising the mercy of God and of the Holy Office, and demanding to be burnt alive in order to offer God satisfaction for his sins, but this was refused. He was duly garroted, and, quote, he gave his soul to God to the great consolation and edification of all the people. End quote. An unpleasant doubt obtrudes itself whether in all cases the preliminary strangling really relieved the sufferer from death by fire. Spanish executioners are said to possess such dexterity in manipulating the garret that they can prolong the death agony for hours when they are not bribed to give a speedy release. In the universal venality of the period, it is possible that those, whose friends failed to earn the good will of the minister of justice, were by no means insensible when the torch was applied to the faggots. There may have been more than mere lack of skill in the incident at the Cuenca Auto of June 29, 1654, which gave Bartolomé López the opportunity of displaying his nerve. He had delayed professing conversion until after the reading of his sentence, and was consequently relaxed for strangulation and burning. At the Brasero, seeing that the executioner, Pedro de Alcalá, bungled in garroting Violante Rodríguez and Ana de Guevara, he said to him, Pedro, if you do not treat me better, you had better burn me alive. End of section 24《section 25 of a history of the inquisition of spain volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a history of the inquisition of spain volume 3 by henry charles lee book 7 chapter 4 part 2 according to inquisitorial jurisprudence there were several causes which entailed relaxation. The first of these was pertinacity, the obstinacy which led the heretic or apostate to avow and defend his errors, and to resist the well-meant effort of his judges to save his soul by inducing conversion. This heroic temper, which preferred martyrdom to denying what it believed to be the truth, was not common, but the annals of the Inquisition are illustrated by cases of unknown and forgotten victims, whose persistence through torment and persuasion, to the fiery death at the Brasero, ennobles human nature, whether they are Moslems or Jews, Protestants or mystics. It was a blind perversity that refused to see in this aught but hardness of heart, inspired by Satan, and with empty rhetoric sought to draw a distinction between this and true martyrdom. Thus Simancas tells us that we should not be surprised to see heretics sometimes carried rejoicing to the stake. This is not true alacrity, but madness, not patience, but fierceness, and there is wide difference between barbarous fierceness and the modest constancy of the true martyr. Then there are those who, by certain arts, so benumb the body that it does not feel torments. There are also those who deprive the mind of sense, so that they meet death without fear, but that gentleness and placidity, that sublime humility and humble sublimity, we see only in the martyrs of Christ. Yet, to do it justice, the Inquisition, at least after the first fury of its career was spent, earnestly sought the salvation of its victims, rather than to send them through temporal to eternal flame. We have seen that, in the case of those sentenced to relaxation, it advanced the notification of their fate, in order to enlarge the opportunity of the ghostly counsellors, whom it deputed to labour with them. Even before this extension, the instructions of 1561 order inquisitors to do everything in their power to induce conversion, 
so that, if nothing else can be accomplished, the culprit may not die without the knowledge of God. During the fortnight previous to an auto de fe, those sentenced to relaxation were to be summoned to repeated audiences, where they were to be earnestly entreated to confess and recant, with promises of mercy, and learned theologians were required to be present to aid in the exhortations. Even prior to the consulta de fe, pious inquisitors spared no effort to convince the erring of their errors. One relates how, in 1630, he had to deal with two Protestants, an English and a Frenchman, who were pertinacious, saying that they had been brought up in their pretended reformed religion and knew nothing of Catholicism. Their simplicity went so far as to ask to be allowed to return to their native lands, or that persons learned in both religions should dispute before them, so that they might learn which was best, for, as they were illiterate, they could not themselves dispute. The inquisitors set theologians to work upon them, when, after considerable labor, they were converted. Devotional books were given to them, which they eagerly devoured. The trial was delayed, and, by the time the witnesses were ratified, the heretics were good Catholics. When three days' notice of impending relaxation was given, the time was utilized to the utmost. There was a pertinacious heretic to suffer in the Seville auto of December 10, 1719, a Moorish slave, baptized under the name of Francisco Andres, who had renegated and was persistent when his sentence was made known to him. Then twelve calificadores, two each from the orders of mercenarians, minims, Franciscans, Dominions, Augustinians, and Jesuits, with eight familiars, were assigned to his conversion. They were successful, and he escaped with prison and San Benito for four years. A remarkable case at the Seville Auto of July 5, 1722, shows, however, that, after delivery to the secular arm, the Inquisition considered that its functions were ended. There were four pertinacious Jews, two men and two women. Nine calificadores and eleven familiars labored with them in vain during the three days. They persisted through the reading of the sentences, and were delivered to the secular magistrate. The two men and the elder of the women succumbed at the last, professed conversion, and were garroted and burned. The younger woman, known as La Almiranta, at the Bracero begged audience of the deputy assistente, told him that she desired to confess and give evidence as to other Jews, and was remanded to the royal prison. Word was sent to the tribunal, which replied that it had nothing further to do with her. She was kept until the seventh, and, when taken to the Bracero, was more pertinacious than ever, saying that, as her companions had died as Catholics, they were accursed, and that she had pretended to yield in order that her ashes, which were holy, should not be mingled with theirs. Of course she had the martyrdom which she craved. In exceptional cases, pertinacity seems to have been allowed the privilege of preliminary strangulation. At a Valladolid auto of May 29, 1691, there were five pertinacious women condemned for Judaism, described as being from twenty-four to twenty-seven years of age, and very handsome, who excited general compassion. On being delivered to the magistrate, two of them weakened, while three persisted in their faith, yet they were all garroted before burning. A large portion of the cases of pertinacity arose from the death in prison, during trial, of those who did not ask on the deathbed for the consolations of religion, and who had no opportunity of obtaining mercy by conversion. Thus in the Granada Auto of May 13, 1725, out of seven burnings in effigy, six were of those who had died in prison. Suicide in prison was treated harshly, for Simancas tells us that the suicide is to be condemned as fully convicted and impenitent, even though he had previously confessed and professed repentance, to which Rojas adds that, although his effigy is to be burnt, his heirs are allowed to prove insanity, difficult as that is. 
the negativo the man who denied his heresy in the face of what was deemed competent testimony of guilt was classed as an impenitent heretic and doomed to relaxation this was the inevitable logic of the inquisition although it led to the most tragic of all situations that of being tortured to death in honour of the faith which the sufferer held it was impossible under the inquisitorial system to allow a possible heretic to escape merely because he unflinchingly affirmed his orthodoxy and yet when a man asserted it up to the bracero knowing that it would not avail him it was impossible not to recognize him a true believer who would not save his body at the expense of falsely confessing apostasy three such were in the granada auto of may twenty seventh fifteen ninety three burned as negativos and consequently burned alive such men were true martyrs especially as rigid constructionists denied them the consolations of religion in their last moments at the toledo auto of october twenty eighth seventeen twenty three diego de quiros was in this position and a jesuit who heard him in sacramental confession was severely censured for doing so while he persisted in maintaining his innocence again the question came up in the toledo auto of july one seventeen twenty five fernando de castro was relaxed as an impenitent negativo and was sentenced to burning alive on account of the heat the execution was postponed until the afternoon and the convict was meanwhile placed in the public prison with cries he earnestly begged for sacramental confession but the frailes in attendance declined unless he should admit his heresy which he steadfastly refused to do asserting the witnesses to be perjured and the judgment unjust at this juncture there came a jesuit father who yielded to the despairing appeals of the poor wretch and heard him in confession whereupon the judge took the responsibility of modifying the sentence to preliminary strangulation the frailes loudly rebuked the jesuit and were joined by the public disappointed of the promised spectacle of the burning alive of a fellow creature considerable debate followed and a priest named candido munoz wrote an argument justifying the jesuit but his labor was superfluous for while his tract was in the press the suprema issued a carta acordada october eleventh ordering that in such cases the priest should hear the confession and confer absolution or not according to the disposition manifested but in future no one but the appointed theologians were to attend the convict to the last thus it was left to this late date to admit the dying victim to the sacraments probably we may assume on the doctrine that the blood of martyrdom is the most efficacious of all sacraments such cases could not have been common but those must have been numerous in which the unjustly convicted negativo found his resolution give way at the approach to the bracero and in order to escape burning alive and to obtain the sacraments falsely confessed to having entertained heresies which his soul abhorred there was also the diminuto who made a confession that did not satisfy the evidence and thus was held to be imperfect a confession that was not full was regarded as fictitious it inferred impenitence and therefore entailed relaxation we have seen how under the early edicts of grace any omissions in the hurried confessions was construed as rendering them imperfect and subjecting the penitent to prosecution and relaxation especially was imperfect denunciation of accomplices regarded as diminutio if the accused confessed all that was in evidence against himself and omitted the acts of accomplices who were proved to have been with him or if he named only those who were absent or dead or already convicted it was proof of malice and impenitence he was not truly converted and was subject to relaxation after torture in caput alienum the denial of heretical intention in acts confessed which was frequent in those against whom judaic or moorish customs were proved constituted the accused a negativo in the substantial part of heresy which is intention or a diminuto implying according to the common opinion 
impenitence and pertinacity involving relaxation. Thus Hernando de Palma, a Morisco, accused of teaching and conducting Moorish ceremonies, denied and overcame severe torture, whereupon the consulta de fe voted for appearance in an auto and abjuration de levi. Ignorant of this, he asked for an audience, and confessed that, for seven or eight years, he had practiced some Moorish rites, without regarding them as contrary to the faith. In this he persisted, and was burnt in the Toledo auto of 1606. Revocation of confession was similarly impenitence and pertinacity, as in the case of Manuel Thomas, who confessed to Judaism after the accusation was presented, then revoked the confession, and persisted in the revocation, for which he was relaxed in the Toledo auto of 1585. When the Reformation plunged the church into a struggle for life, of which no man might foretell the result, there arose a demand for sharper measures of repression. The dogmatizer or heresiarch, he who not only condemned his own soul to perdition, but sought to carry others along with him, by disseminating his pestiferous doctrines, might recant and make his peace with God, but not with God's earthly ministers. Simancas well expresses the hatred intensified by fear, which was aroused by the teachers of the new doctrines. The heresiarch, he says, the master of errors, is to be relaxed, and under no circumstances is to be received back into the church. He is unworthy of pardon who has led others into error, like a murderer who has slain many. He is a crafty homicide who daily sheds the blood of souls. He who teaches heresy slays, not with the sword, but with the poison of his doctrine. He kills not the body, but the soul, not with temporary, but with eternal death. Wherefore, he is worthy of the severest punishment. And of all others, the teachers of the Lutheran heresies are in no way to be pardoned. Yet the church had always professed to welcome to reconciliation its erring children, who renounced their errors and begged for mercy, provided they were not relapsed, and the Inquisition from its inception had acted on this principle. On this were based the powers deputized to it, and when, in 1558, the discovery of the Protestants of Valladolid was so exploited as to throw Spain into agitation, and it was desired to make an example of Dr. Agustin Casaya, some further grant of faculties was felt to be necessary. Paul IV was nothing loath. In 1555 he had apparently desired to show that Rome was not to be outdone by Geneva in persecuting rigor, and that, if Calvin in 1553 had burnt Servet for denying the Trinity, he could be equally zealous for the faith. By the bull Cum Corundum, he decreed that all who denied the Trinity, the divinity of Christ, his conception through the Holy Ghost, his death for human salvation, or the perpetual virginity of the Virgin, and who did not confess to inquisitors and abjure their errors within three months, and all who in future should maintain those heresies, should be treated as though they were relapsed, and as such should be forthwith relaxed to the secular arm. Having thus extended the catalogue of unpardonable heresies, he was quite ready to grant the additional powers sought by the Spanish Inquisition. By a brief of January 4, 1559, he bestowed on the Inquisitor General and Suprema a faculty to relax all heresiarchs and other heretics, even though they were not relapsed, and though they desired to abjure their heresies, when it was believed, with very similitude, that the abjuration was not sincere, but was only to escape punishment. This was, in fact, no more than the power assumed in the instructions of 1484, but under it, as we shall see hereafter, were relaxed some conspicuous heretics, such as Dr. Casaya at Valladolid and Juan Ponce de Leon at Seville, although they had renounced their errors and sought reconciliation in advance of the autos de fe. It thus became a principle in inquisitorial jurisprudence that the Inquisitor General and Suprema could relax dogmatizers, irrespective of pertinacity or relapse. This was not confined to Protestants. 
about 1600, the Suprema had to decide the case of a Morisco al accused of being a teacher of Islam, who confessed to teaching his wife but denied other proselytism. A consulta presented to the Suprema argued that, although by law a dogmatizer must be relaxed, yet if he spontaneously denounces himself and is sincerely repentant he can be reconciled for his conversion and humility serve as an example to those whom he has misled in the present case however the alfaki has only confessed partially and to save himself wherefore he should be relaxed and to this the suprema assented yet this severity had exceptions in the Seville Auto of July 5, 1722, Pedro de Alpuin, reconciled with perpetual prison and San Benito, had five years of galleys added for being a teacher of the law of Moses, and even these were remitted in consideration of his infirmities. End of section 25《セクション26》of a history of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 7, Chapter 4, Part 3. Relapse was the most fruitful source of relaxation at least after the first rage of the Inquisition had exhausted itself. It has been already stated that, after reconciliation or abjuration de vehementi, any backsliding was held to indicate that the conversion had been fictitious, that the culprit was impenitent and pertinacious, and that he was to be abandoned to the secular arm without hope of mercy. This was an unvarying principle of the canon law, the Suprema, in a case brought before it in 1536, declared that it could not dispense for that which the law enjoined, and therefore it was powerless to relieve the relapsed from his punishment. Simancas is equally emphatic. The relapsed is to be condemned without hope of pardon. In the first audience of the accused, the inquisitor was required to tell him that, if he would discharge his conscience, his case would be dispatched with speed and mercy, but if the charge was relapse, the word mercy was to be omitted, because no mercy could be shown. Even prompt and full confession was of no avail, the law was absolute and implacable. This severity was greatly enhanced by the elastic definition given to relapse, the reconciled penitent had to walk warily, for any unconscious return to ancestral habits was sufficient to convict him. About 1500 the Suprema decreed that penitents communicating with unreconciled heretics were to be held as relapsed, and all evidence coming before the tribunals was to be scrutinized for proof that would justify prosecution, evidently of those who might chance to be incidentally named in it, and then, if this proved insufficient for conviction, any admission of the accused, not contained in his former confession, could be used to condemn him as a fictitious convert. How this was construed in practice, we learn from Simancas, who says that he is considered a relapsed who, after abjuring heresy, talks with heretics, or visits them, or makes presents to them, or favors and communicates with them, so that he cannot but be held to do it as a consequence of his heresy. The man who had been reconciled thus lived in unceasing danger, that, at any moment, some acquaintance might be tried and convicted, and his name might occur in the evidence as being on good terms with him. Safety, indeed, could only be secured by resolutely isolating himself from his family and his race. It was the same with those who had only abjured for vehement suspicion. The instructions of 1561 declare absolutely that, if they confess or are convicted, they must be relaxed, for the inquisitors have no power to reconcile them, although they are not truly but only fictitiously relapsed. Still, there were some exceptions. Self-denunciation for relapse, it was admitted, required relaxation under the law, but it was argued that such second confession was not really a conviction, 
for it showed that the penitent was not incorrigible and should be admitted to mercy. Such cases must have been exceedingly rare, but we have seen one in that of Usurle de la Croix, volume 2, page 572, where, it will be remembered, a third self-denunciation was visited with the stake. Moriscos enjoyed a special exception. The wholesale enforced conversion of the Moors of Castile in 1502, and of the kingdoms of Aragon in 1525, filled the land with nominal Christians, whose baptism served no other purpose than subjecting them to the Inquisition. They were largely vassals of nobles, to whom their services were indispensable, and to subject whole populations to the penalties of a relapse which was inevitable, was a prospect that might well stagger the statesman, if not the churchman. In the unsparing rigor of the canon law, escape from this was to be sought only in Rome, and in March 1510, Ferdinand asked for a bull enabling the converts to avoid the penalties of relapse. The request was doubtless granted, and was followed by numerous papal briefs, issued during the remainder of the century, which bore the shape of empowering the inquisitors-general to appoint confessors with power to absolve Morisco penitents with secret absolution and penance, even if they had relapsed repeatedly, or to proclaim terms of grace, during which absolution could be had irrespective of relapse, together with other devices, the futility of all which we shall see hereafter. This was but one of the many attempts to solve the increasing difficulties of the Morisco problem, and its only relation to the general policy of the Inquisition is to prove how easily, when sufficient motive existed, the unsparing cruelty of the canon law could be set aside. Under that law we can readily conceive how large a portion of the executions were due to relapse. Details are lacking as to the earlier period of activity, but the later records are sufficient to indicate how efficient an agent it was in procuring victims. In the great Madrid auto of 1680, there were eighteen Judaizers relaxed in person, of whom ten were for relapse, six for pertinacity, and two for denial or imperfect confession. In the terrible Mallorquin autos of 1691, all the relaxed, thirty-eight in person and seven in effigy, were condemned for relapse, having been reconciled in 1679, and of these only three were burnt alive as pertinacious. At the Granada Auto of January 31, 1723, of the eleven Judaizers relaxed, all were relapsed. At that of Cordova, April 23, 1724, seven out of eight were relapsed, and the same was the case with all of the six relaxed in the Cuenca Auto of July 23, 1724. In these last three autos, only one person was pertinacious, the rest all professed contrition and conversion, and would have escaped with reconciliation instead of strangulation, had it not been for the rigor in the treatment of relapse. A case already alluded to exemplifies this, and is worth relating in some detail, if only for its psychological interest. Fray Joseph Diaz Pimiento was born in Cuba, of old Christian parents, in 1687. He was bred to the church, and his life was an example of the license pervading the colonies. He drifted around the shores of the Caribbean, involved in all kinds of disreputable adventures. In Mexico he forged a certificate of baptism in order to obtain ordination under age. In the Dutch colony of Curaçao, he professed conversion to Judaism and was circumcised, in the hope of getting a few hundred dollars from the Jews. After incredible hardships, he fell into the hands of the Inquisition of Cartagena de las Indias, where he recanted, was reconciled, and was sent to Spain for reclusion in a convent. While confined in the Episcopal prison, he broke jail, but was captured at Jerez, and was put in a convent, heavily fettered, where he endeavored to get assistance from some new Christians who were under suspicion, but in this he failed, although to excite their compassion he wrote to the commissioner of the Inquisition that he was a Jew. Then again he escaped and fled to Lisbon, where he worked for a Dutch shipmaster, who promised to carry him to Holland, 
whence he could sail for Jamaica. Then a sudden impulse took possession of him, which carried him to Seville, where he presented himself to the Inquisition. At first he professed to be a Christian, but after a few days he told the Alcaide that he was a Jew, and in this he persisted, stubbornly refusing to make defense. Necessarily, as a relapsed, he was condemned to relaxation in the auto of July 25, 1720, and, during the three days prior to the auto, all the learning and piety of Seville were enlisted in his conversion, while prayers for his soul were put up in all the churches. Then came another revulsion, and, after two days, he announced that the grace of God had touched him, and that he was a Christian. But for his relapse, this would have saved him, as it was, it only obtained for him preliminary strangulation, and this he sought to reject, for at the stake he begged to be burnt alive in order to prove that his conversion was the result of conviction and not of fear. This could not be permitted, and the deputy assistente sentenced him to be garroted and burned and his ashes scattered as usual. The pile was fired at 5 p.m., it took until daybreak to reduce the body to ashes, and it was observed that the customary stench was absent. Then the Hermandad de la Caridad asked to have the ashes to give them Christian burial, as he had died a Christian, but the Asistente refused and ordered them to be scattered over the fields, in obedience to the royal pragmaticas and apostolical constitutions, all of which, we are told, was done, to the great honor of the holy Catholic faith. Yet, notwithstanding the canons that prohibited mercy to the relapsed, and withheld, even from the Inquisitor General, the power to pardon, cases, as have been stated above, are not infrequent in which the relapsed were admitted to a second reconciliation. Even as early as 1486, we hear of Miser Gonzalo de Santa Maria, of the great Converso family of Burgos, who was thrice penanced by the Inquisition, and who finally died, not at the stake, but in jail, under a sentence of perpetual prison. Some scattering cases of penances subsequent to relaxation occur at Barcelona between 1491 and 1502, mingled with others in which the full penalty of relaxation was inflicted, though no reasons are alleged for the distinction. In 1511, at Cuenca, Leonor and Juana Rodriguez, who had been reconciled in time of grace, were reconciled again for fresh delinquencies. In the later period, instances of the same benignity occur more frequently, although accompanied with punishment severe enough to show that the trivial evidence required to prove persistency was far exceeded. Thus, in the Toledo Auto of December 27, 1654, Gaspar de los Reyes was sentenced, as a relapsed observer of the law of Moses, to abjure de vehementi to six years of galleys and a fine of a thousand ducats, while his wife, Isabel Rodriguez, and his mother, Maria Lopez, both relapsed, had the same sentence, save that exile replaced the galleys, and the fine was six hundred ducats each. A more unusual case was that of Manuel Rodriguez Moreira, who was relaxed for relapse in the Toledo Auto of September 8, 1704, after rejecting an offer of mercy. There is even an instance, December 8, 1681, of a sentence of reconciliation, citra penum relapsi, without the punishment of relapse, but this is explained by the tender age of the culprit, Diego de Castro, who was but ten years old. Remembering the prudent intimation given to inquisitors that sometimes fines were more productive than confiscation, the heavy mullets inflicted on the relapsed who were admitted to mercy suggest that possibly there may have been financial reasons, in special cases, for benignity. We have seen the number of executions for relapse in the Mallorquin autos of 1691. Besides these, there were twenty-two cases of those who had been reconciled in 1679 who were not relaxed, but penanced in various ways, including fines ranging from one to five hundred libras, and aggregating in all sixty-five hundred libras. It is difficult not to recognize in this 
a speculative exercise of rigor or mercy. As the eighteenth century wore on, it would seem that the canonical penalty of relaxation came to be enforced only on the relapsed who were pertinacious, or refused to confess and beg for mercy. In the Valladolid Auto of June 13, 1745, there are three illustrative cases. Luis de la Vega, who had been reconciled in 1701, was relaxed as an impenitent relapsed, who persisted in denying his guilt. Miguel Gutierrez, reconciled in 1699, and Francisco Garcia, reconciled in 1706, were admitted again to reconciliation with irremissible prison and San Benito, ten years of galleys and two hundred lashes, a somewhat doubtful mercy, but, if the sentence was justifiable, the offence unquestionably under the canons called for relaxation. It was only in formal heresy that relapse entailed relaxation, for, as we have seen, the stake was reserved for heretics. Where heresy was merely inferential, as in bigamy, blasphemy, solicitation in the confessional, reading prohibited books, and other offenses reserved to the Inquisition, relapse was treated only as an aggravation, to be punished with such additional severity as the circumstances might indicate. Even relapse in the crime of administering the sacraments without being in orders, which the Roman Inquisition treated as the equivalent of heresy, was visited in Spain only with the ordinary penalties, in somewhat rigorous measure. Thus Juan Vicente Esquirel y Morales, a man with a number of aliases who had been a foot soldier, was penanced for this offence at Granada in 1727. He persisted in his evil courses, and, in the Cordova Auto of March 4, 1731, he was forbidden to wear clerical garments, and was sentenced to two hundred lashes and ten years of galleys. The latter half of the eighteenth century witnessed the gradual disappearance of relaxation. Llorente tells us that during the reign of Carlos III, 1759-1788, to 1788, he has found accounts of only ten autos de fe in which there were but four cases. Probably the latest instance was that of Isabel Maria Herraiz, an impostor known as the Beata de Cuenca, who died in prison without confession, and, being thus unable to recant and beg mercy, was burnt in effigy in 1802. When it came to relaxing a living fellow-creature, however, the Inquisition by this time was honestly desirous of escaping the necessity. Padre Miguel Sorano, cura of esco in aragon was an unmanageable heretic who discarded tradition and the fathers and held that scripture was the sole authority purgatory and limbo were human inventions fees for masses were simony tithes were a fraud the pope was not the vicar of christ and his decretals were mere devices to raise money all this he embodied in a book which he audaciously submitted to his bishop and other theologians. Tried by the Saragossa Tribunal, he was pertinaciously impenitent, impervious alike to argument and threats, and there was no alternative but to vote for relaxation. Then the Suprema ordered fresh testimony to be sought, and renewed efforts at conversion, but all proved fruitless and again relaxation was voted. As a last resource, the Suprema ordered an investigation into his sanity. All the population of the vicinage was examined, and one doctor was found to say that some years before he had been dangerously sick, which might have affected his brain, and since then he had talked freely of these heretical doctrines. Taking advantage of this, renewed efforts were made to convert him without coming to a vote. While this was in progress, he was attacked with mortal illness, and, at the end of twenty days, he was told that the end was near. He merely said that he was in the hands of God, he refused all the consolations of religion, and passed away unrepentant in 1805, to be buried in unconsecrated ground, when the Suprema ordered the case to be closed without proceeding to conviction and burning an effigy. We shall see that twenty years later, the Episcopal Inquisition was less merciful. End of chapter 4. End of section 26.
Section 27 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 7, Chapter 5, Punishment, the Auto de Fe, Part 1. The Act of Faith, the Auto de Fe, was the name by which the Spanish Holy Office dignified the Sermo of the Old Inquisition. In its full development, it was an elaborate public solemnity, carefully devised to inspire awe for the mysterious authority of the Inquisition, and to impress the population with a wholesome abhorrence of heresy, by representing in so far as it could the tremendous drama of the Day of Judgment. It was regarded as an eminently pious duty. Ferdinand, in 1499, congratulating the inquisitors of Saragossa on the reports of their autos, and the consequent edification of the people, exhorts them to continue to serve God and to discharge their consciences and his. In a similar mood, Cardinal Adrian, in 1517, urged the tribunal of Sicily to celebrate one as early as possible, for, besides the service to God, it would greatly edify the people. The old designation of Sermo was derived from the sermon with which the proceedings commenced, originally preached by one of the inquisitors, but subsequently by some eloquent fraile, who dilated on the supreme importance of preserving the faith in its purity, and of exterminating heresy and heretics. To ensure a large audience, an indulgence, usually of forty days, was granted to all present at the pious work. At the height of its power, the Inquisition spared no labor or expense to lend impressiveness to the auto publico general, as demonstration of its authority and of the success with which it performed its functions. In the earlier and busier period, the exhibition was simpler and confined to the practical work in hand, Thus in the first one celebrated at Toledo, August 16, 1486, the victims were marched on foot to the plaza, their hands tied with ropes across the breast, wearing San Benitos of yellow linen with their names and the inscription, Hereje Condenado, and bearing mitres on their heads. In the plaza they were ranged in tiers on a staging, while the inquisitors and their officials occupied another staging opposite. The sentence of each one was read, and, although the culprits were numerous, the affair, commencing at 6 a.m., was over by noon, when the convicts were carried to the brasero, or quemadero, for burning. Apparently the exhibition consisted only of those condemned to the stake, to the exclusion of the reconciled or otherwise penanced. The autos of the period, moreover, were not confined to the seats of the tribunals. We hear of them in the smaller towns, and, from a letter of Ferdinand, November 21, 1498, it appears that the convicts were distributed to their several bishoprics, where the celebration and execution, though on a minor scale, would bring the terror of the Inquisition and the danger of heresy more directly home to the people. By 1515, however, we may assume that they were centralized in the tribunal cities, for a royal cedula of that year orders the tribunal of Murcia to confine its autos to the city of Murcia, and not to celebrate them in Orihuela. It was evidently desired to render them more impressive, and this was further accomplished about the same time, by requiring all penitents to appear in them, for in 1517 we find the Suprema instructing the tribunal of Navarre, that in future abjurations de levi were not to be made privately, but in the public autos, which were to be celebrated with all solemnity. There was cruelty in this, for appearance in an auto was in itself a severe punishment, and we shall see that subsequently autos particulares, or private autos, were instituted which enabled those guilty of lighter offenses to escape without public humiliation. Thus far, autos were held at the discretion of the tribunals, which celebrated them whenever there was an accumulation of finished trials requiring relief to the prisons. A consulta de fe would be assembled, the sentences would be agreed upon, 
and a day would be appointed. It probably was not often that any external interference was apprehended, as at Cuenca in 1520, where the tribunal had so excited popular passion by arresting the deputy Corregidor, in some collision of jurisdictions, that it was obliged to procure a royal cedula instructing the Corregidor not to permit the inquisitors to be impeded in the performance of their functions. Gradually, however, in this, as in so much else, the Suprema assumed control. A commencement of this is seen, in 1537, when it ordered that, whenever an auto was proposed, it should be apprised before any one else, but even the instructions of 1561 leave as yet the determination with the tribunals. It could not have been long after this, however, that the permission of the Suprema became requisite, for, in 1585, we find the inquisitor of Cuenca, Jiménez de Reynoso, writing, September 3rd, for a decision of certain cases, and for authority to hold an auto, as there were thirty penitents, many of whom, being poor, were a charge on the fisc. The Suprema delayed its answer, and on October 14th, Reynoso sent a special courier, asking the reply to be returned by him. The auto was necessary for the benefit of the sick prisoners, as there was a pestilence raging, and also for the relief of the treasury. It was only by special entreaty that the receiver had paid the expenses of the last month, saying that there were no funds. This brought a speedy answer, with the desired permission. Finally, the customary routine was for the tribunal to send a list of the cases in readiness, and to ask for license to hold an auto. If the Suprema approved, it ordered the auto to be celebrated without delay. Apparently, in the active work of the eighteenth century, there was an effort to regain control of the matter, for a carta acordada of June 5, 1720, orders that no auto be held without advising the Suprema and awaiting its commands. As public autos became less frequent, they lost the simplicity of the earlier period, and grew to be imposing demonstrations of the authority of the Inquisition. Possession was taken of the principal square of the city, and two vast stagings were erected, one for the penitents and their ghostly attendants, and the other for the inquisitors with their officials and all the ecclesiastical and secular authorities, while the windows of the surrounding houses were filled with the notables of the place and their families. The participation of prelate and magistrate in the processions and spectacle was compulsory, for though, as a rule, they were proud to take their places, Causes of quarrel were too frequent and bitter not occasionally to render them unwilling thus to do honor to their imperious adversaries. In 1486, the local authorities of Valencia absented themselves from an auto, and, when this was reported to Ferdinand, he rebuked them and ordered them in future always to be present, for nothing was so important as the service of God. Similar commands had to be repeated not infrequently. About 1580, a royal cedula to the viceroy and officials of Majorca instructs them to lend the weight of their authority to the Inquisition by accompanying the inquisitors in the procession to the staging, and then conducting them back to their palace. In 1588, the president of the Royal Council of Castile issued a general order to all the judges of the royal courts to march in the processions, and in 1598, the inquisitors were empowered to compel by excommunication the attendance of all public officials. The staging, on great occasions, was elaborate and costly, and the question of defraying the expense was variously decided. In 1553 we find the Suprema settling it in Cuenca by requiring the city to erect it, as was customary in Toledo. These two cities and Madrid remained charged with it, but elsewhere it was paid by the tribunals. At the great Madrid auto of 1632, Philip IV ordered the city to construct the staging in conformity with plans drawn by his chief architect, and the same course was followed in that of 1680, where we have long details of the complicated structure erected under the superintendence of commissioners of high rank who esteemed the duty to be an honor. 
it was essential that both inquisitors should be present, and a single inquisitor was forbidden to celebrate a public auto in the absence of his colleague. The day selected must be a feast day, ordinarily a Sunday, in order to ensure a larger audience. It sometimes chanced, however, in the eccentricities of spiritual jurisdiction, that the city lay under an interdict on the day appointed, and in such a case, the Inquisition had to yield. In 1582, the Suprema instructed the tribunals that, when this occurred, they should endeavor to have the interdict lifted for the occasion, but, if those who had cast it refused, the inquisitors must not assume to lift it of their own authority, and must postpone the auto, or do the best they could. In all other respects, the inquisitors were masters of the situation. Repeated royal sedulas, commencing in 1523, addressed to the authorities of the cities, made the inquisitors virtual rulers for the time. They were authorized to erect stagings in the public plazas, to regulate the police arrangements of the towns, and even to assign to the secular and clerical officials such seats and precedents as they saw fit. The climax would appear to be reached when Philip II empowered them to distribute at their will the windows of the private houses overlooking the scene. Against this, in 1595, the president and judges of the Audiencia of Granada protested begging that house-owners should be allowed to rent their windows, and pointing out the hardship of a gentleman of high degree securing the use of a window for his family, and being turned out because the inquisitors chose to give it to a notary for the use of his wife. Philip, however, held good, except in so far that he gave the inquisitors instructions to have special consideration for the houses of the judges and alcaldes. How the tribunals exercised the police power thus conferred on them is exemplified in the Seville Auto of September 24, 1559, when they forbade any one, between the preceding midnight and the close of the solemnity, to carry arms or ride on horseback in the city, under penalty for common folk of a hundred lashes, and for gentlemen of forfeiture of the horse or mule, thirty days of prison, and a fine of fifty thousand maravedis. Numerous relations are extant, in print and in manuscript, of the great autos publicos generales, giving in more or less detail the elaborate ceremonial which developed itself in the effort to render impressive these crowning manifestations of the piety that regarded, as the highest service to God, the extermination of those who persisted in worshipping him according to their own consciences. These show that fashions varied somewhat with time and place, they give the point of view of the spectator, and we may preferably take as our guide a memoir of the seventeenth century, showing the internal machinery, according to the custom of Toledo, drawn up for the instruction of succeeding inquisitors. The minuteness of the rules prescribed shows what importance was attached to rendering the spectacle imposing, and to making manifest the subordination of the civil power, while the care taken to designate the exact place of every man or body of men indicates how fruitless was the authority granted to the tribunal in these matters to prevent the inveterate quarrels as to precedence. At the great Madrid auto of 1632, the Franciscans, indignant at the position assigned to them in the procession, after lively altercation retired sullenly to their convent, for which the Suprema prosecuted them. These undignified squabbles were so much a matter of course that our author, in describing the report to be made to the Suprema, assumes that a place must be reserved in it for them, and for the reasons which governed the tribunal in its decisions." When cases sufficient for an auto have accumulated, the tribunal reports them to the Suprema, which orders it to be held. Then the inquisitors determine on a feast day, which should be at least a month off, in order to give sufficient time for the preparations. Word is then sent to the Corregidor and the Dean of the Cathedral Chapter to convene their respective bodies at nine o'clock the next morning, to receive a communication from the Inquisition and at the appointed hour, some of the higher officials, with familiars, 
announced to them and to the bishop the expected celebration. Then in due time mounted familiars and notaries, with drums and trumpets and clarions, and the standard of the Inquisition, move in procession through the streets, and at stated places a bellman rings a bell, and the town crier proclaims, Know all dwellers in this city that the holy office of the Inquisition, for the glory and honor of God, and the exaltation of our holy Catholic faith, will celebrate a public auto de fe at such a place on such a day. No time is lost in making preparation. Commissioners are appointed for the erection and ornamentation of the staging, and wax is provided for the candles in the procession of the green cross on the evening before the auto. All the mendicant orders and the parish churches are invited to take part in the procession and the auto. Letters of convocation are dispatched, summoning all familiars, notaries, commissioners, consultores, and calificadores of the district, under penalties and censures, to come on the day previous to the procession of the Green Cross. The frailes, who are to assist the condemned during their last night on earth, are selected and notified. Carosas, canonical mitres about three-quarters of an L in height, are ordered, with flames for those who are to be relaxed, and in the ordinary form for bigamists, sorcerers, and false witnesses. Also, San Benitos with flames for the relaxed, with two aspas for the reconciled, and with one aspa, behind and before, for those abjuring de vehementi. Also, halters for the relaxed, and for those to be scourged. If there be effigies, they are made half-length to be carried on poles by porters, if there are bones, the boxes containing them are black, to be placed at the foot of those to which they belong. The effigies wear mitres with flames, and the San Benitos with flames on one side, and on the other the name, residence, and crime of the culprit. Green crosses are also provided to be carried by the relaxed, yellow wax candles for the penitents, and bundles of osiers for the reconciliation ceremonies. There must also be a box for carrying the sentences, of crimson velvet with gold fringe and a gilt lock and key, while a list of the relaxed and the effigies is given to the magistrates, so that they have the sentences ready. Besides these, there is the large green cross to be borne by the Dominican prior, and the white cross by the mayor domo of the cofradia, in the procession of the preceding evening. The standard to be carried by the fiscal is to be made of crimson damask, richly embroidered on one side with the royal arms, a green cross rising from the crown, and a sword and olive branch to right and left, on the other side a shield with arms of San Pedro Martir. The staff is to be gilt, ending in a cross, with pendant cords bearing gold and silver tassels. Elaborate trappings are to be provided for the mules ridden by the officials and silver-plated batons for the familiars who marshal the procession. The parish church usually supplies the carpets, hangings, and other adornments of the staging, and the singers for the evening procession and the reconciliation ceremonies. Then the preacher is appointed, usually a Dominican calificador, though in Galicia a bishop is generally selected, and in Madrid the royal confessor. The day before the auto, the altar on the staging is decorated, and torches and candles are arranged around the place where the green cross is to be set. The inquisitors assign all the windows overlooking the plaza. They order that no coaches shall traverse the streets, and decide where the barriers are to be erected. The municipal authorities surrender the city to them and do whatever they require. In the evening preceding the auto, the procession of the Green Cross takes place, a solemn affair in which the standard is borne by a crowd of familiars and gentlemen. The white cross follows with the religious orders, the cross of the parish church with its clergy, the green cross carried by the Dominican prior and his frailes with torches and chanting the miserere. The procession winds through the designated streets to the plaza, where the green cross is planted above the altar, and is guarded by Dominicans during the night. The white cross is carried on to the brasero, 
where it is guarded by a body, existing in some cities, known as the soldiers of the Sarsa, whose function is to guard the bracero and plaza, and to furnish the wood for the burning. The Inquisition itself is guarded during the night by soldiers who, before daybreak, arouse the officials by beat of drum. Within the building the sanbenitos and insignia are arranged in order, and porters are assembled in readiness to carry the effigies and bones, and such penitents as have been disabled from walking. At 9 p.m. the senior inquisitor, with a secretary, visits those who are to be relaxed, and informs them of their approaching fate. With each of them he leaves two frailes to guide them. If any of the pertinacious or negativos are converted, they are to be heard immediately, and their confessions received, when the inquisitors with the ordinary determine whether to admit them to reconciliation, and the same is done with those converted on the staging. Before dawn, Mass is celebrated in the audience chamber, and also at the altar of the Green Cross. By daylight, breakfast is given to all who are to appear in the auto, and also to the frailes assigned to the relaxed. They are not taken from their cells till the hour of forming the procession, when the penitents are ranged along the walls of the audience chamber in the order of their marching. All are dressed in their sanbenitos with the requisite insignia. The procession starts with the soldiers of the Sarsa at its head, then the cross of the parish church, shrouded in black, with an acolyte who tolls a bell mournfully at intervals. Then come the penitents, one by one, each with a familiar on either side. First are the impostors, then personators of officials of the Inquisition, followed in order by blasphemers, bigamists, Judaizers, Protestants, the effigies and chests of bones, and finally those to be relaxed, each with two frailes. Mounted officials follow, then familiars in pairs, the standard of the Inquisition, and finally the inquisitors bringing up the rear. Thus the procession moves through the designated streets, filled with a densely packed crowd, kept off by railings, to the plaza, where the culprits are seated in the same order, the lightest offenders on the lowest benches. The staging is provided with two pulpits, from which the sentences are read alternatively. Between them is a bench elevated on two steps, on which the penitents are brought successively, to sit with their faces to the tribunal and hear their sentences read. The bench is furnished with a rail, kindly provided for them to cling to in case of fainting, for, with the exception of the relaxed, this is the first definite announcement to them of their fate. Below the seats of the tribunal there is a room handsomely fitted up for refreshments, to which the inquisitors, officials, municipal officers, and clergy resort from time to time, and a similar one is provided for the familiars and persons of note. To the former is brought any pertinacious convict who may be converted on the staging previous to hearing his sentence, and there an inquisitor and secretary take his confession, after which the inquisitors and ordinary consider the case. If he is to be admitted to reconciliation, he is sent back to the Inquisition in a coach or chair, or is replaced on the staging to return with the rest of the penitents. If any culprit dies on the staging, if he is to be condemned to relaxation, his sentence is read and his body is delivered to the secular arm. If he is one of those to be reconciled, he is absolved and the parish church buries him in consecrated ground. If simply one penanced, he is absolved ad cautelum, and the church buries him. After the preaching of the sermon, a secretary mounts a pulpit, and in a loud voice reads the customary oath, elaborately pledging all the officials and people present to obedience to the holy office, and to the active persecution of heretics and heresy, to which every one responds, Amen. If the king is present, the senior inquisitor goes to his balcony, and, on the cross and gospels, administers to him an oath to defend the faith, to persecute heretics, and to show all necessary favor to the inquisition. Then the sentences are read from the alternate pulpits, the alguacil mayor producing each culprit to hear his sentence. 
In this there must be no interruption, as all the sentences must be read if it lasts till nightfall, for which torches and torch-bearers must be in readiness. Although the sentences of the relaxed are left to the last, yet, if the auto is prolonged into the night, they are introduced earlier, as it is essential that the burning should be executed in broad daylight. As these sentences are read, the effigies and chests of bones are ranged on one side of the stage, and the living convicts on the other. They are then delivered to the secular arm, and the judge who utters the sentences does so, either on the stage, or at the table of the secretaries, or outside of the staging. If there is a compañía de la Sarsa, it marches in squadron into the plaza, when the sentences are read, and the men discharge their arquebuses. They surround the condemned, and march with them to the brasero, to protect them from the populace, which in some places is accustomed to maltreat, and even to kill them, against which the inquisitors give special instructions. The magistrates provide the asses on which they ride, and the wood to burn them. The frailes in charge attend them to the last breath, and exhaust all effort to bring about their repentance and conversion. The public solemnities conclude with the ceremonies of abjuration and reconciliation, after which the alguacil mayor and the familiars conduct the penitents back to the Inquisition, where they have supper and are locked up, three or four in a cell. The priests of the parish church remove the black veil from their cross and take it back, while the Dominicans bear the green cross to the Inquisition, singing psalms and escorted by the municipal officials. The next morning the reconciled have the terms of their sentences read over to them. They and the other penitents take the oath of secrecy, and they are conveyed by the alcaide to the penitential prison. At ten o'clock the alguacil mayor, with a secretary and familiars, all mounted, with the public executioner and town crier, take out those sentenced to scourging and verguenza, and the punishment is duly administered through the customary streets. On their return, those whose sentences include the galleys are furnished a certificate of their length of service, and are transferred to the royal prison, and with this concludes the stately ceremony by which the holy office, at the height of its power, impressed its terror on the population. The place of burning, the quemadero or bracero, as a rule was outside the city. With this the tribunal had nothing to do, except that a secretary and alguacil were present to certify and report as to the execution of the sentences. Consequently, the documents of the Inquisition furnish no details, but some may be gleaned from a relation of the Madrid Auto of 1632. For this occasion, the city had constructed the Bracero beyond the Puerta de Alcala. As there were seven to be burned, it was made fifty feet square, and had the requisite stakes with garrets. The confusion and crowd were great, and so also was the fire which lasted until eleven o'clock at night, by which time the bodies were reduced to ashes, so that the memory of the impious might vanish from the earth. The scattering of the ashes over the fields, or into running water, was a prescription of old standing, to prevent disciples of heresiarchs from preserving fragments to be venerated as relics. This was not an easy matter, for the total calcination of a human skeleton requires a prolonged intensity of heat not likely to be maintained where wood was expensive, and the bones found with the cinders on the site of the old quemadero of Madrid, when, about 1868, the Calle de Carranza was cut through it, would indicate that part at least of the remains of the victims were allowed to lie where they had perished. End of section 27。section 28 of a history of the Inquisition of Spain, volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 7, Chapter 5, Part 2. 
The auto publico general, while looming large in popular imagination, represented in truth but a small part of inquisitorial activity. It was a solemnity on a grand scale, in which the holy office magnified its importance, but by far the greater number of cases were dispatched in autos particulares, or autillos, held in churches, or in the audience chamber, or anywhere that circumstances might dictate. In the Toledo record, from 1575 to 1610, there are contained but twelve autos generales, in which three hundred and eighty-six culprits appeared, while seven hundred and eighty-six cases were settled in autos particulares. As stated above, appearance in a public auto was, in itself, a severe punishment, and the sentence always specified whether the offender was to be subjected to a humiliation entailing consequences on him and his family so greatly dreaded that, at a Toledo auto of December 13, 1627, Juan Núñez Saravia, a wealthy Portuguese, vainly offered 12,000 ducats to escape it. The great majority of cases deserved no such severity. The jurisdiction of the Inquisition extended over a wide field. It was, in a certain sense, a custos morum, and took cognizance of a vast number of comparatively trivial offenses. Careless speeches, blasphemies, propositions of all kinds, indecent writings and works of art, sorceries and conjurations more or less innocent, and the like, which it disposed of without summoning the entire population as spectators. Clerical offenders, moreover, as we have seen, unless degraded for formal heresy, were shielded from the scandal of publicity in the audience chamber. The auto particular, or private auto, was often celebrated in a church, to which the spiritual and civil authorities were not invited, but where such portion of the public as could find room were at liberty to be present. More frequently it was held in the sala, or audience chamber, and here again there was a distinction, for the sentence defined whether it should be with open doors or closed, and in the former case the bell was often tolled in order to invite a curious crowd of spectators. Even the apartments of the senior inquisitor were sometimes used in this manner, as when, March 23, 1680, three aguaciles of the Corregidor of Toledo, for maltreating the purveyor of the tribunal, were sentenced in the apartments to various terms of exile. When nuns were the culprits, the autillo was customarily performed in their convent, as in the case, August 8, 1658, of Sor Josefa de Viegas, for superstitions and sorceries, who was sentenced to various penances through the grating of the Augustinian nunnery of San Torquato, in presence of the nuns, and, on February 13, 1685, Sor Dionisia de Rojas was sentenced in the choir of the Franciscan house of Santa Isabel, in the presence of the superior and four elderly sisters. As financial distress grew more and more acute in the seventeenth century, the tribunals shrank from the heavy expenses attendant on the elaborate demonstrations of the great public autos, which, however gratifying to their pride, bore too heavily upon their diminishing resources, exposed as they were to the royal exactions. In Barcelona, there would seem to have been no public auto between 1627 and the revolt of 1640. In Valladolid, none between 1644 and 1667. In Toledo, one was held, after prolonged consideration, January 1, 1651, in which the number of culprits shows that it relieved the prisons of a long accumulation. It was the last public auto celebrated in Toledo, and there was none even in a church between 1656 and 1667. Seville appears to have been less hampered and celebrated public autos generales in 1631, 1643, 1648, 1656, and a most impressive one in 1660, at which less fortunate tribunals unloaded their convicts, for there were seven relaxations in person, twenty-seven in effigy, and fifty-two penitents, but this appears to be the last of its kind there. In fact, the public auto would have been abandoned ere this, 
but for the rule that judgments of blood must not be rendered in churches. As early as 1568, the Suprema had decreed that, when there was a relaxation, the auto must be held in the plaza and not in the church, which was in accordance with the ancient authorities. When the public autos became an onerous burden, we can imagine that this led to hesitation in pronouncing death sentences, for, when this was unavoidable, the convict became a troublesome personage. A suggestive case was that of Juan Lopez, condemned to relaxation for Judaism at Valladolid in 1633. After he lay in prison for thirty months, with no prospect of getting rid of him, the Suprema ordered him to be tortured, and another vote to be taken, which resulted, September 1, 1637, in a revised sentence of reconciliation with severe punishments. A device less damaging to the purity of the faith was to transfer a convict from one tribunal to another for execution. Thus when, at Valencia, the Morisco Jerónimo Buenaventura was condemned for pertinacity, there was no auto in which to execute the sentence. On November 19, 1635, the Suprema ordered him to be sent to Valladolid, apparently under the impression that he would be burnt there, but, after two years, Valladolid reported that it had no public auto in which to dispatch him. So in 1638, the Suprema ordered his transfer to Saragossa. Whether he met a speedy death there, we have no means of knowing but there is something peculiarly revolting in thus sending a poor wretch from one corner of Spain to another, in order to find some place in which to burn him economically. When any tribunal managed to celebrate a public auto, it was utilized to disembarrass the others. Thus the Toledo auto of 1651 had effigies contributed by Cuenca, Cordova, and Seville. In 1655, Santiago celebrated a public auto, to which Valladolid sent for relaxation one living person and four effigies, two of the latter having been kept waiting since 1644 and 1648. The Consulta de Fe of Murcia, on July 18, 1658, voted to relax nine fugitive Judaizers of Beas, but the formal sentence was delayed until December 5, 1659, in preparation for the great public auto at Seville, April 13, 1660, when the effigies were duly cremated. The imposing Madrid auto of 1680, the last of its kind, was a general jail delivery to which all the tribunals contributed their embarrassing convicts. There was no prospect of an improvement in the situation, although it was supremely humiliating to the Inquisition that it could not afford to burn those whom it condemned, promptly and on the scene of their transgressions, under the alternative of exercising a compulsory mercy. Some relief must be found, and a partial attempt was made, in a carta acordada of September 4, 1657, permitting effigies to be relaxed at autos particulares in churches. Toledo promptly availed itself of this by relaxing, December 9th, eight effigies of fugitives in such an auto, but the other tribunals seem to have discountenanced the device. The further step of overthrowing the traditional prohibition of uttering sentences of blood in churches appears to have been under consideration in 1664, when the Suprema called on the tribunals for information as to relaxation in person or in effigy in autos particulares. In reply, Valencia reported that the sentence of Gaspar López, to be relaxed in effigy, voted in 1641, had never been published for lack of an auto, although the corresponding sentence of confiscation had been executed, which the Suprema pronounced to be highly irregular. It required time to familiarize the conscience with so revolutionary a measure, and the project slumbered for a quarter of a century, but the pressure to escape the burden of public autos increased, and the Suprema finally conquered its scruples. A carta acordada of September 23, 1689, pointed out that, in view of the diminished resources from confiscations and of the increased cost of celebrating these public functions with due solemnity, they were avoided as far as possible, 
and it was no longer practicable to reserve for them the relaxed, whose numbers unfortunately were daily increasing. They had to be fed while lying forgotten in their cells, after their cases were finished. Even the expense of transferring them from one tribunal to another was considerable, and it was kindly added that there was risk to their souls in detaining them so long while in ignorance of their fate. Weighing all this, and in view of the fact that there were cases of relaxation in churches both before and after the instructions of 1561, and that the Council of Constance, sitting in the cathedral, had condemned Jerome of Prague, the Suprema reached the conclusion that judgment of relaxation could be rendered in churches, provided the sentence of the civil magistrate was uttered outside. The tribunals were therefore instructed that they could relieve themselves of their convicts in autos particulares in churches, delivering them to the secular arm outside of the sacred limits. To such autos the civic and cathedral chapters were not to be invited, and the rule as to time was to be observed, so that the burning could be performed by daylight. Against this there arose a protest on the part of the secular magistrates, who felt slighted at not being invited and having seats allotted to them. To meet this, the Suprema, April 7, 1690, addressed to the king a consulta deploring the impossibility of celebrating the autos with the ceremonial and impressiveness of old. But great numbers of those deserving relaxation had accumulated in most of the tribunals, there were not funds to maintain them in prison, or to dispatch them in general autos, and to bring them together would excite horror, as occurred in the auto of 1680. It therefore proposed that the secular officials be stationed outside of the church, where the convicts should be delivered to them, but this was not acceptable to the civil authorities, and a compromise was effected, July 20th, designating the single official who was to represent the secular arm. The tribunal was to send him a message, appointing time and place. He was to be at the church door when the procession arrived. He was to follow the inquisitors, the fiscal, and the ordinary, and have a seat near them, and, after the sentences of relaxation were pronounced, he was to leave the church for a place agreed upon, where the convicts were to be brought to him, when he sentenced them and executed the sentences. Thus came to an end the gorgeous general public autos, in which, during its more prosperous days, the Inquisition had made so profound an impression on the imaginations of men. Thenceforth, no matter how many living beings and effigies were consigned to the quemadero, the ceremony was conducted within the sacred precincts of a church, in a simpler and more economical fashion. The great autos of Majorca, in 1691, in which so many unfortunates perished, were held in the church of San Domingo. Yet still there was elaboration of display. A writer, in 1724, giving an account of the autos celebrated in Seville since 1719, is vastly more concerned with enumerating the names of officials and familiars with describing the ceremonial and dilating upon the crimson velvet chairs and cushions and canopies embroidered in gold and silver and the diamond badges worn by the functionaries than with the real work of the tribunal grim and cruel though it continued to be these gods might gratify the vanity of the inquisitors but the old attractiveness of the imposing public ceremonial had vanished the population no longer poured in from all the surrounding district, camping out in the fields, in the vast crowds described with so much pride in the relations of the great autos. When we remember the thousand familiars and officials in Logroño, and the grandees who eagerly competed for positions of honor in the processions, we can estimate the change that compelled the complaint of the Seville Tribunal in 1729. It denounced the lukewarmness of the familiars in accompanying its processions, whereby it was losing the respect of the people, and compared unfavorably with the public demonstrations of the audiencia and civic authorities. It was with this object that the familiars had been so greatly increased in numbers, and had been favored with so many privileges and exemptions. Besides the occasional autos, the tribunal made salidas, or processions, 
on five principal feasts of the year, and it ordered the Hermandad de San Pedro Martir to nominate eight familiars, from among whom it would select four, two to accompany it on the regular salidas, and two for the autos, with threats of fine and imprisonment for neglect of duty. Yet it would not be safe to conclude from this that fanaticism was extinct. At the Urena Auto of June 25, 1752, there were six effigies of fugitives to be burnt, and one of a dead woman with her bones. It had always been the custom to have these borne in the procession, and to the bracero by carriers of the lowest class, drawn from the hospital for vagrants, who were paid for the service. But on this occasion it chanced that none of these could be had. The inquisitors were greatly exercised, and, as a last expedient, they represented to the lieutenant governor, Don Manuel de la Fuente y Davila, that this was an exalted religious duty which the noblest might be proud to perform, and they offered that the officials of the Inquisition would carry the effigies to the church, and then to the secular magistrate, if Don Manuel and other nobles would bear them thence to the bracero. Don Manuel assented, and as his example was followed by the governor, the Marquis of Torre Mejia, and other nobles, the officials were persuaded to do their share, and thus, we are told, the old custom, so derogatory to the sacredness of the function, was successfully discarded. The procession to the Bracero was a triumphal march, to the sound of trumpets, with the escort of all the troops that could be assembled. Notwithstanding such occasional bursts of zeal, the glory of the Inquisition was rapidly departing, and, with the extermination of the few remaining Judaizers, its functions continuously dwindled. In the Toledo Tribunal, the last auto held in a church was on March 7, 1778, for a single penitent condemned to vergüenza for sorcery. After that, to the close of the century, it had but nine autillos, all held in the audience chamber, sometimes with open and sometimes with closed doors, and in each of them there was but a single penitent. Five of the cases were for propositions, two for solicitation in the confessional, one for bigamy, and one for administering sacraments without priests' orders. To this had shrunk the activity of a once prominent tribunal, and with this shrinkage the power to impress the popular imagination with its imposing demonstrations. There is one aspect of the auto de fe which reflects the intensity of Spanish fanaticism in a most suggestive manner. When the Spaniard regarded it as a celebration fitted for a day of rejoicing, or as a spectacular entertainment acceptable to distinguished national guests, he did so in the conviction that it was the highest exhibition of piety and a service to God, glorious to the land which organized it, and stimulating the devotion of all participants. Probably no autos were celebrated in honor of Ferdinand and Isabella, for the stern and rapid work of the period scarce admitted of the pageantry requisite to adapt the spectacle to royal courtliness, and the Burgundian fashions had not superseded the ancient Castilian simplicity. None of their successors, however, of the House of Habsburg, were without such a testimonial of pious loyalty when in fifteen twenty eight charles v passed through valencia there was celebrated in his honour an auto in which there were thirteen men and women relaxed in person besides ten in effigy in fifteen sixty the toledo tribunal contributed an auto with several relaxations to the joyous celebration of the marriage of philip the second with isabel de valois daughter of henry the second of france it was a notable spectacle, for the royal wedding and the meeting of the Cortes to swear allegiance to the young Don Carlos brought to Toledo all that was most distinguished in Spain. When, in February 1564, Philip was in Barcelona for the Catalan Cortes, an auto was arranged in his honor, in which there were eight relaxations in person and numerous condemnations to the galleys. They were mostly Frenchmen whom Saint-Sulpice, the French ambassador, had vainly sought to protect. The ascension of Philip III was celebrated by an auto at Toledo, 
March 6, 1600, in the presence of the king, his queen, Margarita of Austria, the Duke of Lerma, and all the court, where Philip took the oath to protect and favor the holy office. Toledo had but few culprits, as it had held an auto the year before, but a total of forty-six were accumulated by drawing upon Cordoba, Granada, Cuenca, Urena, Valladolid, and Seville. There were but two relaxations in effigy and one in person, the latter being a Huguenot named Jacques Pinzon, whom the Granada tribunal had been leisurely endeavoring to wean from his heresy for a couple of years. He was needed to complete the attraction at Toledo, and his trial was concluded so hurriedly that the Suprema ordered his transfer thither before it had received for confirmation the vote condemning him, so the sentence was made out in blank and sent after him for the Toledan inquisitors to sign. As he is characterized as pertinacious, he was probably burnt alive. The great auto of Madrid in 1632 was held there by the special order of the king in celebration of the recovery from confinement of Isabel de Bourbon, wife of Philip IV, and was graced with the presence of both and of their son, Don Carlos. There were thirty-seven penitents besides seven relaxations in person and two in effigy. The revolted Catalans, who had given themselves to France, took the same means of honoring the Viceroy Condé, on the eve of his departure for Paris, by an auto celebrated November 7, 1647, in which there were two relaxations in person and two in effigy. The ostensible purpose of the crowning glory at Madrid, June 30, 1680, which fitly ended the long series of autos publicos generales, was to honor the marriage of the young Carlos II with Louise Marie de Orleans. There were sixty-seven penitents and fifty-one relaxations, of which nineteen were in person. A Compañía de la Sarsa was formed, numbering two hundred and fifty members, with Francisco de Salcedo as captain. On June twenty-eighth they were taken to the Puerta de Alcalá, where each man was furnished with a faggot. Then they marched to the royal palace, where Salcedo took a faggot, specially prepared for the purpose, and handed it to the Duke of Pastrana, who carried it to the king. Carlos, with his own hands, bore it to his queen, and exhibited it, and then sent it back by Pastrana, with the message that it should be taken in his name to the Bracero, and be the first that was thrown upon the fire. The religious training of the young monarch had evidently not been neglected. It was an earnest of better things in store for Spain, when, in 1701, Philip V refused to be present at an auto general proposed to be celebrated in honor of his accession, and the project was abandoned. We have thus considered the organization of the Inquisition and its general methods of action. It remains for us to examine the application of these methods to the various classes of offenders subjected to its extensive jurisdiction. End of section 28《Section 29 of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Spheres of Action. Chapter 1, Jews, Part 1. As the apostasy of the enforced converts from Judaism was the proximate cause of the establishment of the Spanish Holy Office, so they continued to be almost the exclusive object of its energies, until the similar treatment of the Moors created, in the Moriscos, a class with even greater claims on its solicitude. The rooting out of the latter, however, in the early years of the 17th century, was so complete that they virtually disappeared from the records of the tribunals, while the Jewish New Christians remained, and for more than another century provided the major portion of their more serious work. It had been easy since 1391 to compel baptism by the alternatives of exile or death, but it had never been deemed necessary to supplement this by instruction in the new faith or by efforts to effect a real conversion. 
When Ferdinand and Isabella were aroused to the fact that the conversos were Christians only in name, terrorism was the sole method that suggested itself of accomplishing the great task of securing the desired unity of faith. So, when the expulsion of 1492 filled the land with a new multitude of neophytes, there was the same disregard of the duty of persuasion and instruction. The only utterances on the subject seemed to assume that they would in some way instruct and fortify themselves in their new religion. When in 1496 a royal pragmatica forbade them for three years to farm the royal revenues, the reason alleged was that such occupation would distract them from obtaining due instruction in Christian doctrine. In 1499, the Suprema ordered that the conversos anterior to 1492 should live scattered among old Christians, while the recent ones should be separated from their rabbis, living by themselves in towns, and strengthening their faith by punctual attendance on divine service. It was not until 1500 that it bethought itself to provide that all the banished Jews who returned, claiming to be baptized, must exhibit certificates of baptism for themselves and their children. They must observe the feasts and attend mass and sermons, and all children over six years of age must, within six months, know the four prayers, the seven mortal sins, and the confession of faith. When the enforced conversion of the Moriscos created an even greater multitude of nominal Christians, there were a few equally ineffective instructions issued as to both classes, to which little attention was paid. The simplicity of belief in the adequacy of these measures was apparently grounded on faith in the effectiveness of the inquisitorial process, of which we have incidentally seen so many illustrations during the early period. That confidence continued unabated, and the enforcement of uniformity in this fashion was followed energetically, with only such intermissions as might arise from the lack of accessible material or from indolence in searching for it. Where there was zeal there was little scruple, as appears from a letter addressed, about 1540, by the Tribunal of Llerena to the Inquisitors of Spain and Portugal. It had arrested twenty-one persons, in addition to three fugitives and two deceased, on suspicion, probably because they were on their way to Portugal, and it now asked to have all the registers of the peninsula ransacked for evidence to justify their prosecution. We have had occasion to see how slender was the proof required for this, the slightest adherence to any of the ancestral customs of Judaism, whether of religious significance or not, sufficed, and lists of three observances were carefully drawn up for the guidance of inquisitors. The more obvious, such as the avoidance of pork and lard, the removal of fat from meat, the observance of the Sabbath by changing linen, lighting lamps, and abstaining from work, the killing of fowls by decollation, the keeping of stated fasts, eating meat in Lent, and the like, were known of all men, and perpetual watch was kept by old Christians on the household of conversos, so that all such lapses were eagerly reported to the tribunals, as required by the edicts of faith. They furnished ample ground for suspicion, justifying arrest and trial, when inquisitorial methods ensured that no lurking Judaic tendencies could escape detection. An illustrative case was that of Elvira del Campo, tried at Toledo in 1567. She was of Converso descent and was married to Alonso de Moyo, a scrivener of Madridejos, who seems to have been an old Christian. According to witnesses who had lived with her as servants, or were her near neighbors, she went to Mass and confessed and gave all outward sign of being a good Christian. She was kind and charitable, but she would not eat pork and, when she cooked it for the household, she handled it with a rag so as not to touch it, which she explained by saying that she had a throat trouble which made it disagree with her, and that handling it made her hand smell. There was a little cumulative evidence about putting on clean linen on Saturdays and not working, but this was insignificant and the case rested on pork. The chief witnesses were two of her husband's employees, Pedro de Leano and Alonso Collados, who lived in the house, and their evidence went much into detail as to their spying about the kitchen, peeping into cupboards and watching all the details of her housekeeping. Liano testified that once he and Collados talked about her putting a leg of mutton into water to soak overnight, when Collados said he thought there was some Jewish ceremony in this, and it would please him much to know it, for he would accuse her to the Inquisition, as he was on bad terms with her. Yet Collados, before the tribunal, concluded his testimony by saying that he wished her well for her good treatment of him, that he held her to be a good Christian because she went to Mass and spoke ill of no one and was very reserved, rarely leaving her home and talking with but few people. Elvira was arrested early in July, and at first her trial was pushed with speed as she was pregnant, but her confinement, August 31st, caused a delay of three months. 
She admitted not eating pork, but attributed this to medical advice, for a disease communicated to her by her husband, which she desired to conceal. Little stress was laid on the other charges, and she strenuously asserted her orthodoxy. Of the twelve witnesses against her, she identified six, but her effort to disable them for enmity failed, except as regarded the two most damaging ones, Collados and Diego Hernandez. Of thirteen witnesses for character, consisting of ecclesiastics and neighbors, all but one, who professed ignorance, gave emphatic testimony as to her being a good Christian, attentive and regular in all religious duties, obedient to the precepts of the Church, and in no way the object of suspicion. There was evidently nothing to do but to torture her. This, as we have seen above, see page 24, was administered twice, and resulted in her stating that when she was eleven years old, her mother had told her not to eat pork and to observe the Sabbath, and she knew this to be against the Christian law. But, as her mother had died when she was eleven years old, we cannot unreasonably doubt its truth. The next day a ratification was obtained in the shape that her not eating pork, changing her chemise, and observing the Sabbath, were in pursuance of the law of Moses as taught her by her mother. She had never mentioned this to anyone, for her father would have killed her and she feared her husband. On the strength of this, in the consulta de fe, there was one fanatic who voted her relaxation, but the rest agreed upon reconciliation with its disabilities, confiscation, and three years of prison in San Benito, which were duly imposed in an auto of June 13, 1568. But in a little more than six months, the imprisonment was commuted to spiritual penances, and she was told to go where she chose. Thus, besides the horrors of her trial, she was beggared and ruined for life, and an ineffaceable stain was cast upon her kindred and descendants. What became of the infant born in prison is not recorded, but presumably it was fortunate enough to die. Trivial as may seem the details of such a trial, they are not without importance as a sample of what was occupying the tribunals of all Spain, and they raise the interesting question whether in truth the inquisitors believed what they assumed in the public sentence, that they had been laboring to rescue Elvira from the errors and darkness of her apostasy and to save her soul. The minute points on which the fate of the accused might depend are illustrated by the insistence with which they dwell on her abstinence from pork, on her refusal to eat buttered cakes, on her use of two stewing pots, and on the time at which she changed her chemise and baked her bread. Subjected on the one hand to the ceaseless espionage of servants and neighbors, and, on the other, to the pitiless zeal of the tribunals, even the heroic obstinacy of Judaism, which had triumphed over the countless miseries of the dispersion, gradually succumbed to this all-pervading persecution, so ceaselessly and relentlessly applied. As generation succeeded generation, with no hope of relief, this unremitting pressure seemed gradually to be attaining its object. The prosecutions for Judaism commenced to diminish sensibly. Valencia had a large converso population and, during the first quarter of the 16th century, the trial averaged between 20 and 40 a year. Then came the enforced baptism of the Moors, who for some time furnished a predominant contingent. The latter were temporarily released from inquisitorial jurisdiction in 1540, and during the three years 1541, 1542, and 1543, there was not a single trial for heresy. In 1546, they were again relieved from the Inquisition and, in the following sixteen years, until 1562, the total number of trials for heresy was but forty-eight. In fact, in the ten years between 1550 and 1560, there were but two, showing that Judaism there had almost ceased to be the object of inquisitorial activity. In Toledo, which included Madrid, during the sixteen years, 1575 to 1590 inclusive, there were but 23 cases. In 1565, an auto at Seville presented 74 penitents without one Judaizer, and there were none in the Coenza auto of 1585 in which figured 21 Moriscos. Even as early as 1558, when the Suprema was magnifying its services to obtain from Paul IV the grant of prebends, it admitted that for some years there had been but few Judaizers found, but it alluded vaguely to some recent discoveries of them in Mercia, who would soon be punished. In fact, not long afterward, Paolo Tiepolo, the Venetian envoy, alludes to the arrest in Mercia of a large number of Jews. In 1567, Pius V, at the request of Philip II, empowered Inquisitor General Espinosa, for three years, to have the Judaizing new Christians of Mercia and Alcaraz absolved, either publicly or privately, with a salutary and benignant, but not pecuniary, penance. Clerics, however, were not to be habilitated to obtain orders or benefices. 
There is a story that Dom Joao Suarez, Bishop of Coimbra, after the Council of Trent, made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, in the course of which, at Cyprus, he met many Spanish and Portuguese refugees, from whom he gathered information which he communicated to the tribunal of Yerena, resulting in the detection of many Judaizers in Extremadura. They were treated like those of Mercia, for Philip, in 1573, obtained from Gregory VIII a brief similar to that of 1567 for the benefit of the Judaizers of the district of Urena, except that the faculty was limited to one year. Even greater privileges were granted, in a brief obtained by Philip in 1597, to the Judaizers of Asiha and its district. For not only were they to be absolved like theirs of Mercia, but all prisoners under trial were to enjoy the benefit of the pardon, with no note of infamy on themselves or their descendants, and this time of grace was to endure for four years. These may not have been the only instances of such favors, and they indicate a tendency towards an entire change of policy. That there was hopefulness that the Inquisition was accomplishing its work is seen in a careful state paper drawn up for the Suprema in 1595 by a distinguished prelate, Juan Batista Perez, Bishop of Segorbe, who felt justified in assuming that the baptized Jews remaining in Spain after the expulsion of 1492 had now become good Christians, except one here and there, and that their law was forgotten. In this the good bishop was careful to limit his praise to the descendants of those who had been baptized a century before, three full generations having passed under the chastening hands of the holy office. He evidently was aware that a new factor had been injected into the religious problem, a factor which was to give the Inquisition occupation for nearly a century and a half more. This was due to the conquest of Portugal by Philip II in 1580. Although the union of the two kingdoms was merely dynastic and their separate organizations were preserved, the facility of intercourse which followed led to a large emigration of new Christians from the poorer to the richer land. They had not been exposed as long as their Spanish brethren to inquisitorial rigor and, for the most part, they were crypto-Jews. The fresh justification which they afforded for the activity of the Inquisition, after the suppression of spasmodic Protestantism and the expulsion of the Moriscos, and the part which they played in Spanish Judaism, seemed to require a brief review of the curious history of the early Portuguese Inquisition. It also affords an insight into the relations between the new Christians and the Holy See, and thus throws a reflected light on the struggles of Ferdinand and Charles V with the Curia. End of section 29 Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C., www.nyckidd.com. Section 30 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Spheres of Action, Chapter 1, Jews, Part 2. We have seen, see Volume 1, pages 137 and 140, the reception by Zhao II of the multitudes who flocked to Portugal at the time of the expulsion, and their kindly treatment by King Manuel at his accession in 1495. In contracting marriage, however, with Isabella, daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, the condition was imposed on him of expelling all refugees who had been condemned by the Spanish Inquisition, and, under this impulsion, seconded by his confessor the Frade Jorge Vogado, he issued a general edict of expulsion, excepting children under fourteen who were torn from their parents a measure which caused the most deplorable distress, many of the Jews slaying their offspring rather than surrender them to be brought up as Christians. By various devices, the departure of the exiled was delayed, until after the time when they incurred the alternative of slavery, and thus they were coerced to accept baptism. To temper this, Manuel granted, May 30, 1497, that for twenty years they should be exempt from persecution that subsequently all accusations of Judaism should be brought within twenty days of the acts charged, that the trial should be conducted under ordinary secular procedure, and that confiscations should inure to the heirs. Moreover, he promised never to legislate for them as a distinct race. This latter pledge was soon broken by edicts of April 21st and 22nd, 1499, forbidding them to leave the kingdom without royal permission and prohibiting the purchase from them of lands or bills of exchange. In 
popular aversion increased and culminated in the awful Lisbon massacre of 1506. This wrought a revulsion of feeling. In 1507, the restrictive laws of 1499 were repealed. The new Christians were allowed freely to trade and to come and go. They were in all things assimilated to the natives and were entitled to the common law of the land. In 1512, the 20 years exemption was extended to 1534, and although, in 1515, Dom Manuel applied to Leo X for the introduction of the Inquisition, on the request being delayed, the matter was dropped and was not revived. Until Manuel's death, in 1521, the new Christians thus enjoyed toleration and flourished accordingly. They grew rich and prosperous, they intermarried with the noble houses, and they largely entered the church. Externally, their religious observance was unimpeachable, and Portugal naturally became a haven of refuge for Spanish conversos, nor is it likely that the restrictions on such immigration, enacted in 1503, were rigidly observed. His successor, Dom João III, a youth of twenty, was a fanatic of narrow mind and limited intelligence. But the influence of Manuel's counselors, who continued in the direction of affairs, procured, between 1522 and 1524, the confirmation of the privileges granted by the late king. Ecclesiastical pressure and popular prejudice, however, made themselves felt and, in 1524, a secret inquest brought the testimony of parish priests that the new Christians were suspected of being Christians only in name. Then, Joao's marriage in 1525, with Catalina, sister of Charles V, the only Portuguese queen admitted to a seat in the Council of State, brought a powerful influence to bear. The growing strength of these tendencies gradually overcame considerations of plighted faith, and, early in 1531, Dr. Braz Nato, the ambassador at Rome, was instructed to procure secretly from Clement VII briefs establishing in Portugal an inquisition on the Spanish model. We have seen in Spain the objections of the Holy See to the royal control of the institution and to the abandonment of all share in the confiscations, and these probably explain the delays which postponed until December 17th the issue of a brief conferring on the royal nominee, Frade Diago de Silva, the requisite faculties as Inquisitor General. This was followed January 13th, 1532, by one ordering him to assume the office. The two reached Lisbon in February, but it seems to have been feared that their publication would lead to an immediate exodus of the new Christians, and they were kept secret until laws could be framed, reviving, with additional rigor, the edicts of 1499, prohibiting, for three years, departure from the kingdom, the sale of real estate, and the negotiation of bills of exchange. These were issued June 14th after which there was a pause, explicable only by the lavish employment of money in both Lisbon and Rome. The new Christians evidently had obtained knowledge of the threatened measure. Much of the active capital of the kingdom was in their hands, and the danger called for energetic work and sacrifice. A fitting emissary to Rome was found in Duarte de Paz, a converso of no ordinary ability, energy, and audacity. The king was entrusting him with a mission beyond the borders, under cover of which he made his way to the papal court, where for ten years he continued to act as agent for his fellows. Then, in September, there came Marco della Rovere, bishop of Sinagoglia, sent as nuncio on this special business, who was speedily bought by the new Christians, and they probably won over by the same means the Frade Diago da Silva, who complicated matters irretrievably by refusing to accept the office of Inquisitor General. Duarte de Paz also was not idle, and the confusion became inextricable when, by a brief of October 17th, Clement VII suspended temporarily the one of the previous December, and prohibited not only de Silva, but all bishops, from proceeding inquisitorially against the new Christians. As we have seen in Spain, the Curia recognized that here was a numerous and wealthy class of heretics, to whom it could sell protection and then abandon them until their fears or their sufferings should produce a new harvest this speculation in human agony was all the more undisguised and lucrative that portugal was a comparatively feeble kingdom which could be treated with much less ceremony than spain and joao the third a man of wholly different type from ferdinand or charles v while his invincible determination to have an inquisition in his realm prolonged the struggle and rendered especially productive the game of inclining to either side by turns 
This was so self-evident that Joao almost openly reproached Clement VII with it, and the Committee of Cardinals entrusted with the conduct of the affair rejoined that inquisitors were ministers of Satan and inquisitorial procedure a denial of justice. Joao's reproaches were justified when Clement, by a brief of April 7, 1533, granted what was virtually a pardon for all past offenses, without disability to hold office in church or state, while those defamed for heresy could justify themselves before the nuncio, a function which he turned to account for when recalled in 1536 he was said to have carried with him to Rome some 30,000 crowns. Joao threw obstacles in the way of the execution of this brief, which called forth from Clement, in July and October, strenuous orders for its enforcement, followed by another of December 18th suspending it. It became the subject of active negotiation, and Carl Pucci or Santi Quattro, the protector of Portugal, suggested that it might be modified and, in the guise of fines, some twenty or thirty thousand ducats be extorted from the new Christians to be divided with the Pope. In transmitting this proposal, Henrique de Manessis, the Portuguese ambassador, added that nothing could be done in the Curia without money, for this was all they wanted, and that Clement was dissatisfied with Zhao because he had received nothing from him. Clement, however, who was rapidly approaching his end, on July 26th, ordered the nuncio to overcome by excommunication all opposition to the pardon and forbade all prosecution for past heresies, moved to this, as Santa Quattro told Paul III, by his confessor, who insisted that, as he had received the money of the new Christians, he was bound to protect them. Clement died September 25th, 1534, and the struggle was renewed under Paul III, who referred the matter to a commission, and meanwhile suspended the pardon brief but ordered that all prosecutions must cease, for an act of Episcopal Inquisition had been organized, which continued its operations in spite of the papal commands. The commission reported in favor of the pardon brief, and of an inquisition under limitations, with appeals to Rome. Joao refused to accept this, and a lull in the negotiations occurred, during which the Nuncio de la Rover entered into a contract with the new Christians, dated April 24, 1535, under which they promised to pay Paul III 30,000 ducats if he would prohibit the Inquisition. The Curia honestly endeavored to earn the money, and made several propositions to Joao, which he rejected. Then, on November 3rd, a bull was solemnly published in Rome, renewing the pardon brief, annulling all trials, releasing all prisoners, recalling all exiles, removing all disabilities, suspending all confiscations, prohibiting all future prosecutions for past offenses, and enforcing these provisions by excommunication. In this, Rome held that it had fulfilled its part of the bargain, but the new Christians thought otherwise. They declined to pay the full amount, and Della Rover was not able, at least so he said, to remit more than 5,000 ducats. This parsimony came at an unfortunate moment. Charles V was in Rome, radiant with the glory of his Tunisian conquest, and warmly supporting the demands of his brother-in-law. The result of this was seen in a brief of May 23, 1536, which constituted an inquisition on the Spanish model, except that for three years the forms of secular law were to be observed, and for ten years confiscations were to pass to the heirs of the convicts. Diago de Silva was to be inquisitor general, with the right of the king to appoint an associate. Diago was solemnly invested with his office October 5th, and the brief was published on the 22nd. This probably taught the new Christians a lesson on the subject of ill-timed economy, for a brief of January 9, 1537, addressed to Girolamo Reconidi Capodoferro, a new nuncio appointed for Portugal, gave him complete appellate power, even to evoking cases on trial and deciding them, while a supplementary brief of February 7th authorized him to suspend the Inquisition. His instructions also required him to labor vigorously for the repeal of the law prohibiting expatriation, and this was emphasized by a brief of August 31st threatening excommunication and suspension for any interference with those leaving the kingdom to carry their grievances and appeals to Rome. These appeals were a source of large profit to the Curia, which sold at round prices absolutions and exemptions to all applications. The tribunals threw all possible obstacles in the way of this traffic, and it was important to Rome to keep open the course of the Golden Stream. 
At the moment, it was of less interest to the new Christians, for Cabotafero was as venal as his predecessor and exploited his large powers to the utmost, selling absolutions and pardons for what he could get. As Joao asserted, in a letter of August 4, 1539, his scandalous traffic had rendered the Judaizers so sure of impunity that they sinned with audacity. While demanding his recall, the king sought to curb him by appointing his brother, Dom Henrique, a young man of twenty-seven, to the vacant post of additional inquisitor-general. Henrique was archbishop of Braga, a post which he resigned in favor of Diago da Silva, who retired from the inquisitor-generalship, and Henrique remained, until his death in 1580, at the head of the Inquisition. At the moment, the plan was one of little avail, as Capitofero treated him with imperious arrogance, and even called in question his powers owing to defect in age, and Paul III refused to confirm him. Paul yielded in so far to Joao's urgency as to promise that Capitofero should leave Portugal on November 1st. At the same time, as the three years were about to expire during which the Inquisition was restricted to secular procedure, he listened to the supplications of the new Christians, and in the bull Pastoris Eterni, October 12, 1539, he modified in many ways the inquisitorial process, so as to limit its powers of injustice and to provide ample opportunity of appeals to Rome. A leading clause was that witnesses' names were only to be suppressed when grave dangers to them were to be apprehended. Through the treachery of a courier employed by the new Christians, this bull did not reach Lisbon until December 1st. Capitofero delayed his departure until December 15th and then left Lisbon without publishing it, because, as Mascarenhas, the Portuguese ambassador, reported, the new Christians refused to pay the extortionate price demanded for it. Mascarenhas intimates that the Pope was privy to this, which is not unlikely, for Capitofero was received with all favor. He and Della Rovere were placed in charge of the affairs of the Portuguese Inquisition. He was soon afterwards promoted to the great office of datary, and eventually reached the cardinalate. His nunciature had not proved as profitable as he had expected, for he lost 15,000 cruzados at sea, and brought with him to Rome only as much more. On his arrival in Portugal, he had demanded of the new Christians 2,000 cruzados to start with, and was regularly paid by them 1,800 per annum during his stay, and this in addition to his pardon traffic. There was nothing unusual in this. In 1554, Julius III, in a moment of wrathful candor, told the Portuguese ambassador that nuncios were sent there to enrich themselves as a reward for previous services. With the return of Capitofero, after a little diplomatic sparring, Paul III dropped the whole question for nearly two years. Zhao was quite content. The three years' limitation to secular procedure had expired. The bull Pastori Attorney had not been published. The Inquisition had full swing, and its activity began to rival that of Spain. Its first auto de fe was celebrated in Lisbon, September 20, 1540, with 23 penitents and no relaxations, and was speedily followed by others. It was not until December 2, 1541, that Cristóvão de Sousa, then ambassador, refers to the new Christians who, he says, were earnestly at work to have another nuncio sent, and he had had a thousand discussions over it with the Pope, whose intention was fixed, because so many were burnt and so many thousands more were in prison. The new Christians offered to pay eight or ten thousand cruzados to the Pope, and two hundred and fifty a month to the nuncio. At a subsequent audience, Paul said that the nuncio would have a salary of a hundred cruzados a month, to which the new Christians could add a hundred and fifty, thus raising him above the temptation of bribery, to which Salsa rejoined that this would convert him from their judge to their advocate. Then, on a later occasion, he read a remonstrance from the king so vigorous that the pope walked up and down the room, crossing himself and saying that it was the work of the devil. Salsa replied by dwelling on the misdeeds of preceding nuncios, and even offered to let the Inquisition be withdrawn if it would relieve the kingdom from the evil of a nuncio. Further discussion was abruptly terminated by an explosion. Miguel de Silva, Bishop of Viseu, and Minister of Joao, a man of high culture, had been ambassador at Rome in the time of Leo X, and had formed lasting friendships with the future Clement VII and Paul III. He had recently fallen into disfavor at court and was about to be arrested, when he fled and found refuge in Italy. 
Joao tried to entice him back with flattering letters, while employing, as Silva says, bravos to follow and assassinate him. Paul could wound the king in no more sensitive spot than by announcing, as he did on December 2, 1541, Silva's appointment as cardinal. Joao's rage was unbounded. He promptly deprived the new cardinal not only of his offices and temporalities, but of his citizenship, thus rendering him an outlaw, and, on January 24, 1542, a special courier carried to Sousa peremptory orders to leave Rome as soon as he could present his letters of recall. His report of the manner in which this abrupt sundering of relations was received indicates that it gave rise to fears that Portugal was about to withdraw from the Roman obedience. This deprived the new Christians of such aid as they had purchased in Rome, and left Henrique in peaceable possession of the Inquisitorship, which he improved by establishing six tribunals, Lisbon, Evora, Coimbra, Lamego, Porto, and Tomar, of which the first three remained permanent, and the others were subsequently discontinued as superfluous. On the other hand, Paul III persevered in his intention to inflict another nuncio on Portugal, and appointed to that post Luigi Lipimano, coadjutor bishop of Bergamo. An intercepted letter of Diago Fernandez, the Roman agent of the New Christians, May 18, 1542, shows the anxiety with which his coming was awaited, and throws light on their relations with the Curia. He is expecting the money with which to pay the thousand cruzados to the nuncio, who demands it at once, although his orders were not to pay it until Lipo Mano was outside the walls of Rome. Everyone is clamoring for money, until he is near losing his senses. He has agreed to pay a hundred and forty cruzados apiece, for the pardons of Pedro de Nornanja and Maria Tomas, which he sends, and asks for an immediate remittance. Then, on the 19th, he adds that he has that day been compelled to pay the thousand cruzados to the nuncio. He has raised the amount by giving security, and, though he has disobeyed orders, he prays that the money be sent, as without it all their labor and expense would be wasted. A postscript, on the 20th, alludes to a general pardon which the Pope had agreed to grant at a future time. People, he says, are wasting their money in getting special letters. The Pope prefers that it should all be done in a general provision, to which all should contribute, and it is the most important of all things to accomplish. It would appear from the case of Antonio Fernandez of Coimbra that, when letters of exemption were obtained, the king promptly banished the recipients, who then procured fresh letters requiring the king to grant them safe conducts and permission to sell their property, real and personal. Jao wrote to Lipomano not to come, and he persisted in this against the entreaties of Charles V. Nevertheless, the nuncio set out, and we hear of him in Aragon in August, where he encountered the Portuguese treasurer sent to detain him. The latter was fully aware of the payment of the thousand ducats and of the monthly stipend, as to all of which the nuncio professed the most innocent ignorance, and he further stated that the intercepted letters showed that Cardinal Silva was to receive 250 crowns a month to act as protector of the Jews. Nevertheless, the treasurer was finally persuaded to write favorably to his master, and Libomano resumed his journey towards Valladolid. Joao refused to be placated. On learning that the nuncio had reached Castile, he wrote ordering him to advance no further until he should hear from the Pope, to whom, on September 18th, he addressed a vigorous letter, demanding that no nuncio should be sent to interfere with the Inquisition. He was not actuated, he said, by greed, for there was no confiscation, and indeed, from another source, we have the assertion that the maintenance of the Inquisition was costing him ten or eleven thousand ducats a year. Libomano had assured the Portuguese treasurer that he did not come to interfere with the Inquisition, that his orders were only to see whether the Inquisitors observed justice. If they did not, conscience would require the Pope to make the necessary provisions. His secret instructions, however, were of a very different tenor. He was told that he need not hesitate to act with energy, though observing external courtesy, for Portugal was fatally weakened and approaching ruin. The king was completely impoverished, oppressed with debt, at home and abroad, hated by his people, and wholly under the influence of the friars, while his relations with France and with the emperor were unfriendly. As for the infant Henrique, if he was not to be deprived of the inquisitor generalship, he must at least seek a dispensation for lack of age, ask absolution for the past, and ratify or annul all the preceding trials. As for the Inquisition, it would be a most holy thing to abolish it, and commit the jurisdiction to the bishops. 
The nuncio was furnished with faculties to do this, or to suspend it, and these he was to show openly, that it might be known that this was at his discretion. Meanwhile, he could issue letters to all who asked for them on their making payment, and even if the piece was small, the aggregate would be large, as there were 50,000 of them. The declaratory bull of November 13, 1539, suppressed by Capitaferro, was to be published without consulting the king. It need not be affixed to the church doors, but copies could be given to all who asked, so that they could use it when on trial, and Henrique was to be notified that all procedures must conform to it. If he protested, he was to be told that such was the papal will, and he could write to the pope if he so chose. Libomana was finally told that pressure of all kinds would be brought to bear on him, but he must be firm and remind them that he had power to abolish the whole institution. Whatever we may think of Joao's blind fanaticism, we cannot wonder at his objection to admitting in his kingdom an emissary who came to set him at defiance and to upset all his most cherished plans. On the other hand, a letter in December, from the spokesman of the new Christians to their Roman agent, remitting to him two thousand cruzados, depicts their agonized anxiety for the coming of the nuncio. It will be their salvation, and his absence is their destruction. It is useless to spend money on briefs when there is no one to enforce them. They might well feel desperate, for the Inquisition was active and unsparing. At an auto held in Lisbon, October 14, 1542, there appeared a hundred culprits, of whom twenty were relaxed, and Joao de Melo, in reporting this to the king, complained that it left the prison still crowded with those on trial. Nor was this all, for Herculano gives a terrible picture, full of revolting details, of the atrocities perpetrated everywhere, such as we have seen set forth in the memorials of Yerena and Yane. End of section 30 Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C., www.nyckidd.com. Section 31 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee, Book 8, Spheres of Action, Chapter 1, Jews, Part 3. Although ignorant of the nuncio's instructions, Joao persisted in refusing him admittance, until he should have an answer to his letter of September 18th. This was long in coming, and Libermano vainly complained of the disrespect to the Holy See shown in making him wander from one tavern to another. For a while he remained in Salamanca, and then, on false news that he would be received, he went to Barajos, only to find the frontier closed to him, and there he was forced to stay, for some months, hopeless and querulous. Meanwhile Francis Botelu, who had been sent with Zhao's letter, was conferring with the Pope, who blandly assured him that Lipomano's mission was only to notify the king of the approaching convocation of the Council of Trent. At length it was arranged that he should confine himself to this, and to such other matters as the king should permit. A brief to this effect, satisfactory to the Portuguese agents, was framed and dispatched from Rome November 3rd. It can scarce have reached Portugal before the early months of 1543, for a letter of Zhao of March 2nd mentions its arrival and his satisfaction at the settlement, in which he hopes that the Pope's acts may correspond with his words. Lipomano, thus shorn of his powers and with no financial prospect before him, was anxious for his recall, but he was not permitted to return until the close of 1544. He obeyed the final instructions and abstained from aiding the new Christians. Possibly, Paul's yielding in this may be explained by a negotiation on foot early in 1543. Through the Cardinal of Burgos, it was proposed to Joao that the Pope would concede to Portugal an inquisition identical with that of Castile, if, for a term of years, one half of the confiscations should belong to the Holy See. This cold-blooded offer to sell out the new Christians shows how purely mercantile had been the fluctuating protection accorded to them hitherto, and it was met by Joao in the same spirit. Protesting that he had never sought for gain in his efforts to serve God, he instructed his envoy that he might agree to three years, but must endeavor to reduce the papal share to a quarter. 
The attempted bargain came to naught, but Rome was apprehensive that Portugal might follow the example of England, and Zhao was propitiated with a renewed offer of a cardinal's hat for the infant Henrique. To this he at first replied surlily, that when he had asked for it, it had been given to Silva, and now that he had not asked, it did not seem fitting to accept it. Subsequently, however, he assented, and, in December 1545, Henrique received the honor. Moreover, in October 1543, a signal favor was granted to the Inquisition, by a perpetual brief empowering the officials to enjoy the fruits of benefices in absentia, although, as we have seen, in Spain the grant was only quinquennial. It is true that this was not wholly gratuitous, for it cost 250 cruzados in addition to the regular fees of 70. The Inquisition was assisted in another way. Through the subsidized Cardinal of Paris, the Portuguese ambassador, Baltazar de Feria, was enabled to inspect all paper letters granted to new Christians. In a letter of February 18, 1544, he describes the use made of this information, for he opposed each one, and it was fought over bitterly, the unfortunate Pope being assailed on both sides and driven to change his decisions repeatedly, as the rival influences prevailed. Information, moreover, was sent in advance to Henrique, so as to enable him to forestall the papal graces or render them ineffective. Henrique was instructed to disregard as surreptitious everything that Faria had not seen, to appeal to the Pope and to report to Faria, for this was the way that the Castilian inquisitors managed. It was a kind of guerrilla warfare, in the interval of the greater struggles. One of these conflicts was close at hand. Paul III resolved to send another nuncio, charged with the duty of wrenching from the king Cardinal Silva's temporalities and of moderating the severity of the Inquisition. For this he selected Giovanni Ricci de Montepulciano, who at the same time was advanced to the archbishopric of Siponto. Faria flattered himself that he had succeeded in postponing the nuncio's departure till the king should be heard from, but in spite of this Ricci started July 17, 1544. He traveled leisurely, and did not reach Valladolid until November 5th, where he found awaiting him Cristóvão de Castro, with letters from the king forbidding his admittance. He succeeded in making de Castro believe that he had no instructions concerning Silva or the Inquisition that would offend the king, who accordingly wrote November 28th, cautiously admitting him under these presumptions. It so chanced, however, that, before the courier started with this letter, Lipamano, who was still acting as nuncio, received and affixed at the church doors a papal brief of September 22nd, inhibiting all inquisitors and ecclesiastical judges from executing any sentences pronounced on new Christians, or from proceeding to sentence in any cases, until Ricci should arrive, investigate, and report as to the conduct of the Inquisition, after which the papal pleasure should be made known. This settled the question. Copies of the brief were sent to de Castro to justify to the Spanish court the absolute refusal to admit Ricci until Joao should have an answer to letters demanding explanation and reparation dispatched by a special courier. At the same time the brief was obeyed, for there were no more autos after June 1544 until 1548. Considering all that had occurred during the past ten years, there was an inexcusable aggravation about all this, which it is difficult to understand in the absence of information as to the secret working of the new Christians in Rome, unless it was to convince Zhao that he would have to pay roundly for the pleasure of persecuting his subjects. He exhaled his wrath in one or two letters to Balthazar de Faria, and, on January 13, 1545, he dispatched Simao de Veiga in hot haste with instructions to demand the installation of the Inquisition in satisfaction of the royal grievances. The recent brief must be revoked, and Ricci must come under the limitations imposed on his predecessor and must say nothing about Cardinal Silva. A prolix letter to the Pope to be read in consistory was free-spoken but not intemperate, and, considering the provocation, was much more moderate than the papal duplicity had deserved. This letter remained unanswered for nearly six months, during which another experiment was tried on Zhao's credulity. Cardinal Sforza, one of the papal grandsons, wrote in the name of the Pope that, if the nuncio was admitted, all that he asked for the Inquisition would be conceded, and Cardinal Crescenzio confirmed this verbally. As late as June 22, 1545, he was writing in this sense, 
not knowing that on june sixteenth the pope had responded to his letter in a brief in which with exasperating affectation of benignity he pardoned joao's asperity against joao's assertions of the wickedness of the new christians and the mildness of the inquisition he set the constant complaints reaching him of its cruelty and injustice and the numerous burnings of the innocent as it was under his jurisdiction he was responsible and he could not forego the duty of investigating the truth of these conflicting statements there was also the spoliation of cardinal silva which must be redressed the brief closed with the significant threat that if these matters were not remedied he could not expose himself before almighty god to the charge of negligence in an affair of such moment the devious ways of the papal court are hard to follow four days before the date of this brief on june twelfth cardinal sforza sent to joao the written assurance that was demanded promising that if he would admit the nuncio the pope would grant all that he desired as to the inquisition on receiving this in august the king at once replied that in reliance on the cardinal's assurances he would permit ricci to enter portugal and he asked to have the necessary bull made out and sent by simao de Viega. at the same time he gave ricci permission to come cautiously adding that it must be under the limitations imposed on Limpamano. ricci detained by sickness did not arrive until september ninth and then he was the bearer of the minatory brief of june sixteenth that Zhao was thunderstruck may well be believed, and he wrote to his envoys that he knew not what to say. The Pope had sought a compromise, offering to revoke the brief of September 22, 1544, and that, after the nuncio had reported, he would leave everything in the king's hands, but he refused to carry out the promises of Cardinal Sforza. No answer was given to this, but the brief of revocation was made out and reached Ricci, January 18, 1546, accompanied with one empowering him to act in case he discovered abuses in the Inquisition, but the only investigation that Zhao would permit was that he should examine the papers in four or five cases and interrogate the Inquisitor concerning them. The first case submitted was that of a septuagenarian, burnt some years before. He was one of those who had been converted by force, he had at once confessed more than had been testified against him and had begged for mercy ricci asked the inquisitor joao de mayo why he had burnt him as this was not a case of relapse to which mayo replied that his repentance was simulated because he had varied in the three examinations but on investigating the record the variations were found to be trifling ricci asked for a copy of the process to send to rome and it was promised but not given his report was naturally adverse to the Inquisition, and the Pope, assuming that the brief of 1536 had established it for ten years only, notified Joao that the term had expired. In deference to him it was prolonged for a year, but he was told that, within that time, the question as to the new Christians must be definitely settled. It was suggested that a general pardon could be granted, or that he could banish them all from his kingdom. We may fairly assume that, in such a crisis as this, the gold of the new Christians had not been spared in Lisbon or on Rome. Joao evidently felt that the turning point had come, and that some supreme effort must be made to outbid his subjects. He had not been niggardly on his side in responding to the urgent calls of his ambassadors for liberality towards the cardinals. Cardinal Farnese, the favorite grandson of Paul III, and the most influential member of the Sacred College, had a pension from him of 3,200 cruzados, assigned in 1544 equally on the seas of Braga and Coimbra to assure its continuance. At a critical moment in 1545, the arrearages and two years in advance were paid to him, in a lump sum of 13,000 cruzados. So little reserve was there in these matters that, after the death of Cardinal Santiquatro, the protector of Portugal, Joao actually suggested the employment of Paul III as his successor, pointing out the large propinas that would inure to him from certain provisions as to bishops which the king was soliciting. For these and for the payment to Farnese, he forwarded bills of exchange for 33,000 cruzados. Julius III was as mercenary as his predecessor. In 1551, Zhao, in response to a hint that a present was desirable, sent him a magnificent diamond, valued by the Roman jewelers at a hundred thousand cruzados. Julius was greatly pleased, and declared that he would make it an heirloom in his family. But when the next year he intimated that another gift would be acceptable, Zhao, who was dissatisfied with him at the time, refused to respond, saying that when the Pope acceded to his demands to make Henrique perpetual legate, 
it would be time to think of giving him something. This brought Julius to terms. In 1553, the appointment was made, and in 1554, Joao sent him a brooch. In such matters, it was difficult for subjects to compete with their monarch. Under the pressure so skillfully applied by Rome, a brilliant idea occurred to Joao and, in a letter of February 20, 1546, to Baltazar de Faria, he suggested that, in return for a free inquisition, he would grant to Cardinal Farnese the administration and revenues of the see of Viseu, which he had been withholding from Cardinal Silva, thus at once obtaining the object of his desires and gratifying his rancor against that unfortunate prelate by depriving him of papal support. This dazzling bribe overcame Paul's scruples as to his responsibility to the Almighty and his friendship for Silva. The Holy See has been stained with many examples of nepotism and rapacity, but its history has furnished few transactions of more shameless effrontery in sacrificing those whom it was pledged to protect. Still, Paul strove to maintain some semblance of decency in abandoning the new Christians, and he advanced a demand that there should be a general pardon for past offenses and the granting of a term during which those desiring to emigrate could leave Portugal. Joao was determined to get all that he could, and a series of intricate negotiations took place, occupying the whole of 1546 and 1547, in which each side endeavored to outwit the other with little regard to consistency. Matters were complicated by the question of the accrued revenues of Vizu, which Zhao was loath to refund, and which Paul demanded, for the convenient receptacle of the fabric of St. Peter's. Ignacia Loyola took a hand in the fray, and so did two members of the Council of Trent. Frade Jorge de Santiago, an inquisitor, and the Carmelite Baltazar Limpo, bishop of Porto, an honest and free-spoken fanatic, who was much scandalized by ascertaining that a brief of safe conduct had been secretly issued, inviting the Portuguese new Christians to Italy, with assurance of not being disturbed on account of their religion. Thus, as the bishop said, those who had been baptized at birth came and were immediately circumcised and filled the synagogues under the very eyes of the pope, the inference being that he desired free emigration from Portugal, in order that Italy might benefit by the intelligence and industry of the apostates, an argument which was freely used and was not easy to answer. In the spring of 1547, as matters seemed to approach a settlement, the necessary briefs were successively drafted. One of May 11th granted a general pardon for past offenses. All prisoners were to be released, all confiscations returned, all disabilities removed, and reincidence was not to incur the penalty of relapse. One of July 1st, addressed to Cardinal Henrique, announced to him that the Pope had granted the Inquisition, with full powers of procedure. One of July 5th, to Joao, informed him that the bearer, Cavalier Giovanni Ugolino, a nephew of the late Cardinal Santiquatro, carried the bull for the Inquisition, and exhorted him to see that the Inquisitors exercised their powers with moderation. Ugolino was also empowered to take possession for Farnese of the See of Viseu and the other benefices of Silva, and to collect the arrears of revenue for the fabric of St. Peter's. There were two briefs of July 15th, one appointing Farnese administrator for life of the see and the benefices, the other withdrew and annulled all the letters of exemption from the Inquisition which the new Christians had been for so many years purchasing at heavy cost. Finally, under date of July 16th, came the long sought for bull, Meditatio Cordi, instituting for Portugal a free and untrammeled Inquisition. It declared that the Pope, desiring the rigorous punishment of the atrocious crime of heresy, revoked all previous limitations on its powers, and conferred on it all faculties at any time granted to inquisitors. To render effective the withdrawal of the letters of exemption, it evoked to the Pope all cases pending before other judges than Cardinal Henrique, and committed them to him and his deputies with full powers. That Paul did not, without some qualms of conscience, thus abandon the new Christians who had contributed so liberally to the Curia, is suggested by a subsequent brief of November 15th, in which he told the king that, as he granted to Portugal a free inquisition, he earnestly exhorted him to see that the inquisitors acted with charity and not with judicial severity, in consideration of the weakness of the neophytes, for this would be most gratifying to him. The Pope's anxiety to save appearances is visible in the instructions to Ugolino. Those from Paul bore that his wishes were that, under the pardon brief, all prisoners were to be discharged. 
that for a year no one was to be relaxed, no arrests were to be made save for public and scandalous offenses, and prosecutions were to be conducted as in other crimes, while if the law prohibiting emigration could not be repealed, it should be kept quiet for a year, thus hiding for a twelve months his betrayal of the friendless. The instructions from Farnese were more openly cynical. To disarm Schrauch's distrust, he had agreed not to take possession of Silva's temporalities until the affair of the Inquisition should be settled, while Ambassador Faria and the Bishop of Porto had pledged that Joao should raise no difficulties. It was on that condition that the Pope had granted the Inquisition, in the confidence that both should be settled together. Joao was to be persuaded to accede to the general pardon and graces asked for, in lieu of the permission to emigrate, for that would enable the Pope to answer the appeals and complaints of the new Christians, by telling them that these were sufficient. The Pope was anxious that, for a year, the Inquisition should not employ rigor and that procedure should be that of secular law. This was of slender importance, but it would seem to them a great matter. They were also to be told that, as in previous cases, the Pope could have had from them 20,000 cruzados for the pardon, while he had granted it without getting a single farthing. It was further significant that both Ugolino and the Nuncio Ricci were warned to be specially careful to exact nothing from the new Christians. How Joao regarded these pleadings for the victims is seen in a letter to Faria after the settlement. He had accepted, he said, the conditions as to the Inquisition, knowing that further protests would only bring worse terms, but he intended that the Inquisition should proceed in the form conceded by the bull. Those pardoned under the pardon brief, if they committed heresy during the year, could be arrested and prosecuted at once, but should not be sentenced or relaxed until after the expiration of the year. For a year the inquisitor should be directed to proceed mildly, but as for treating heresy like other crimes, it would be unreasonable because the Pope ordered otherwise in the bull itself. As for the prohibition of emigration, it was not for the service of God to repeal the law as the Pope desired. The pardon should be published and the prisoners released. Those who had to abjure should not do so on a staging, but publicly at the church doors. Thus brutally was brushed aside the mask under which Paul had sought to disguise his abandonment of the new Christians. End of section 31. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C., www.nyckidd.com. Section 32 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee, Book 8, Spheres of Action, Chapter 1, Jews, Part 4. Since May 1547, Ugolino waited in daily expectation of orders to start, but it was not until December 1st that he left Rome with the bulls that decided the fate of Portugal. It was probably in January 1548 that he reached Lisbon, where fresh delays occurred in settling details, and only on March 24th was the agreement respecting Silva's temporalities signed. João grumbled at the assignment of the accrued revenues to the fabric of St. Peter's. He had not agreed to surrender them and did not intend to do so, but he finally submitted. The pardon was published in Lisbon, June 10th, the prisons were emptied and the abjurations, we are told, for the most part were private. Thus, after a contest lasting through seventeen years, the Inquisition was fastened upon Portugal and, in reviewing the kaleidoscopic vicissitudes of the struggle, we cannot trace, in any act of the Holy See, a higher motive than the sordid one of making, out of human misery, a market for the power of the keys and selling it to the highest bidder. The new Christians promptly sought to save a fragment from the wreck, by obtaining the publication of the names of witnesses, based on the canonical provision that they were to be suppressed only in the case of powerful delinquents, who could wreak vengeance on accusers. With this view, they procured from Paul III a brief of January 8, 1549, defining that new Christians and others could only be deemed powerful men in respect to the communication of witnesses' names, provided they were nobles exercising jurisdiction over vassals, public magistrates, or officers in the royal palace. 
There seems to have been some delay in the publication of this, but, when it came to the knowledge of the king, he sent, August 13, 1550, a copy of it to Julius III, with an urgent request for its revocation as it would prove the total destruction of the Inquisition. A long struggle ensued between the Portuguese ambassadors and the new Christians, in which, for some time, the latter were successful. Into these details it is not worth while to enter, but the final incidents are too illustrative of the course of business in the papal court to be passed over. Paul IV seceded to the pontificate May 23, 1555. While yet a cardinal, he had expressed opposition to the brief, and the ambassador, Afonso de Lencastro, with the assistance of the Grand Inquisitor, Cardinal Alessandrino, the future Pius V, had not much difficulty in winning him over. The brief of revocation was drafted and approved and sent to the Deteria for dispatch. The deputy there chanced to be a Castilian New Christian and, when the ambassador's secretary called for the brief, he was told that Paul III had done a just and holy thing and that in Portugal the inquisitors wanted to burn everybody. The brief was withheld and, when complaint was made to the Pope that his datary refused to obey orders, he promised to look into it. Nothing more could be got from him at the time, and his reckless war with Philip II gave him ample occupation for the next few years. Lencastro, however, continued his efforts until replaced, in April 1559, by Laurenzo Pérez de Tavora, who brought urgent instructions to procure the brief of revocation. Peace with Philip was proclaimed April 5, 1559, but Paul IV, in his 84th year, was broken and was moreover engrossed with his prosecution of Cardinal Maron, Lencastro and Perez, however, labored with the Congregation of the Inquisition, which, on July 22nd, approved of the revocatory brief. They carried it at once to the Pope and, with the aid of the Cardinal Alessandrino, obtained the promise of his signature. To their dismay, they learned the next day that it had not been signed. Paul had called for his signet ring, had drawn it from its bag, and was about to append it when he glanced over the brief. The preamble did not suit him, for it was not easy to give a reason for revocation without inferring blame. He laid it aside, and this was almost his last act, for he died August 18th, and for three weeks no briefs had been expedited. The conclave was prolonged, and Pius IV was not elected till December 26th. Perez lost no time, and, on his visit of congratulation, January 2nd, 1560, before the coronation, he urged the matter on the Pope. Cardinal Alessandrino was sent for and gave his approval. The secretary Aragonia was instructed to draft the brief and it was, as Perez thought, the first one signed after the coronation. Perez attributed his success to the profound secrecy which kept the measure from the knowledge of its opponents and, in the midst of his self-congratulation, he twice solemnly warned Cardinal Henrique to use his powers with moderation for, under the brief, it would be easy to burn the new Christians. It was in vain that they sought to obtain its revocation. Their agents and their memorials were alike disregarded, and the suppression of the names of witnesses became the established practice in Portugal as in Spain. All hope of relief, moreover, was extinguished when, in September, Prospero de Santa Croce was sent as nuncio. Cardinal Henrique was reappointed legate a la terre in all matters concerning the faith, thus cutting off all appeal and all interference with the holy office. The earnest persistence with which permission to withhold the names of witnesses was sought shows how great a hindrance to condemnation their publication proved, and this probably explains the fact that, during the continuance of the prohibition, the activity of the Inquisition was restricted. A list of autos de fe, as complete as research could compile, indicates that of the three established tribunals, Lisbon celebrated no auto prior to 1559, nor Coimbra until 1567. There may be some defect in the archives to account for this, and they may have been better preserved in Evora, for there we find autos recorded in 1551, 1552, 1555, and 1560. After this, they became more frequent and increased in severity, but, up to the time of the conquest by Philippe II in 1580, the whole number of autos recorded in the three tribunals was only 34, in which there were 169 relaxations in person, 51 in effigy, and 1998 penitents. The insignificant number of relaxations in effigy, when compared with the multitudes that figure in the early Spanish autos, would seem to indicate that they were merely those who escaped from prison or died during trial and that, in the absence of confiscation, the Portuguese inquisitors were not earnest in tracing the heresies of ancestors or in following up the records of fugitives. 
The question of confiscation, in fact, had been left by Paul III in the hands of the king, who found in it a financial resource for his bankrupt treasury by granting, for a consideration, decennial periods of exemption, a practice continued by the regency after Joao's death. Probably in 1568, the new Christians hesitated to pay the price demanded, for a brief of Pius V, dated July 10th of that year, recites that the last term had expired on June 7th, and that King Sebastian had not renewed it, finding that it served as an incentive to heresy, and that he had asked the Pope not to listen to appeals. This Pius willingly promised and withdrew all privileges which the new Christians might enjoy. Doubtless this induced them to come to terms, for the exemption was renewed. After this decennium, Sebastian again granted it in his efforts to provide for his ill-starred African expedition. But Henrique, on seceding to the throne, felt his conscience much disturbed at this concession to apostasy. He applied to Gregory the Thirteenth, who, by a brief of October 6, 1579, renewed the one of 1568, and permitted Henrique to revoke the grant made by Sebastian. As Portugal the next year passed into the hands of Philippe the Second, we hear nothing more of exemption from confiscation. It is somewhat remarkable that Joao neglected to extend to his colonial possessions the blessings of the Inquisition. The new Christians had largely availed themselves of the opportunities presented by the colonial trade, and had established themselves in Goa and its dependencies. The comparative freedom there had doubtless encouraged them to observe less caution than at home, for St. Francis Xavier had scarce begun his missionary labors when he was scandalized by what he saw and, on November 30th, 1545, he wrote urgently to the king as to the necessity of an inquisitorial tribunal. No response was made to his appeal. Joao died June 11th, 1557, leaving the crown to his grandson, Dom Sebastian, a child in his third year, under the regency of the dowager Queen Catalina, who resigned it, in 1562, in favor of Cardinal Henrique. The regency was more mindful of the spiritual needs of the Indies than the late king, and in March 1560, Henrique sent to Goa as inquisitor Alexo Diaz Falsao, who, by the end of the year, founded a tribunal which in time earned a sinister renown as the most pitiless in Christendom. When Lorenzo Perez, the ambassador at Rome, learned through Egypt of this establishment, he expressed to the regency his apprehension that this zeal for religion would prove a disservice to God and to the kingdom, for it would drive to Basora and Cairo many who would aid the enemy in both finance and war. His prevision was justified more fully than he anticipated, for, to the activity of the tribunal was largely attributable the decay of the once flourishing Indian possessions of Portugal. After exhausting the new Christians, it turned its attention to the native Christians, who rewarded so abundantly the missionary labors of the Jesuits, for Portugal did not follow the wise example of Spain in exempting native converts from the Inquisition. It was impossible for these poor folk to abandon completely the superstitious practices of their ancestors, and any relapse into these, however trifling, was visited with the rigor with which were treated similar lapses by the conversos of the peninsula. Even Philippe II recognized the impolicy of this, and, in 1599, he procured from Clement VIII a brief empowering the inquisitors to commute the penalties of relaxation and confiscation for relapse, up to a third relapse but no further, and the faculty was limited to the term of five years. It is not a little remarkable that no tribunal was established in Brazil, although the new Christians who abounded there proved a very troublesome element, from the encouragement which they gave to the Dutch in their efforts to obtain a foothold. There was a commissioner there, but his powers were limited to collecting evidence and transmitting it with the accused to Lisbon, where they were tried and punished. It may be worth noting that, in the Treaty of 1810 with England, Portugal bound itself never to establish the Inquisition in its American possessions. In general, it may be said that the Portuguese Inquisition was modeled on that of Castile. A series of edicts issued by Dom Sebastian and Dom Henrique, and confirmed by later kings, granted to officials and familiars the privileges, exemptions, and immunities which they enjoyed in the sister kingdom. This gave rise to similar quarrels and competencias, and to a multiplication of the privileged class even greater than in Spain. In 1699, we find Dom Pedro II endeavoring to enforce a decree of 1693, which limited to 604 the familiars allowed in the larger towns, while small places were to be reduced to one or two each. 
they were required to possess qualifications entitling them to promotion as inquisitors they performed such duties as might be assigned to them and in the consulta de fe they replaced the spanish consultores with the distinction that they cast decisive and not merely consultative votes to render a sentence legal at least five votes were required besides that of the ordinary there was no appeal from a definitive sentence for the reason that it was not made known to the culprit before the auto in which it was pronounced but all interlocutory sentences and intermediate proceedings were subject to appeal and the supreme council came to exercise minute supervision over every act of the tribunals even earlier than we have seen was the case in spain the minuteness indeed of the details prescribed in the regimento of inquisitor general de castro printed in sixteen forty left little to the discretion of the inquisitor and their systematic arrangement in an authoritative code of procedure affords a strong contrast to the cumbersome and often contradictory cartas acordadas which lumbered up the secreto of the spanish tribunals although the object of the inquisition was the purification of the land from judaism it was not confined to this and it early proved that it could exercise its blighting influence on the intellectual development as well as on the material prosperity of portugal among the learned foreigners whom andre de gavea at the request of joao the third brought to portugal in fifteen forty seven to found a college of arts in his university of coimbra was george buchanan as professor of greek gouveia died within a year and soon afterwards the foreigners were driven out to be replaced by jesuits who were becoming the dominant power in the land the process was a simple one buchanan and two others were prosecuted by the inquisition and thrown in prison the accusation against the former was that he had written a poem against the franciscans that he had spoken disrespectfully of the friars that he had eaten meat in lent that he had said that st augustine's views on the eucharist were akin to those condemned by rome and generally that he was thought to be ill affected towards the holy see after incarceration for eighteen months he was sentenced to reclusion in a monastery for instruction by the monks whom he describes as good-natured enough but wholly ignorant on his liberation, Zhao offered to retain him, but he took the earliest opportunity to escape to England. A still more effective deadening of intellectual aspiration was the persecution of Damayao de Goez, the foremost scholar of Portugal in the 16th century. When a youth of 22, he had been sent to Flanders as secretary to the Portuguese factory. It was not until 1528 that his thirst for learning was awakened. He studied Latin, went to Padua, and speedily made himself known to scholars throughout Europe. In 1545, Joao recalled him to Portugal, where rivalry arose between him and Simon Rodriguez, the Jesuit provincial, who had met him in Padua and now accused him to the Inquisition for heretical utterances made there nine years before, the details of which he could not remember, but had a general impression that they were Lutheran. Nothing came of this, and, in 1550, Rodriguez repeated his accusation with the same result. Goez made enemies in his literary career and, in 1571, the denunciation of Rodriguez, made 26 years before, was resuscitated. He was now 70 years old, he had been an invalid for 20 years, and was scarce able to stand, but he was cast into a dungeon April 4, 1571, while his trial dragged on. No further evidence of any account could be found against him, but he freely confessed that, when he went to Flanders, he fell into the errors of considering indulgences of little value, and that general confession sufficed. That after learning Latin and studying, he had abandoned these errors and had since been strictly orthodox, at the request of Cardinal Sadoleto he had written to Melanchthon, in hopes of winning him over, and he had given a letter of introduction to Luther to Fry Roque de Almeida, whose object was to acquire a knowledge of the heresy so as to confute it. On this confession exclusively was based the sentence, which declared him to be a Lutheran heretic, but considering that it was when he was an ignorant youth of twenty-one and that, on learning Latin, he had abandoned his errors, he was mercifully condemned only to reconciliation, confiscation, and perpetual prison, the abjuration to be private in view of his quality and his reputation abroad. The monastery de Botalha was assigned as his prison, and the certificate of his delivery there is dated December 16, 1572. On the ninth, the Jues de Fisco had already received the certificate of confiscation. 
the perpetual prison of the portuguese inquisition must have been temporary like the spanish for goez is said to have died in his own house either by apoplexy or killed by his own servants at a date which is not known if forty years of orthodoxy could not atone for a youthful vacillation on one or two points of faith it can readily be estimated how potent an instrumentality was the holy office in stunting the development of portuguese intellect when in august fifteen seventy eight cardinal henrique succeeded to the crown of his grand-nephew sebastian he did not resign the inquisitor generalship for fifteen months he had previously however on february twenty fourth fifteen seventy eight on account of age and infirmity procured the appointment as coadjutor with the right of secession of manuel bishop of coimbra but the latter disappeared with his sovereign in the disastrous rout of alcazar quibir and it was not until December 27, 1579, that, at Henrique's request, Gregory XIII replaced him with Jorge de Almeida, Archbishop of Lisbon. Henrique's death soon followed, January 31, 1580, when he passed away, universally detested and only regretted because, in the rivalry of claimants to the throne and in the exhaustion of the land through famine and pestilence, the way was open to the easy conquest by Philippe II in the reorganization under the spanish crown the inquisition was not merged with that of castile but was left as an independent institution under the archbishop of lisbon for gregory the thirteenth refused the request of philippe the second for a brief adding it to the jurisdiction of the spanish inquisitor-general the nomination however accrued to the spanish crown and in fifteen eighty six on almeida's death the post was given to the cardinal archduke albrecht of austria who was also governor of portugal with his advent, the activity of the Inquisition increased. In the twenty years, 1581 to 1600, the three tribunals held in all fifty autos de fe. Of these, the records of five are lost, but in the other forty-five, there were 162 relaxations in person, 59 in effigy, and 2,979 penitents. As the penitents, for the most part, must have suffered confiscation, we can estimate the severity of the persecution in a population so limited. Large as must have been the receipts, from the beginning, derived from the confiscations of the wealthy new Christians, they were insufficient to satisfy its exigencies, diverted as they had been by the compositions paid to the crown. Sebastian, in continuing this practice, satisfied his conscience by representing to Gregory the Thirteenth that the income of the Inquisition did not exceed five thousand cruzados, which was insufficient for its support, wherefore the Pope granted to it two-thirds of the fruits of the first prebend falling vacant in each of the cathedrals of Lisbon, Evora, and Coimbra, and one-half of one in each of the other sees of the kingdom it is probable that this evoked a sturdy resistance on the part of the churches for it was never carried into effect and when philip the second became master of portugal although the confiscations were no longer compounded for he renewed the request stating that fourteen thousand cruzados a year were requisite while the revenues did not exceed ten thousand ducats gregory responded with a brief of june twenty eighth fifteen eighty three in which he renewed the grant at the same time reducing it to one half of a prebend in lisbon evora and coimbra and one third in the other seas nor is it likely that under the stern rule of philippe the grant was allowed to be nugatory end of section thirty two recording by robert sherman jr washington d c www.nyckidd.com Section 33 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Spheres of Action, Chapter 1, Jews, Part 5. It is not difficult to apprehend the impulses which led to a wholesale emigration to Spain of those who felt themselves aliens in the land of their birth. Under Spanish rule the condition of Portugal was deplorable, as described in 1595 by the Venetian envoy Francesco Vendramini. Lisbon, which had been a rich and populous city, was almost uninhabited. It formerly owned 700 ships, but 500 had been captured by the enemy, mostly by the English, and but 200 remained. 
All this was not, he says, displeasing to the king, who desired to keep them impoverished, because they were unwilling subjects. Thus the rewards of commercial enterprise were more promising in Spain, and the emigrant might hope that, in the absence of knowledge of his antecedents, the danger of persecution would be less. The immigration thus was large, and before long its effects began to show themselves in the records of the Spanish Inquisition. Convictions for Judaism, which had become comparatively few, increased rapidly and, where the nativity of the delinquents happens to be specified, the term Portuguese occurs with ominous frequency. In 1593, Toledo had seven Portuguese on trial, but, as there was but a single witness and they did not confess under torture, their cases were suspended. The next year, the same tribunal held an auto in which appeared five Portuguese in person and nine effigies were burnt of others, either fugitive or dead. In 1595, at Seville, there was an auto in which were punished 89 Judaizers, besides four burnt in effigy, and soon afterwards, in Quintanar del Rey, Cuenza, there were 30 discovered, of whom the obstinate ones were burnt and the rest were reconciled. The Portuguese new Christians, both at home and in Spain, were growing restive under increasing pressure. They were wealthy and could afford to pay for a respite in the shape of a general pardon for past offenses, including cases on trial. In 1602, negotiations were opened with Philippe III for a papal brief to that effect. Portuguese orthodoxy took the alarm, and the archbishops of Lisbon, Braga, and Evora hastened to Valladolid, where the court lay to present remonstrances. Spanish piety, to which such transactions were a novelty, was no less exercised, and direful predictions were made as to the evils that it would bring upon the land. Philippe and his favorite Lerma, however, were desperately in need of cash, and all scruples were overcome by the dazzling bribe of 1,800,600,000 ducats to the king, besides 50,000 cruzados to Lerma, 40,000 to Joao de Borja, and 30,000 to Pedro Alvarez Pereira, members of the Suprema Council, and 30,000 to its secretary, Fernão de Matos. The papal brief was issued August 23, 1604, but, at the last moment, the bargain came near being wrecked by the demand of the new Christians to have eight years in which to raise the sum. A threat, however, to suspend the execution of the brief sufficed to bring them to reason. It empowered the Portuguese inquisitor-general, the archbishop of Lisbon, and the papal collector, or any two of them or their deputies, to reconcile all Portuguese new Christians, wherever they might be settled, with the injunction only of spiritual penances. It included all who were on trial or who had been condemned provided their sentences had not been published. It released all confiscations that had not been covered into the fisc, and it gave to the Portuguese in Europe a year and to those outside of Europe two years in which to come forward and avail themselves of its provisions. The reconciliation thus obtained was not to entail relaxation in case of relapse, and all inquisitors were forbidden to interfere. The brief was received in Valladolid about October 1st, but was not published in Lisbon until January 16, 1605. A royal cedula, however, was obtained, prohibiting the publication or execution of any sentences until this brief should take effect, thus including in its benefits all Portuguese who were in the hands of the Spanish tribunals, as well as in those of Portugal. The effect of this was dramatically exhibited without delay. On October 20th, the Seville Tribunal announced a great auto de fe for November 7th. The stagings erected were on an unusually large scale. On the evening of the 6th took place the procession of the Green Cross, in which more than 500 familiars participated. The people flocked in from the country in numbers beyond the capacity of the city to accommodate them. At night, the confessors were introduced in the cells of those condemned to relaxation and, after completing all the preparations for the solemnity, the junior inquisitor, Fernando de Acevedo, sought his bed about eleven o'clock. Suddenly, a courier arrived, armed with an order to admit him to the inquisitors, wherever they might be, whether in their houses or their beds, in consulta de fe or on the staging at the auto. He had left Valladolid at midnight on the 3rd and, at breakneck speed, had made the distance to Seville in 72 hours, getting through the closed gates of the towns on the road and arriving in time to serve on the inquisitors a royal cedula forbidding the celebration of the auto. 
Some there were who held that a royal decree was not to be obeyed unless rubricated by the Suprema, but this was an opinion not as yet established, and, after a brief consultation, measures were hurriedly taken to suspend the celebration, to the blank astonishment of all Seville. Surmises were various. Some explained it by the recent treaty with England, under which English men in Spain were not to be troubled on account of heresy. Others attributed it to the planets. Others thought that among the condemned there was some one of lofty station and influence, whose friends had been able to save him, but the suggestion which found the widest acceptance was that it was due to the Portuguese new Christians, numerous and wealthy, who had offered large sums, estimated at 800,000 ducats, to stave it off, and this was supported by the fact that the midnight horsemen, before going to the Inquisition, had stopped at the house of Etor Otones, a wealthy Portuguese merchant, who had given him fifty ducats for his good news. Under this perdon general, the three tribunals in Portugal liberated 410 prisoners simultaneously on January 16, 1605, and there can be no doubt that the great body of Portuguese Judaizers in Spain obtained valid absolution for all past sins during the twelve month of its duration, although the Inquisition threw what obstacles it could in their way. In 1605, at Toledo, Antonio Fernandez Paredes, a Portuguese on trial with three witnesses against him, was obliged to insist on his right under the pardon, and to argue that his wife, Isabel Diaz, had been released at Coimbra in virtue of it, until the tribunal referred the matter to the Suprema, which ordered his discharge, although subsequently, during the same year, six other Portuguese were tried and sentenced without any reference being made to it. Still, the hands of the Inquisition were tied, and it lent its energies to detecting the Portuguese in new delinquencies. It sent out the brief to the tribunals, April 15th, and, on April 20th, 1606, it called their attention to the fact that the year had expired on January 16th, wherefore they were immediately to examine their records as to the Portuguese who had been discharged in virtue of the brief, and to proceed against all who had not taken advantage of it, as well as against those who had been guilty of heresy after its expiration. Notwithstanding this, there must have been for some years a marked interruption of persecution. A writer remarks in 1611 that in Seville the castle of Triana was used as a penitential prison, for there was no one on trial the Judaizers having all been pardoned, the Moriscos expelled, and the Protestants suppressed. This episode, however, could have no permanent influence, and its chief interest lies in its manifestation of the numbers and wealth of the new class of offenders coming forward to replace the expelled Moriscos in furnishing material for autos de fe and in stimulating activity with the prospect of fines and confiscations. After this, we hear little of the old Spanish conversos. Nearly all Judaizers are Portuguese, and all Portuguese are presumably Judaizers, suspects who existed only on sufferance. In 1625, at Salamanca, the corregidor, in his nightly round, entered a tavern to arrest a priest who had committed murder. He had words with a party of Portuguese, and forthwith arrested them all, charging them with being fugitives from the Portuguese Inquisition. He reported this to the Suprema, which communicated with the tribunal of Coimbra, and they were all sent to it for trial. When, in 1633, an effort was made to remove the disabilities under which the new Christians labored, the licenciate Juan Adán de la Parra, in an argument against it, urged as his principal reason the obstinacy of the Portuguese neophytes. Even the advocates of the measure admitted that it would be inapplicable to them, and Parra pointed out the impossibility of distinguishing between them and the Castilians. Some efforts were made to check this influx and to prevent transit through Spain to France and Holland, where the refugees were of material assistance to the national enemies. In 1567, during the minority of Dom Sebastian, the old laws were revived forbidding new Christians to leave the kingdom, or to seek the colonies, or to sell real estate without a special royal license. Sebastian subsequently repealed this, but it was renewed by Philippe II in 1587, and remained at least nominally in force, though difficult of execution. 
Partial relief was obtained in 1601, when they paid Philippe III 200,000 ducats for an irrevocable free permission to go to the colonies of both crowns and to sell landed property but, with the faithlessness customary in dealing with the prescribed race, this irrevocable permission was withdrawn in 1610 and, in 1611 and 1612, the Suprema forwarded to the Viceroy of Goa a royal provision ordering him to expel all of Jewish blood, to which he refused obedience, saying that all commerce was in their hands and the colonies would be ruined by their expulsion. Another decree of Philip III, April 16, 1619, called the attention of the Inquisitor General to the evils resulting from the multitudes of Portuguese passing, with their families and property, to France. All who could not show a license under the Portuguese crown to leave that kingdom were to be seized and their property sequestrated without further orders, in accordance with which the Suprema promptly issued the necessary instructions to its commissioners in the seaports and frontier towns. This doubtless led to increased restrictions in Portugal on emigration, and to it we may probably attribute an eloquent memorial, without date, from the Portuguese New Christians, asking for the removal of all limitations. Gentlemen of the noblest houses, they stated, had intermarried with them, both in Portugal and the colonies, and they had lavished their substance in the good work of founding churches, embellishing confrarias, endowing chapels, and liberal almsgiving. Free permission to enter Spain would work no harm to religion, for the Inquisition was everywhere, and the benefit arising from unrestricted intercourse was manifested in the revenues derived from the frontier towns, which were formerly farmed out for thirteen millions of maraveres, irregularly paid, and now were farmed for thirty-six million, attributable to the spices, perfumes, porcelains, stuffs, and other wares brought in by them. It was the same with the Spanish manufacturers exported through Biscay, the wools and cloths of Segovia, the silks and other goods. The only objection to free intercourse was that they might take advantage of it to seek other prohibited lands, and this was sufficiently answered elsewhere, in addition to the fact that Portugal had so many ports that emigration could not be prevented, as two hours sufficed to reach the sea and embark, while land travel was slow and expensive, and could be stopped at the frontier towns. The new Christians had greatly enriched the kingdom and the colonies by their labors. In Brazil, where they could hold real estate, nearly all the sugar plantations were in their hands, and these they were constantly increasing, to the great profit of the colony and of the revenue. As by law they were excluded from all offices and dignities, commerce was their only resource. Possibly these representations may have been convincing, for the prohibition was withdrawn, to be subsequently renewed as we shall see. If they desired to escape from Portugal, Portugal was quite as anxious to get rid of them, by extermination or otherwise. The pious intensity of hatred towards them finds expression in 1621 in a ferocious work by Vicente de Costa Matos, of which the declared object was to drive them from the land. All the old stories of their malice to Christians were raked together and set forth as uncontradicted truths. They were enemies of mankind, wandering like gypsies through the world and living on the sweat of others. They had possessed themselves of all trade, farming the lands of individuals and the royal patrimony, with no capital but industry and lack of conscience. They live only for the perdition of the world. Of old, God punished those who ill-treated them, but now he punishes those who endure them. The decline of the Spanish kingdoms was the punishment sent by God for tolerating them. They were all idolaters and sodomites, and wherever they went, they infected the land with their abominations, and were constantly seeking to convert Christians to their foul belief. Luther commenced by Judaizing. All heretics were either Jews or descendants of Judaizers, as was seen in England, Germany, and other parts where they flourished. Calvin called himself the father of Jews, like many other deniers of the Trinity, and Bousser, in his will, declared that Christ was not the Savior promised. Their perverse obstinacy was sufficiently proved by the numbers who were every day burnt, and the still greater numbers who escaped by penance after conviction. This crazy ebullition of ignorant hate accorded so well with the prejudices of the time that a second edition was called for in 1633. In 1629, it was translated into Castilian by Fray Diego Galvalan Vera, and this was reprinted in 1680. The hatred, indeed, was quenchless which was not satisfied with what the Inquisition was doing. 
In 1623, we chance to hear of the Tribunal of Evora arresting a hundred new Christians of the little town of Montemar al Novo. The autos de fe were frequently conducted on a scale unknown in contemporary Castile. The Tribunal of Coimbra held once, August 16, 1626, with 247 penitents and relaxados, another on May 16, 1629, with 218, and another on August 17, 1631, with 247. The statistics between 1620 and 1640 are not complete, for there were ten autos of which the details have not been preserved, but, even without these, the fearful aggregate is 230 relaxed in person, 161 in effigy, and 4,995 penanced and this is in addition to several hundred prisoners discharged under two pardons granted in 1627 and 1630, which no doubt were heavily paid for. Besides these pardons, an Edict of Grace was published in 1622, but, as we have seen, such mercies were burdened with intolerable conditions, and only sixteen persons came forward under it, twelve in Lisbon and four in Evora, and all these had already been testified against. In 1630, the royal confessor Sotomayor reported that, in interviewing the deputies of the new Christians, he found that they wanted no more edicts of grace. The last one, they said, had done them no good but much harm, as it brought infinite denunciations against them and filled the prisons. There is very likely exaggeration, but nothing more than exaggeration, in the assertion of Lois de Milo that, in this period, the activity of the Inquisition had virtually depopulated the cities of Coimbra, Oporto, Braga, Lamego, Braganza, Evora, Beja, and part of Lisbon, and the towns of Santarem, Tomar, Trancosa, Aveiro, Guimarães, Vinay, Villa Flor, Fondan, Montemar Ovelo, and Onovo and many other places, while the prisons of the three tribunals were always full and the autos so frequent that each tribunal celebrated one almost every year. One in Coimbra occupied two days, there being more than a hundred each day, and among them professors, canons, priests, curas, with cure of souls, vicars general, frailes, nuns, knights, including some of the military orders of kin with the highest of the land, and there was even a discalced Franciscan so pertinacious that he was burnt alive. Notwithstanding these superhuman exertions, the inquisitors complained that their labors were unavailing. Judaism was steadily increasing. The misfortunes of the land were attributable to the idolatry of this evil rabble, and they clamored for more drastic measures. The Supreme Council, January 17, 1619, addressed to Philippe III a consulta urging that prompt action was necessary in view of the contamination, and of the infinite sacrileges committed, to the scandal of the faithful. The king, it said, did not want vassals only, but good vassals, and it therefore suggested that, when a penitent was condemned to confiscation, he should also be banished. He would thus be stripped of everything, and would not take wealth to enrich the enemy as now was the case. It also said that a general visitation was on foot, which had already produced much result. Presumably there were many in Madrid who should be investigated, and the king was asked to order a visitation there. One member of the council, Mendo de la Mota, went even further, and wanted banishment for all required to abjure for vehement suspicion. Philippe responded to this with chilling indifference. If those who abjured for suspicion were banished, they would take their money with them. It was a doubtful measure, and he wished the council to consider it further. As regarded the Portuguese and Castile, if a list was furnished, with notes as to grounds for suspicion, he would have them investigated. The list was duly supplied, but the investigation was not made. The effort was resumed the next year. On April 30, 1620, the tribunals of Lisbon and Evora sent to Philippe relations of the autos held by them on the previous September 29th, so that he might see the large numbers punished on those occasions, and recognize the necessity of more active measures of repression. Among them were three canons of Coimbra, three frailes, and several lawyers. Six canons of Coimbra, all new Christians, had been arrested. They were all appointees of the Pope, and the king was prayed to ask him to close the door on all applicants for benefices of that race, also to order that none should be admitted to the church, either as seculars or regulars, and none to public office, which indicates how little the prohibitory laws were respected. End of section 33. 
Recording by Robert Sherman Jr., Washington, D.C., www.nyckidd.com. Section 34 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Spheres of Action, Chapter 1, Jews, Part 6. The youthful Philip IV was scarce more than seated on the throne when, in 1622, Fernando Mascarenhas, Bishop of Faro, urged him to provide some remedy for the political dangers apprehended from the new Christians. It was in evidence, he said, that they were all secretly Jews and the state was in great peril from them as they were very numerous. There was no city in which they were not powerful through their wealth and the important positions held by them, while the danger of detection and punishment might lead them to cause serious trouble through alliance with enemies. It was found that they secretly invested their capital in dealings with the Dutch, and in Dutch commercial companies, and, if they ventured their wealth with these rebels, they would conspire with them, especially as the Inquisition was pushing them hard, arresting them all, and they had no other remedy. Israel has rarely had a more flattering tribute to its intellectual superiority than the fears excited by this remnant surviving through nearly a century of pitiless persecution. Doubtless there were other urgent warnings which have not reached us, and, in 1628, Philippe called for a formal expression of opinion from his Portuguese prelates. By his order they assembled at Domar and summoned to their aid all who were most distinguished in the kingdom for learning and virtue. After prolonged debates, they submitted to him a series of suggestions to which he replied seriatim. In view of the failure of all previous efforts to abate the evils wrought and threatened by the new Christians, the remedy they preferred was the thorough expulsion of the whole race. If this were not practicable, at least those who were full-blooded Jews, excepting such as could prove their Christianity, should be banished and their property confiscated. As for those of half or quarter blood, all should go who had been, or who in future should be reconciled, or sentenced to abjure de vehementi, unless inquisitors were satisfied of their true repentance and conversion. To this Philippe replied, proposing delay in the case of the full-blooded conversos, and assenting to the exile of the reconciled and vehemently suspect. For the further relief of the kingdom, the bishops proposed that all who desired could, within a year, irrevocably expatriate themselves, selling their property and taking with them the proceeds, but not in jewels or the precious metals. To this, the royal answer was that already there was unrestricted liberty to go, but as evils had arisen from their return, in future it should be prohibited. The next suggestion was significant, to check the spread of Judaic infection. By intermarriage, which was destroying the luster of the nobility, no dower in such union should exceed two thousand cruzados, and the husband should be disabled from holding positions of honor and dignity. To the first clause the king assented. To the latter he said that the existing laws in favor of the nobility should be enforced. To prevent the constant profanation of the sacraments, it was proposed that papal briefs should be procured, prohibiting all entrance into the church of all who were new Christians, even in the tenth degree. To this the king promised to apply for such briefs, and meanwhile the bishops should refuse to install persons bearing dispensations and report to him, and also represent to the pope, the evils attendant on such preferment. The next suggestion was that the king should ratify and enforce the prohibition to hold secular offices and dignities, to which he replied that it should be strictly enforced. Finally, the bishops proposed that the new Christians should be wholly excluded from trade and commerce, or, if this was not possible, at least from that which concerned the royal revenues, but to this Philippe answered rather curtly that it was none of their business. Such were the views of Christian prelates, and even the partial concessions of the king seemed sufficient to threaten the new Christians with virtual extinction. But the whole portentous transaction served only to put on record the extremes to which bigotry could reach. As Lois de Mello suggestively says, after giving the documents in full, the orders issued by the king were not executed, and it would be superfluous to explain the cause of this to anyone acquainted with the methods of government of the period. 
Yet it had one result, for the new Christians, in fear of the threatened consequences, paid to King Philippe 80,000 ducats for the privilege of leaving Portugal and, under this, some 5,000 families emigrated to Castile, besides a countless number of individual stragglers, so that it would be a wonder to find any place in Spain not filled with Portuguese Jews. They felt themselves in perfect safety, for the Castilian tribunals refused to honor requisitions from those of Portugal. Efforts were also made to obtain modification of procedure, but in vain. By a cedula of December 20, 1633, Philippe expressed his approbation of the existing rules and refused all change. Moreover, he gave to Inquisitor General de Castro all the memorials, petitions, and arguments presented to him, thus furnishing to the Inquisition the names of those upon whom to wreak its vengeance. The question of transit to France came up again in 1632, when the Suprema notified Philippe that the commissioner at Pampeluna reported that troops of Portuguese families were passing into France, many of them people of wealth, with litters and coaches, and the Inquisition did not interfere with them, as the last instructions were that they should not be impeded. The result of this representation was that the orders of 1619 were repeated. Not content with retaining those who wished to expatriate themselves, when the Admiral of Castile, in 1636, captured St. Jean de Luz, and there were hopes of conquering Guienne, which was ripe for revolt, the Inquisition took steps to seize the refugees who might have settled there, though it had no evidence that they were Judaizers. It assumed that they were apostates, and as such not included in the promises held out to the inhabitants at large, and that anyhow the cause of the faith was privileged. The king was therefore asked to order the admiral to send to the border all whom its agents might designate, so that they could be seized without attracting attention. It is possible that some victims may thus have been procured during the brief time in which the Spaniards held their advantage. The refugees, however, mainly bent their steps to Holland, where they enjoyed free toleration and could work for their advancement and the detriment of their oppressors. This was the leading cause of the effort to prevent emigration, and it was a matter of much concern. Lois de Mello says that there had passed to Holland more than 2,000 families and, in those rebel states, they had purchased the right to establish synagogues. Those who publicly Judaized there were the same as those who, quitting Portugal as San Benitados, published that their confession of Judaism was under coercion of the Inquisition. Many who had lived in misery in Portugal were rich in Holland. They paid contributions to those rebel states and assisted to maintain their fleets and armies. They invested largely in the East India Company and thus were absorbing a great part of Spanish commerce and, under feigned names and in vessels of the United Provinces, they did a large trade in contraband goods. In short, their commercial aptitudes were impoverishing Spain and enriching her enemies. The writer unconsciously points out how large a part intolerance played in the decadence of the state. Nor was this the only mischief wrought by their hostility to the land that had driven them forth. In 1634, the Capitan Esteban de Aras Fonseca, in a memorial to the Suprema, represents the refugees in Holland as aiding actively the enemies of Spain, and as holding constant correspondence with spies residing there in the guise of merchants. The Dutch West India Company, he says, was controlled by Jews, who were large stakeholders, and its chief profits were derived from piracy in the colonies, especially those of Portugal on the Brazilian coast, where the new Christians were numerous and were in correspondence with the enemy. It was two Jews, Nuno Alvarez Franco and Manuel Fernandez Drago, residents of Bahia, who planned and executed the capture of that place by the Dutch in 1625. Franco, he adds, now lives in Lisbon as a spy, under orders from Holland, and his brother, Jacob Franco, carries intelligence back and forth disguised as a Fleming of Antwerp. Drago is still in Bahia. He is a great rabbi and teacher of the Jews, and moreover is a spy who last year sent word to the Dutch to return there. The capture of Pernambuco was the work of the Jews of Amsterdam, chief among whom was Antonio Vallez Henriquez, known as Cohen, who had lived there, who arranged the plans and accompanied the expedition. He is now residing in Seville as a merchant, but is nothing but a spy. Last year he went to Amsterdam with a plan for the capture of Havana, where he has a correspondent named Manuel de Torres. At present, a large fleet of 18 sail is fitting out for the relief of Pernambuco, under command of David Paisotto, a Jew, who proposes to call at Buarcos and penetrate to Coimbra, where the Inquisition is to be burnt and the prisoners are to be liberated. 
It was a Jew of Amsterdam, named Francisco de Campos, who took the island of Fernando de Dononha. It could readily be recaptured, as it has a garrison of only 34 men with four cannon. In San Sebastian there is a Jew named Abraham Gurr, who calls himself Juan Guiez, under Dutch pay. He works much mischief to Spain and keeps a man named Rafael Mendez, who is constantly traveling back and forth. We need not accept all this as literally true, but it had an undoubted substratum of fact. In 1640, the tribunals of Lima and Cartagena de las Indias reported that in recent autos de fe, it had been discovered that many Judaizing Portuguese in the colonies had correspondence with the synagogues in Holland and the Levant, assisting the Dutch and the Turks with information and money. To verify this, orders were given to open, on a certain day, all letters addressed to Portuguese throughout Spain. The information was found to be true. A cipher was discovered, used in correspondence with the synagogues of Holland, and further, that a million and a half of money had been pledged from Spain. The matter was appropriately referred for investigation to the Inquisitor General and two Inquisitors. What was the result we have no means of knowing, but we may be reasonably sure that the rumors which attributed to the new Christians of Portugal a share in the rebellion of 1640 were not wholly without foundation. They certainly benefited at first by the change of masters. It is true that Joao IV conciliated the Inquisition by intervening in its favor in a quarrel which it had, in 1643, with the Jesuits of Evora, and by attending, with his family and court, two autos de fe held in Lisbon April 6, 1642, and June 25, 1645, in one of which there were six relaxations in person and four in effigy, with seventy-five penitents, and in the other eleven relaxations in person and two in effigy, with sixty-one penitents. But this we may assume to have been a matter of policy rather than of conviction, for his tendencies were towards liberality. He is even said to have contemplated granting freedom of conscience and liberty of residence to Jews, but to have been forced to abandon the purpose by the stubborn resistance of the Inquisitor-General Francisco de Castro, Bishop of Guarda. But this is probably a Spanish exaggeration of an intention to modify the rigor of inquisitorial procedure, which he was obliged to forego through the impossibility of obtaining the requisite papal confirmation. Spanish influence in Italy sufficed to prevent the Holy See from recognizing or holding relations with the House of Braganza, until, by the Treaty of Lisbon in 1668, Spain abandoned her futile efforts at reconquest, a position which resulted in the vacancy of the Portuguese sees, as the bishops dropped off, until there was but one left, Francisco de Sotomayor, a Dominican who chanced to be Bishop of Targa in Partibus, and who was made Bishop of Lamego in 1659. This impossibility of negotiating with Rome rendered necessary an indirect method of accomplishing his desire to abolish confiscation, which he recognized as a serious impediment to commercial credit and prosperity, especially through the sequestration of property at arrest. As it was provided by the canons, it could only be abrogated by a papal rescript, and to evade this difficulty, in his decree of February 6, 1649, he disclaimed all intention of interfering with the functions of the Holy Office, which should continue to include confiscation in its sentences, but, after this declaration, he made to the culprits a free gift of their forfeited property, which they could dispose of at will, provided it was in favor of Catholics, and he also abolished sequestration at arrest. But this was not only a free gift, but a binding contract, under which the merchants engaged to form a trading company to enrich the country with colonial commerce and to provide, at its own expense, 36 warships to serve as convoys for the merchantmen, all of which was impossible so long as the capital of the company was liable to be imperiled by sequestration and confiscation imposed on the shareholders. The Inquisitor General was ordered to have this decree filed in the secreto of the tribunals, and to enforce its observance, while Joao obligated himself never to revoke it. The Inquisition subsequently boasted that it had excommunicated all who advised the king to this measure, and it actually succeeded in obtaining from Innocent X a brief of October 25, 1650, thanking God for what it had done and urging it to persevere. Notwithstanding this, the Campania de Bolsa was organized and, through its means, Pernambuco was recovered from the Dutch. There was flattering prospect of restoring Portuguese commerce, but, when João IV died in 1656, leaving the kingdom of the regency of his widow Lucia de Guzman, during the minority of Alfonso VI, the Inquisition not only resumed confiscation, but proceeded to collect the arrears since 1649. 
Altogether, Padre Vieira tells us about 1680 they had gathered in up to that time some 25 millions, of which not more than half a million cruzados reached the royal treasury. When Bishop de Castro died in 1653, the attitude of the Holy See towards Portugal precluded the appointment of a successor, and the general council acted from that date until 1672. When D. Pedro de Lancastra, Archbishop of Seed, in Partibus, was appointed, the lack of a head seems rather to have stimulated than to have repressed its energies, and one can scarce comprehend how, after a century of such earnest work, so small a territory can have furnished so unfailing a supply of victims. Autos were held in each tribunal nearly every year, with so copious a number of culprits that occasionally they occupied two days, and one at Coimbra in February 1677 required three days to dispatch its nine personal relaxations and its 264 penitents. Peace or war seems to have made no difference. Evora celebrated an auto, June 23, 1663, with 142 penitents, although Don John of Austria, with a hostile Spanish army, was occupying the city. The explanation of this exhaustless reservoir of material for autos is to be found in the strictness with which the infection of blood was reckoned, without limit of generations. All who had the slightest admixture were reckoned as new Christians and were held to be Jews at heart intermarriages had been frequent and so a large a portion of the population was thus contaminated that foreigners generally regarded the portuguese as all jews thus the field of operation of the inquisition was almost unlimited and every one whom it penanced became a source of stronger infection the death of joao the fourth removed what little restraint he may have ventured to exercise and in sixteen sixty two the oppressed population comprising so large a portion of the wealth and intelligence of the kingdom made an attempt to purchase alleviation of suffering a new christian named duarte who had been penanced in the name of his fellows made a liberal offer of money and troops for the defense of the land in return for a general pardon the publication of witnesses' names, and permission to found a synagogue in which professing Jews might worship. Considering that in Rome there was a synagogue, there is some inconsistency in the energetic brief of Alexander the Seventh, February 17, 1663, denouncing the project and urging the Inquisition to resist it to the utmost. Of course, the attempt was abortive. Then, in 1671, the new Christians were suddenly threatened with a catastrophe. In the church of Oraveas, a pix with a consecrated host was stolen. We have seen with what equanimity the Roman Inquisition regarded this offense, but in Portugal the whole kingdom was thrown into consternation. The regent Pedro and the court put on mourning. An edict ordered that for some days no one should leave his house, so that everybody might be compelled to give an account of himself on the fatal night. All efforts to identify the sacrilegious thief proving fruitless, it was assumed that the new Christians must be guilty, and the regents signed an edict banishing them all from Portugal, a measure opposed by the Inquisition, doubtless because its occupation would be gone. Before the expulsion could be enforced, however, it happened that a young thief near Coimbra, named Antonio Ferreira, was arrested, and in his possession was found the pix with its contents. The most searching investigation failed to discover in him a trace of Jewish blood. He was duly burnt, and the new Christians were saved. End of section 34. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C., www.nyckidd.com. Section 35 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Spheres of Action, Chapter 1, Jews, Part 7. After this narrow escape, there came a gleam of promise. Few members of the Society of Jesus at that time were more distinguished than Antonio Vieira, who had earned the name of the Apostle of Brazil. He had long regarded the new Christians with compassion, and had urged Joao IV not to only abolish confiscation, but to remove the distinctions between them and the old Christians. He had made enemies, and the Inquisition readily undertook his punishment. 
His writings in favor of the oppressed were condemned as rash, scandalous, erroneous, savoring of heresy, and well adapted to pervert the ignorant. After three years of incarceration, he was penanced in the audience chamber of Coimbra, December 23, 1667, and his sympathy for the victims of the Holy Office was sharpened by his experience of its unwholesome prisons, where he tells us that five unfortunates were not uncommonly herded in a cell nine feet by eleven, where the only light came from a narrow opening near the ceiling, where the vessels were changed only once a week, and all spiritual consolation was denied. Then, in the safe refuge of Rome, he raised his voice for the relief of the oppressed, in numerous writings in which he characterized the holy office of Portugal as a tribunal which served only to deprive men of their fortunes, their honor, and their lives, while unable to discriminate between guilt and innocence. It was known to be holy only in name, while its works were cruelty and injustice, unworthy of rational beings, although it was always proclaiming its superior piety. The Society of Jesus could scarce fail to resent the affront put upon one of its most distinguished members. It was still a power in Portugal, and it made its influence felt. The new Christians took heart and, in 1673, they made an organized effort to gain relief. They asked to have the procedure of the Inquisition modified to that of Rome and, in order that the new system might have a fair start, that a general pardon be granted to those under trial. The extent of the considerations offered for these very moderate concessions shows how desperate was the condition of the sufferers, for they proposed to place within a year 4,000 troops in India, and then yearly to send 1,200 men, or 1,500 in case of war, besides an annual payment of 20,000 cruzados and various other considerable contributions, including some important matters which there were reasons for keeping secret. Against this proposal, the Inquisition protested in two elaborate remonstrances, revealing the temper in which it habitually exercised its powers. It could find no words too strong to describe the wickedness of the new Christians, whose invincible adherence to their errors showed that punishment and not pardon was the only means to be employed. In place of mitigating the laws, they should be sharpened, as heresy was steadily increasing, and to ask for the Roman procedure was scandalous, and in itself worthy of punishment. The regent was told that he had no power to overthrow the laws and he was threatened, on the one hand, with an uprising of the people, and on the other with an appeal to the pope. In fine, the proposed reform would bring desolation on the land and result in Portugal becoming a Judea. On the other side, the arrangement was warmly supported by many ecclesiastics, to which Jesuit influence doubtless contributed. Not only did the Archbishop of Lisbon favor it, but also thirty masters and doctors of theology, the professors of the University of Coimbra, seven ministers of the Inquisition, and many men of high position among both the regular and the secular clergy. The regent and his council gave it their approval, and the matter was referred to the Pope for his decision. The debate was thus transferred to Rome, where, in 1674, both sides submitted their arguments to the commission of cardinals formed for the purpose. The advocates of the new Christians presented a scathing indictment of the Inquisition, doubtless one-sided and exaggerating, and yet affording an insight into the abuses inevitable when secret and irresponsible power fell into unworthy hands. The great mass of victims, they asserted, was fervent and loyal Christians, who either were burnt for denying Judaism or obtained reconciliation by falsely confessing. A case occurring only the year previous, 1673, at Evora, was that of two nuns, burnt as negativas. One of them had lived for forty years in her nunnery, with unblemished reputation and filling all the official positions in turn. The confessors who heard her before the auto were overcome by the fervent piety which she manifested and, when the procession was formed, she recognized among the penitents her own sister and nieces, who had saved their lives by denouncing her. She pardoned them and made a most exemplary end, invoking Christ with her last breath as the garret was applied. Indeed, it was the evidence of many confessors that the greater part of those to whom they ministered at the autos were true and fervent Christians, and this was confirmed by the University of Evora, by Padre Manuel Diaz, S.J., confessor of the crown prince and numerous ecclesiastics of high standing. The trade of false witness was a thriving one, both for gain and the gratification of enmity. 
there were regular associations of perjurers who made a living by levying blackmail on rich new christians accusing those who refused their demands so that the unfortunate class lived in perpetual terror and purchased temporary safety by compliance the matter was reduced to a fine art the accusing witness would give a fictitious name and address so that the accused could never recognize and disable him sometimes indeed when additional evidence was necessary a witness would change his name and garments and give the required corroborative testimony as an illustration of the arbitrary abuse of power allusion was made to a notorious case occurring at evora in 1643 according to custom a student of the jesuit college was appointed to superintend the market the servant of an inquisitor desired to buy a load of honey in order to retail it at an advance but the student interposed because it had already been purchased for the use of the college and would only let the servant have enough to supply his master's table for this he was imprisoned tried required to abjure and penanced as unsound in the faith when the sentence was read in the presence of a number of ecclesiastics the professor of theology a jesuit of high standing appealed to the holy see to which one of the inquisitors replied that from that holy tribunal the only appeal was to the holy trinity and the unlucky appellant was gowled and severely handled jesuits were not accustomed to such treatment the matter was laid before urban the eighth who summoned the inquisitors to appear before him but in the confusion of the war with spain the affair blew over the statements as to confiscation explain the tenacity of the inquisition in maintaining its position the crown supported the inquisition and was entitled to the results of its industry but obtained little the sequestrations were in the hands of the tribunals during the trials which were protracted for five ten or twelve years to the intense distress of the prisoners during this time the management of the property was irresponsible no accounts were rendered and of the immense sums received only occasional trifling payments were made to the state the inquisitor-general had authority to make donations to the inquisitors and this was liberally exercised in granting them sums of six or eight or even fourteen thousand crowns at a time commerce was most disastrously affected for when a merchant with foreign correspondence was arrested and his property was sequestrated his foreign consigners or creditors clamored in vain for the goods or debts belonging to them and as this was a fate overhanging every man portuguese trade suffered accordingly in short while we may not accept literally the assertion that the inquisition brought irreparable ruin upon portugal we cannot but regard it as one of the largely contributing factors to the rapid decadence of the kingdom the contest in rome was stubborn but the new christians gradually gained the advantage and on october third sixteen seventy four clement the tenth as a preliminary issued a brief reciting their complaints in view of which he evoked to himself all pending cases and committed them to the roman inquisition inhibiting further action in portugal under pain of deprivation of office and other penalties for all officials including the inquisitor-general coimbra treated this as a general pardon and on november eighteenth discharged all those under trial but the other tribunals seemed to have detained their prisoners it was probably with the object of releasing them that in sixteen seventy six innocent the eleventh instructed his nuncio to permit the inquisitors to finish the trials but not to inflict sentences of relaxation confiscation or perpetual galleys if this was the object it was unsuccessful the inquisition was sullen and celebrated no auto de fe between the years sixteen seventy four and sixteen eighty two save three private ones in the lisbon audience chamber in each of which there was but a single penitent the inquisitorial agents in rome denied the assertions as to the arbitrary injustice of procedure and the coercion of good christians to confess judaism by the terrible alternative of relaxation as negativos in the conflict of statement it was proposed that the truth could be ascertained by the examination of the records and innocent consequently ordered the transmission to rome of the papers in some specimen cases of convicted negativos the inquisitor-general verissimo de lancastra archbishop of braga refused obedience on the ground that it would reveal the secrets of procedure the pope naturally pronounced the reason to be frivolous and treated this imitation of arce y Reynoso's course in the villanueva affair with greater decision than his predecessor 
After meeting repeated refusals, he peremptorily ordered, by a brief of December 24, 1678, that, within ten days after notice, four or five of the prescribed cases should be delivered to the nuncio Marcelo, under pain of ipso facto suspension of the inquisitor general and all his subordinates. If they continued to act, the inquisitor general was interdicted from entering a church, and the others incurred excommunication removable only by the Holy See, while, during suspension, the episcopal ordinaries were restored to their jurisdiction with full powers. Even this did not break down inquisitorial contumacy, and on May 27, 1679, another brief formally suspended them, while letters of the same date to the nuncio instructed him to prosecute them and report the result. This decisive action at length brought the partial submission that the two processes were sent to the Portuguese ambassador to be delivered to the Pope, but evidently this was deemed insufficient, for the suspension was not removed until 1681, when a brief of August 22nd gave as a reason that the Episcopal ordinaries, owing to various impediments, had not been able to exercise jurisdiction and the prisoners were suffering through the delay. The raising of the suspension, however, was conditioned on the future observance of numerous modifications of procedure, under threat of reincidence of the penalties previously prescribed. The new Christians had especially asked for a change in the rule respecting negativos, but this, as we have seen, was unfortunately an essential part of the system and their desire was ungratified. The changes granted were of minor importance and are interesting only as evidence of some specially iniquitous practices against which they were directed, and better treatment of prisoners was enjoined. Whether these modifications were observed and mitigated the rigor of procedure, whether the Inquisition was humbled and weakened by its defeat in the struggle with the papacy, or whether the material for its autos was becoming exhausted, it would be impossible now to determine, but there is no question that, after its resumption in 1681, the number of its victims diminished notably. The renewal of operations was celebrated by autos de fe held in the early months of 1682, with processions and illuminations and other demonstrations of rejoicing, but, in the nineteen years including 1682 and 1700, there were but fifty-nine relaxed in person, sixty-one in effigy, and thirteen hundred and fifty-one penanced, an aggregate deplorable in itself, yet encouraging in comparison with its predecessors. End of section 35 Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C., www.nyckidd.com. Section 36 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Spheres of Action, Chapter 1, Jews, Part 8. From this sketch of the Portuguese Inquisition, we can readily estimate its efficiency in keeping the Spanish institution supplied with material as the native stock grew Christianized. Not the least unfortunate effect of this was its influence in maintaining the prejudice that might otherwise have subsided, and that consequently became one of race as much as of religion. The venom which we have seen in the work of de Costa Matos was, if possible, exceeded in the Sentinella contra Judios of Padre Fray Francisco de Torrejoncillos, published as late as 1673 and reprinted in 1728 and 1731. In this popular exposition of Christian rancor, no story is too wild and unnatural to be unworthy of credence, if it illustrates the innate and ineradicable depravity of the Jew and his quenchless desire to work evil to the Christian. The fables of the Fortalicium Fidei are repeated as incontestable truths, and new ones are invented to prove that the virus is as active as ever. It makes no difference if the Jew is baptized, for this does not change his nature and his faith, and he remains the same implacable enemy. The same temper is manifested in a memorial, drawn up about this time by an inquisitor, in answer to a proposition for moderating the harshness of inquisitorial procedure. The writer was evidently a man of learning and culture, but his paper is a bitter tirade against the Jews, insisting upon their diabolical nature and asserting them to be much worse now than when they crucified Christ. 
the evil is in their blood forcing them to hate and rage against christ the virgin and all who profess the christian faith popular beliefs that they had tails and that they were distinguishable by a peculiar odor which they exhaled and that as physicians they killed one out of five of their christian patients were persistent outgrowths of the hatred thus inculcated even to call a man a jew was an offence justiciable by the inquisition for when in sixteen forty six padre boyle a royal preacher in a sermon stigmatized as a jew fray enriquez of his own mercenarian order the tribunal of toledo promptly sent for him and after detaining him for six months sentenced him to two years exile from the court during which he was forbidden to preach when about sixteen thirty two the new christians made an effort to procure a removal of their disabilities juan edan de la parra who though an inquisitor was a poet and a man of culture opposed it in an elaborate essay cautiously couched in latin for the matter was too delicate for popular discussion he did not pander to vulgar prejudice but addressed himself to arguments of state policy which are a curious illustration of what on such a subject an intelligent man regarded as conclusive he deplores the decline of population of agriculture of shipping and of the mechanic arts which he attributes to the insidious practices of the jews their avoidance of manual labor and their addiction to usury look at portugal he says where this traitorous race stimulated the ardor of foreign conquest until it embraced the east and the west indies and then cunningly corrupted the native virtue with the wealth and luxury thus acquired until they have succeeded in eliminating the heroes and destroying the heroic spirit which rendered portugal so formidable it is this craving for oriental luxuries shrewdly stimulated by the new christians which is undermining the robustness of spanish virtue the useful is neglected for the superfluous and thus agriculture declines he scarcely seems to recognize the tribute which he pays to the superior endowment of the jew which he winds up by foretelling that if the restrictions and disabilities imposed on the new christians are removed they will acquire such power that they will reduce the old christians to subjection there was some foundation for the fear that the barriers between the races would be removed in the exhaustion of spanish finance olivares in sixteen thirty four opened negotiations with the jews of africa and the levant and royal licenses were granted for the admission of individuals in sixteen forty one relations were resumed they sent representatives whom he received and kept with him for a considerable time silencing the remonstrances of the suprema with the assertion that they were there on the service of the king it was proposed that they should be allowed to reside in the suburbs of madrid in a separate quarter with a synagogue as in rome he won over some members of the royal council and some theologians but the inquisition was inexorable and cardinal monti the nuncio told the king in public audience that olivares must be dismissed if the harvest of the lord was to be cleansed of tares and the risk be averted of ruining the faith of spain incidentally olivares interfered with the inquisition by demanding the papers in certain cases inquisitor-general sotemayor refused but finding himself powerless to resist placed the documents at the foot of a crucifix whence they were carried to olivares who burnt them and released a number of prisoners it is even said that he contemplated abolishing the inquisition but philip the fourth was too profoundly convinced of its necessity to both church and state to entertain the project and there may well be truth in the assertion that his quarrel with the holy office was contributory to his downfall this put an end to all negotiations and in sixteen forty three we find the suprema instructing the valencia tribunal to forbid the landing of the jews who were coming from oran some stir was caused in sixteen forty five by two jews salman zaportas and bale zaportas who presented themselves in valencia with a royal license dated in sixteen thirty four and one from the marquis of viana governor of oran they applied to the tribunal for permission to attend to their business in the city and to wear christian garments so as not to be mobbed the tribunal was puzzled and ordered them not to leave the city under pain of two hundred pesos while it consulted the suprema the latter represented to the king the danger impending on the faith from this disregard of his orders by ministers who issued licenses to which he responded with instructions to send them back to iran the causes leading to the cedula of sixteen thirty four no longer existed if in future their coming was considered necessary the governor of oran must report and await the royal decision and a special license there is no reason to suppose that the venturesome israelites had anything more important in view than private business 
One of the most prominent reasons urged for the establishment and perpetuation of the Inquisition was the zeal of the crypto-Jews in proselyting and the danger to which the purity of religion was thus exposed, an argument which served its purpose, however discrediting to the firmness of Spanish faith. Cases, however, were never cited in proof, nor could they be, for Judaism is a matter of race as much as of dogma. The Jews have never sought to convert the Gentiles and, in Spain of all lands, it was clearly preposterous that men, who could only exist by concealing their belief, would incur the certainty of detection and of pitiless punishment by the unpardonable offense of seeking the apostasy of their Christian neighbors. What conversions there were were spontaneous, and these served to intensify the horror of Judaism and to keep alive the sense of danger arising from the presence of those suspected of cherishing the ancient faith. Fray Diago de Asunção, burnt in Lisbon in 1603, as a convert to the law of Moses, is said to have been led to this fatal step by witnessing the constancy in martyrdom of those who suffered for their belief. A more remarkable case was that of Lope de Vera, which aroused universal interest throughout Spain and pointed the moral that the safety of religion lay in the ignorance of the faithful, thus justifying the prescience of Valdez, when he placed on the first Spanish index a translation of Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews. Lope de Vera was the son of a gentleman of San Clemente, of gentle blood and limpieza. At the age of nineteen, he was a student at Salamanca, so deeply learned in Hebrew and Arabic that, in July 1638, he competed for a chair of Hebrew. His studies led him to embrace Judaism, and, with the zeal of a convert, he sought to win over a fellow student, who denounced him to the Inquisition. There was a second witness, and yet the consulta de fe of Valladolid was not unanimous in voting his arrest. It had to be ordered by the Suprema, and was executed June 24, 1639. He freely admitted the truth of the accusation and much more, but denied intention, assuming that what he had said was for the sake of argument, and asserting that he went to confession and communion and carried a rosary. There was variation and equivocation in his successive audiences. There was delay and doubt on the part of the Inquisition, and the trial dragged on. On April 16th and May 23rd, 1641, he revoked all that he had confessed, and then suddenly, on May 29th, he announced that he wished to be a Jew and to hold all that the Jews believed, for this was the truth revealed to them by God, which he would defend with his life. Hitherto he had believed what the Church taught, but now he adhered to the law given by God to Israel. The religion of Rome and all other religions were false. He had never practiced the Jewish observances, but would do so in the future. No one had taught him this, but God, in his mercy, had brought him to the truth. Learned men were called in to wean him from his errors, but they declared his pertinency to be terrible and that, with his knowledge of Hebrew, he would be most dangerous. He refused to have an advocate or to make defense, persisting that he was a Jew and would die for the law of Moses. On August 8th, the Alcade reported that he had circumcised himself with a bone, and the physician sent to examine him verified this, and reported that he said he hoped to be burnt alive, for he sought the honor of martyrdom and would go to paradise. Earnest and protracted efforts were made to reclaim him, but in vain. Then he was asked to set forth the Hebrew texts on which he relied, so that the calificadores could confute them. To enable him to do this, he was furnished, December 23rd, with a Bible, paper, ink, and a goose quill, but the latter he rejected, saying that it was forbidden by the law of Moses, and a bronze pen, Pluma de Bronce, was given to him. Further conferences followed, and much patience was manifested, until he refused absolutely to speak in the audiences. The baffled tribunal appealed to the Suprema, which ordered fifty lashes. He endured them unflinchingly on June 17, 1642, and maintained his unbroken silence. This was not obstructive, for his ratification of his confessions was necessary, but, when they and the evidence were read to him, he closed his ears with his fingers and refused even to listen. It was proposed to torture him, but the Suprema humanely discarded formalities and ordered the case to be closed and voted upon. The vote was taken January 27, 1643, to relax him with confiscation, but in confirming it the Suprema ordered further efforts for his conversion. There was no haste in executing the sentence. In January 1644, he was still persisting in silence, except that, when the inquisitors made their weekly visits, he would cry, Viva la ley de moisson, after which not another word could be extracted from him. 
At length, on June 25, 1644, he was burnt alive, maintaining to the end his unalterable constancy. The inquisitor Moscoso, in a letter to the Countess of Monterey, declared that he had never witnessed so ardent a desire for death, such perfect assurance of salvation, or such unconquerable firmness. His fate made a profound impression on his co-religionists. Some years later, Juan Pereira, a youth on trial before the Valladolid Tribunal, referred to him repeatedly and declared that he had seen him after death, riding on a mule and glistening with the sweat that was on him when he was taken to the Quemadero. Lope de Vera was a most undesirable convert, for his case could not fail to arouse afresh the dread of infection and to stimulate the Inquisition to increased activity. Yet such stimulus was scarce needed, for it was incessantly vigilant and was troubled with few scruples when on the track of a suspect. An illustrative case offers itself when, in September 1642, the Tribunal of Galicia wrote to Valladolid that a prisoner on trial testified that Antonio Lopez, in Manzaneda de Tribes, had practiced Judaism, and it asked for his arrest. And Antonio Lopez was readily found in Valladolid and was promptly thrown in prison September 16th. He denied the accusation. No other testimony could be found against him, and his trial dragged on until, February 3, 1644, there was a vote in Discordia. The case went to the Suprema, which ordered further inquiry to be made of the Galician Tribunal, when it was discovered that the prisoner had never been in Manzaneda. This should have been conclusive, but, when another vote was reached, August 13th, it was again in Discordia, and the Suprema again ordered investigations which proved fruitless. A third inconclusive vote was taken in 1645, and then the Suprema ordered the arrest of a second Antonio Lopez, a painter, who had been discovered in Sanabria. He was arrested in December 1645, and easily proved himself to be an old Christian of strict observance, but to no purpose, for the blundering consulta de fe voted in discordia April 30th, 1646, and the Suprema ordered him to be exposed to threatened torture he was stripped and bound on the trestle but his nerves did not give way and he steadily asserted his orthodoxy the resources of the baffled tribunal were now exhausted and on july fourteenth the suprema ordered the cases to be suspended when the two antonio lopez were released not acquitted after one had been in prison nearly four years and the other had been subjected to the agony of impending torture merely because they bore a name which chanced to be mentioned in a distant tribunal as that of a judaizer not quite so hard was the case of gaspar rodriguez arrested by the tribunal of valladolid october fourth sixteen forty eight on the strength of advices from cruenza and discharged october second sixteen forty nine because it was tardily recognized that he did not correspond with the description of the real culprit how slender was the evidence required when a portuguese was concerned is seen in another case at valladolid when the inquisitor pedro munoz made a visitation of oviedo in sixteen nineteen to sixteen twenty two women testified that lucia nunez a portuguese settled in benevente put on clean chemises on saturdays when march fifth sixteen twenty the tribunal voted on the cases brought in by munoz this was suspended but the suprema ordered the papers to be sent to it and on august seventeenth sixteen twenty one it instructed the tribunal to arrest lucia and sequestrate her property she was accordingly brought to Valladolid, October 30th, 1621, and thrown into the secret prison. On her first audience, in reply to the ordinary question whether she knew the cause of her arrest, she said that it was because she changed her linen on Fridays and Saturdays, as she did every day, for the sake of cleanliness, especially when she was suckling her children, and she did not know that she was committing any offense. It was true that she was born in Portugal, but both her parents were Castilians and Old Christians. The trial went through its regular course. Nothing else could be found against her, and, on March 15, 1622, the consulta de fe voted to acquit her and lift the sequestration, which was done accordingly the next day, after nearly five months of incarceration. When this kind of work was on foot throughout Spain, it is easy to realize how the unfortunate Portuguese were tracked, from one refuge to another, by the implacable vigilance of the Inquisition, with its network of tribunals, in constant correspondence, and its commissioners and familiars everywhere on the watch. That vigilance was kept alive by the frequent discovery of communities of Judaizers, more or less numerous, whose trials revealed the names of abundant accomplices. 
the tribunal of Llerena was busy from 1635 to 1638 with the Complicidad de Badajoz, a group of Portuguese whom it had unearthed at Badajoz and, when the Suprema called for a list of those inculpated by the prisoners whom it had not been able to arrest, they amounted to a hundred and fifty. In 1647, Juan del Cerro of Ciudad Rodrigo was a prisoner in the royal jail of Valladolid, Apparently hoping for release, he denounced himself to the Inquisition and told a story of a congregation of Jews at Ciudad Rodrigo, which met every Friday in the house of the president, Pablo de Herrera, paymaster of the army on the Portuguese frontier, when the ceremony of scourging images of Christ and the Virgin was performed and then, during Holy Week, they were burnt. Numerous arrests were made and the trials dragged on until 1651. Torture was employed, parents and children, brothers and sisters testified against each other, but there were no pertinacious impenitents or negativos and none were relaxed. That Juan del Cerro's story of the outrages on the sacred images was recognized as fictitious is evident from the suspension of ten of the cases. Juan del Cerro made nothing by his device, for, though he was not prosecuted for false witness, when the trials were over in 1651, he was handed back to the royal court. Toledo was equally active, for, in an auto held the same year, it had 32 Judaizers in person and 30 effigies of fugitives. Nearly the whole of these were Portuguese, for, by this time, Castilian Judaizers were of comparatively rare occurrence. In the great Seville auto of 1660, out of 81 Judaizers, nearly all Portuguese, a group of 37 were from Osuna and another of eight from Utrera. There were 47 reconciled, 7 relaxed in person, and 27 in effigy. The numerous effigies which figure in the autos indicate those who were compromised in the confessions of the penitents, and who succeeded for a time in eluding arrest. As a rule, it may be said that this was but a temporary reprieve from the all-pervading vigilance of the Inquisition. Sooner or later, it gathered them in despite change of residence and name, and all the precautions of the hunted against the hunter. This is well illustrated in the vicissitudes of a colony of Portuguese, some twenty or thirty in number, in the little town of Beaz, Jain, which throw a vivid light on the miseries of these unfortunates. They had succeeded in living there obscurely for ten years or more, supporting themselves by such industries as they could follow, when some imprudence or the watchfulness of some neighbor drew upon them the attention of the tribunal of Coenza, which arrested thirteen of them. From these, the names of nine others were obtained, for whom warrants of arrest were issued, but, when these were sent for execution in April 1656, it was found that they had left Beas secretly in February, abandoning their property. Five of them were traced to Malaga. The other four were said to have gone to Pietra Buena, but there the track was lost. All were duly prosecuted in absentia, and their effigies formed part of the Seville Auto of 1660. The party that went towards Portugal was a family group of five, Diego Rodriguez Silva, his wife Ana Enriquez, her father Antonio Enriquez Francia, and her brother and sister-in-law, Diego Enriquez and Isabel Rodriguez. They pushed through without stopping to Rio Seco, where they rested four days and then, hiring a guide, they traversed the mountains of Portugal, traveling only by night. Settling in Villa Pinel, they tried to mend their broken fortunes, Ana Enriquez by keeping a shop and Diego Rodriguez by turning his hand to whatever he could find to do. At one time we hear of him as driving a thousand sheep to Lisbon for sale. Apparently, by way of precaution, they appeared spontaneously before the Tribunal of Coimbra, which treated them mercifully, imposing no fines but ordering them not to leave Pinel without permission. Misfortune pursued Diego and, in 1671, he returned to Spain, stopping at Talavera de la Reina, whence he sent for his wife and children and father-in-law, telling the rest to remain. He took the name of Del Aguila for himself and De los Rios for his wife, and settled for two years in Seville, where his father-in-law died. Thence they removed to Damiel, where the Inquisition found them at last and arrested them, February 18, 1677, some seventeen years after they had been burnt in effigy in Seville. As two or three of the Beas fugitives, who had gone to Malaga, were on trial at Toledo in 1667, it is probable that none escaped save those who remained in Portugal. Two years and a half were spent on the trials of Diego and Anna, ending with a sentence of irremissible prison and San Benito. Anna had broken down under this wandering life of incessant vicissitudes and anxiety. 
she had become the victim of epilepsy, melancholia, and hypochondria, when her pitiless judges sent her to prison for life in vindication of a religion of infinite love and charity. End of section 36. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C. www.nyckidd.com Section 37 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Spheres of Action, Chapter 1, Jews, Part 9. An even more pitiful illustration of the miseries endured by these unfortunates, under the implacable vigilance of the Inquisition, is afforded by the case of Isabel, wife of Francisco Palos of Ciudad Rodrigo. In 1608, when 22 years of age, she was tried by the Valladolid Tribunal. Subsequently, she was tried twice, in 1621 and 1626, at Llerena, twice at Coenza in 1653 and 1655, and finally in 1665 at Toledo. Altogether, about 18 years were spent in these trials. The last one, in which she was thrice tortured, continued until 1670, when she was in her 84th year and eluded her tormentors by dying in prison, to be burnt in effigy with her bones as a defunta. Little colonies of Portuguese, like that of Beas, were frequently discovered. Simon Munoz of Pastrana, on trial at Toledo, in 1679, gave the names of 29 accomplices residing there, nearly all of whom figured in an auto particular of December 21, 1680. They had long succeeded in eluding inquisitorial vigilance, for one of them, Maria Enriquez, then 60 years old, testified that she had been brought thither from Lisbon by her parents when a little child and had always lived there. A similar group of Portuguese, in the little town of Berin, Orense, were tried between 1676 and 1678 by the Tribunal of Santiago, and furnished to the Madrid Auto of 1680 two victims relaxed as pertinacious Jews, Baltazar López Cardoso and Feliz López his cousin. There were more than twenty of them in all, and they had long been settled there. Antonio López, one of them, said in 1677 that he was thirty-two years old and had been born in Berin. It was only by the most stringent caution that existence could be maintained under these conditions. Gaspar de Campos, one of the Pastrana group, gives, in his confession, some account of the devices adopted for concealment. On the Sabbath, the mother and girls would sit with reels or spinning wheels before them and, if anyone came in, would pretend to be at work. On fast days, the servant girl would be sent out on an errand. During her absence, food would be taken out of the ola and plates and spoons would be greased. They would then go to the house of a neighbor Jewess and, when the servant followed them, she would be sent back to get her dinner, telling her that they had dined and then the neighbor would do the same. Even in the closest family circle, the utmost reserve was often practiced. Children were not allowed to know anything of Judaism until of an age at which their discretion could be trusted. Parents, indeed, frequently brought up their children as Catholics and left it to others to convert them fortuitously. Pedro Nunez Marquez, tried in Madrid in 1679, testified that he had been inducted into Judaism in Villaflor, Portugal, by Maria Pinto, wife of Alvaro de Morales. After he returned to his father's house in Torre de Moncovo, he hesitated for months to let his parents know of his conversion. At last, in 1653, he told his mother, when she approved of it and said that both she and his father, Francisco Nunez Ramos, were Jews. There were eight children of them. He knew them all to be Jews, but could give no details except as to three sisters. They all assumed each other to be so, but each one attended to his own affairs, to earn a living, and to live with the utmost precaution. As his sister Angela Nunez Marquez expressed it, they all knew each other to be Portuguese. That was sufficient, and further confidences were superfluous. As a matter of course, punctilious regard was paid to all Catholic observances, mass, confession and communion, feast days, and fasts. The dying were duly shriven and had the viaticum. The dead had Christian burial in the churches. 
living thus scattered in small groups or isolated families concealing their secret faith with the utmost care and in perpetual dread of betrayal it is not surprising that distinctive jewish observances were gradually reduced to a minimum and were becoming to a great degree forgotten they had no rabbis to keep them instructed in the countless prescriptions of the oral law and the incidents of days of observance circumcision of course was out of the question it was too compromising and there was no one to perform it unless some specially zealous youth might betake himself to france or to italy for the purpose we hear nothing in the trials of abstinence from pork or the removal of fat from meat or the mortuary laying out of the dead there was an attempt to fast on the day of queen esther when that was known and perhaps on other days of no special note as a spiritual exercise we hear of washing the hands before meals and giving thanks to the God of Israel. Lamps might be lighted on Friday night, but it sufficed to light one and let it burn till it went out. The Sabbath was to be kept by cessation from work, but even this was not always observed, and the changing of body linen is rarely alluded to. Angela Nunez Marquez said that Ana de Nieves and Maria de Murcia had taught her the law of Moses and its ceremonies, which were to rest on the Sabbath and to observe fasts of four and twenty hours without food or drink, yet, during the twenty years of her residence in Pastrana, she had kept only fifteen Sabbaths, for fear of discovery by her husband and servants. Isabel Mendez Correa, who appeared in the Madrid Auto of 1680, when sick some years before, had vowed that, if she recovered, she would rest on Saturdays and light lamps on Fridays, for she deemed her illness a punishment for neglecting the law of Moses. In short, Judaism seems to have resolved itself into Sabbath-keeping with occasional fasting, and into hoping to be saved in the law of Moses and denying Christ and Christian doctrine. All this increased the difficulty of detection and vexed the souls of the inquisitors in both Spain and Portugal. An exhortation addressed to the new Christians in 1640 in Granada by Maestro Gabriel Rodriguez de Escabillas denounces them roundly for thus betraying their faith. So at the Lisbon Auto of September 6, 1705, where the sermon was preached by Diago de Annunciasum, Archbishop of Cranganor, he commenced by addressing the sixty-six penitents before him. Miserable relics of Judaism, unhappy fragments of the synagogue, last remains of Judea, scandal of the Catholics and detestable objects of scorn even to the Jews themselves. You are the detestable objects of scorn to the Jews, for you are so ignorant that you cannot observe the very law under which you live. A truly Christian welcome to repentant sinners, which was deemed worthy of perpetuation by the printing press. Yet in this duplicity, so reprehensible in inquisitorial eyes, there was promise of the final success of the work so unremittingly prosecuted for two centuries. The hammer was gradually wearing away the anvil, only the marvelous constancy of Judaism had enabled it to maintain itself under such conditions, and eventually the Portuguese Judaizers were to be incorporated in the church as, for the most part, their Spanish brethren had been already. Still, the activity of the Inquisition continued to be rewarded with abundant success, and indeed we may say that but for Judaism it would have found little to do. In the public autos of Cordova, from 1655 to 1700, out of 399 persons and effigies brought forward, 324 were for Judaizing. In Toledo, from 1651 to 1700, there were 855 cases tried of every kind, trivial and important, of which 556 were for the same offense. Towards the closing years of the century, there seems to be a decided falling off in the numbers, as though vigilance were becoming relaxed, or the efforts of the tribunals were being crowned with success. But, in a report of pending cases in Valladolid, May July 8, 1699, out of 85, 78 were Judaizers. This activity, however, seems to be largely confined to Castile, as though the Portuguese had not found the kingdoms of Aragon attractive. Reports of cases pending in Valencia in 1694, 5, and 6 show in all but 16, among which there is not a single Judaizer. It is perhaps worthy of passing remark that, in the Treaty of 1668, by which Spain recognized the independence of Portugal, Article 4 provides that the subjects of each power, in the territories of the other, shall enjoy the privileges and immunities granted to British subjects by the treaties of 1630 and 1667. These guaranteed them against molestation for matters of conscience, so long as they gave no occasion for scandal, but, from what we have seen above, it does not appear that the Inquisition of either country paid any attention to this, 
nor is it likely that either government complained of infraction. During this period, the laws restricting the emigration of the new Christians seem to have been mostly in abeyance, but when, in 1666, the false messiah, Zabathia Tzivi, appeared in Palestine and drew a large following of misguided Jews, the Suprema took the alarm. The seaport tribunals were warned that some of the Portuguese would seek to join him, so that if any Portuguese should come and endeavor to embark, they were to be detained under some pretext, their property was to be seized and examined, and a report be sent to the Suprema. Some four months later, Barcelona forwarded the testimony taken in the case of four Portuguese thus detained, when the Suprema ordered their release and that in future, when the evidence showed that they were not fugitives or bound for some suspicious place, they should be allowed to proceed. In this same year, a muleteer named Francisco Nunez Redondo was punished at Toledo as a Judaizer, and for conducting Judaizers out of the country, the two hundred lashes added, in his sentence to reconciliation and prison, being evidently the penalty for this special offense. In 1672, there was another similar alarm. The Suprema informed the tribunals that many families of Portuguese were arranging to pass by way of Bayonne to France. All the roads and paths were therefore to be guarded, and all Portuguese who seemed to be seeking to leave the kingdom were to be seized with their property. Each individual was to be closely examined, his genealogy taken, his past life recorded, his destination and the motives of his journey to be stated, with all other details necessary for a thorough knowledge of his antecedents and purposes, and this information was to be forwarded to the Suprema with the opinion of the tribunal. Similar precautions were ordered at the Mediterranean seaports, but the object of this action was not stated. Valladares, who was Inquisitor General from 1669 to 1695, seems to have taken a different view of this curiously perverse policy of preventing the emigration of disaffected apostates. August 12, 1681, he sent to someone near the king an anonymous memorial setting forth the invincible obstinacy of the Jews. Penance and punishment left them as wicked as before, resulting in many evils, such as the engagement in noble houses of Jewish wet nurses, who infect the children with their milk, the employment by conversos of young children whom they pervert, the sacrilege of the sacraments administered to them, and the like. The remedy for this was the immediate exile of all who were penanced or, if they were allowed to remain, the branding of them on the forehead with the arms of the Inquisition. Valladares was probably the author of the memorial, for he makes this hideous suggestion his own, urging it with all the authority of the Inquisition, and invoking the judgment of heaven on his correspondent if he fails to lay the paper before the king. Carlos sent it to the Suprema for its opinion, and the matter went no further, but the document is not without interest as a revelation of the methods which persecutors were willing to adopt to escape from the consequences of their own acts. Although it was the Portuguese immigration which supplied the apparently inexhaustible harvest of culprits throughout the 17th century, there was one corner of Spain which escaped the influx and where the old conversos continued to cherish their secret faith with little or no molestation. Allusion has more than once been made above to the Majorca catastrophe of 1691 and, as an episode of Spanish Judaism, its details deserve consideration. In the massacre of 1391, some of the Mallorquin Jews escaped to Barbary, but the majority remained. The governor, Francisco Segariga, had been wounded in endeavoring to protect them. They were won over to conversion by the terror of death, and the promise of the authorities to give them 20,000 libras wherewith to pay their debts, a promise which seems never to have been fulfilled. They continued to inhabit the call or Jewish quarter, and, although the Alhama came to an end in 1410, its members remained as a separate community. The conversion was as superficial as was to be anticipated, and though, as nominal Christians, they were not affected by the expulsion of 1492, when the Inquisition was introduced we have seen, from the numbers who came in under Edicts of Grace, that they must all have been Jews at heart, for between 1488 and 1491 there were no less than 568 reconciliations, besides those who, by special mercy, were reconciled twice. After this, for a while the tribunal was fairly active. Between 1489, when it commenced operations, and 1535, it sentenced 164 to reconciliation, 99 to relaxation in person, and 460 to relaxation in effigy, all of whom were presumably Judaizers except, in 1535, five Moriscos who were relaxed. After this, the persecution grew inert, relaxations disappear, and reconciliations become few. 
So insignificant had the tribunal become that when, in 1549, the offices of fiscal and receiver fell vacant, Valdez wrote to ask what was the necessity of filling them. He might well ask the question, between 1552 and 1567, the tribunal had but two reconciliations to show and, during the remainder of the century, only thirty, together with a single relaxation, and of the few culprits the majority were not Judaizers. In the 17th century, the record was even slenderer. Engaged, for the most part as we have seen, in unappeasable conflicts with the ecclesiastical authorities, the duties of persecution were neglected, and heretic and apostate breathed in comparative peace. The reconciliation of Maria Diaz, September 6, 1571, was followed by a century in which not a single Judaizer was reconciled, although, in 1675, one from Madrid was relaxed. The inhabitants of the call might well deem themselves secure, especially as the churchmen were free in their denunciations of the tribunal. In 1668, the inquisitor complained to the Suprema that the priests of the Episcopal party talked of the Inquisition as a secret heresy, and that it was a den of robbers which should be abolished, all of which led to much license of speech among the suspected persons who dwelt in the separate barrio. From this sense of security there was a rude awakening. In 1677 or 1678, a meeting, held in a garden outside of the city, attracted the inquisitor's attention. It was designated as a synagogue, and doubtless there was some imprudence. Secret investigation developed evidence justifying wholesale arrests, and the prison was soon crowded. The result appeared in four autos celebrated in 1679, in which there were no less than 219 reconciliations. There was no spirit of martyrdom. In all cases it was a first conviction, and when all confessed and begged for mercy there was no opportunity for relaxation. A noteworthy feature was the absence of prosecutions of the dead, which could have been numerous had the tribunal been disposed to take the trouble. But this is doubtless explicable by the fact that as the whole community of new Christians was involved, all its property was confiscated, and there would have been no profit in looking up ancestral heresies. The confiscations were enormous. The culprits were merchants and traders and bankers whose houses and lands, censos and merchandise and credits were swept away. The sum realized is stated at 1,496,276 pesos, which is probably far below the real value of the assets seized. We have seen how the king was gradually shouldered out of his share of the spoils. The tribunal secured a goodly portion with which it rebuilt the palace of the Inquisition in a style so sumptuous that it passed for one of the finest in Spain, until it was demolished in 1822 and its site converted into a public plaza. The tribunal ordered all new Christians to dwell in the call and required them, on all feasts of precept, to attend mass in the cathedral in a body, preceded by a minister of the Inquisition and in charge of an alguazil. Impoverished, dishonored, and watched, the position became intolerable. A number resolved to expatriate themselves and secretly made arrangements with an English ship lying in the harbor to carry them away. The passage money was paid and they succeeded in embarking, but rough weather detained the ship. They had not procured the necessary licenses to leave Spain. They were seized and cast into prison with the members of their families. This occurred in 1688 and three years were consumed in their trials. The result was seen in the four autos held in March, May, and July, 1691. For those who had been reconciled in 1679 and were now convicted of relapse, there could be no pardon. A huge brasero, 80 feet square and 80 feet high, with 25 stakes, was prepared on the seashore, two miles from the city, in order that the people might not be incommoded by the stench. In all, 37 were relaxed in person, of whom only three were pertinacious to the last and were burnt alive. Eight were relaxed in effigy, of whom four were fugitives and four were dead, three of the latter having died in prison. There were fifteen reconciliations in person, and three in effigy. Finally, there were twenty-four who, although among the reconciled of 1679, escaped with abjuration de levi and fines amounting to sixty-four hundred libras. This shows that the little community had already begun to repair its shattered fortunes, and renders it probable that the confiscations of the relaxed and reconciled rewarded the tribunal abundantly for its labors. The lesson seems to have been sufficiently severe to serve its purpose. We hear nothing more of Judaism in Majorca. During the height of the persecution elsewhere, the tribunal celebrated two autos, May 31, 1722, and July 2, 1724, in which nine penitents appeared, but none of them were Judaizers. 
although the new Christians were still confined to their separate quarter, in time, as we have seen, they became thoroughly Catholic. End of section 37. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C. www.nyckidd.com Section 38 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Spheres of Action, Chapter 1, Jews, Part 10. With the opening of the 18th century, it looked as though the victory over Judaism had been virtually won. The war of secession must of course have interfered with the operations of the Inquisition, but this does not suffice to explain the marked falling off in the numbers of Judaizers in the autos, so far as manifested by the records before me. In Catalonia, which held out long after the rest of Spain was pacified, the Inquisition was fairly re-established in 1715, after which, for three years, the Barcelona Tribunal, out of a total of 25 cases, had but three of Jews, a mother and two daughters who had fled from Seville and had been traced to Catalonia. In Cordova, the records are imperfect, but, as far as they go, from 1700 to 1720, they show but five cases. In Toledo, during the same 21 years, out of a total of 88 trials, only 23 were for Judaism. The fires of persecution, however, were only slumbering and broke out again suddenly with renewed fierceness. Possibly this may be attributable to the discovery in Madrid of an organized synagogue, composed of 20 families who, since 1707, had been accustomed to meet for their devotions and, in 1714, had elected a rabbi, whose name they sent to Leghorn for confirmation. Comparative immunity had brought recklessness and we are told that they observed the Christian fast days with dancing and guitar playing. Five of them were relaxed in the auto of April 7, 1720. It was probably this discovery that aroused the other tribunals to renewed activity, which was abundantly rewarded, for there seems at this time to have been little concealment by Judaizers. In the Toledo Alto of March 19, 1721, Sebastian Antonio de Paz, administrador del tobacco, is asserted to have married the daughter of his wife, and Francisco de Mendoza y Rodriguez, his first cousin, according to the law of Moses. For some years this revival of persecution raged with a virulence rivaling that of the earlier period. In a collection of 64 autos, held between 1721 and 1727, there were in all 868 cases, of which 820 were for Judaism, nor did the tribunals err on the side of mercy. There were 75 relaxations in person and 74 in effigy, while scourging, the galleys and imprisonment were lavishly imposed. The geographical distribution of the culprits is worthy of note. The kingdoms of the crown of Aragon show few traces of Judaism. Valencia contributed but 20 cases, Barcelona 5, Saragossa 1, and Majorca none, or 26 in all. Among the tribunals of the crown of Castile, Legroño held no auto during these years. Santiago furnished only four cases, while Granada had 229, Seville 167, and Cordova 78. The years 1722 and 1723 were those in which persecution was most active, the number diminishing rapidly afterwards. It still, however, continued at intervals. In Cordova there were autos in 1728, 1730, and 1731, in which there were in all 26 cases of Judaism. Then there was an interval until 1745, when only two cases occurred. In Toledo, after 1726, there was no case of Judaism until 1738, when there were 14. This seems to have exhausted the material for prosecution, for until the Toledan record ends in 1794, there was but a single subsequent case, which occurred in 1756. In Madrid, there were several Jews relaxed in 1732, charged with scourging and burning an image of Christ, in a house of the Calle de la Saint-Fonce. 
In Valladolid, at an auto, June 13, 1745, there was one Judaizer relaxed and four reconciled, while in Seville, July 4th, although there were four Muslims, there was not a single Jew. At Yerena, in 1752, we hear of the relaxation of six effigies of fugitives and one of a dead woman, which must evidently have been cases of Judaism. These scattering details can make no pretension to completeness, and yet they suffice to show that Judaism at least was substantially rooted out of Spanish soil, after a continuous struggle of three centuries. How complete was this eradication is manifested by a summarized list of all cases of every kind, coming before all the tribunals, from 1780 until the suppression of the Inquisition in 1820, embracing an aggregate of over 5,000. In these forty years, the whole number of prosecutions connected with Judaism was but sixteen, and of these, ten were foreigners who had evaded the laws prohibiting entrance to Jews while, of the six natives, four were prosecuted for suspicions and propositions. The latest case was at Cordova, in 1818, of Manuel Santiago Vivar, for Judaizing acts, the final scene in the long tragedy which had secured uniformity of faith at the cost of so much blood and suffering. During this later period, the exclusion of foreign Jews was exercising the holy office much more than the detection of native ones. The savage law will be remembered by which, in 1499, Ferdinand and Isabella prohibited the return of the expelled Jews or the entrance of foreigners under pain of death and confiscation. Although this law was retained on the statute book, it probably was not enforced in all its ferocity, but the maintenance of the exclusion was inevitable when such unremitting pains were taken to exterminate Judaism. When the visita de navios, or examination of all ships arriving at Spanish ports, were organized, the keeping out of the Jews was held in view as much as that of Lutheran heretics and books. If a Jew were found on board, he was to be examined. If he admitted baptism, he was to be seized and his goods were to be confiscated. If unbaptized and he made no attempt to land, he was to be allowed to depart with the ship. Still, the indefatigable mercantile energy of the Jews and the venality of officials, to a limited extent, neutralized these precautions. In 1656, the trial at Murcia of Enrique Pereira, whose domicile was in Luca and who was arrested while trading at Beas, shows that there was intercourse between the Portuguese in Spain and their brethren in Italy. Those of Spain would go by sea to Nice or elsewhere to enjoy freedom of worship, while Italian Jews came to Spain to trade in spite of inquisitorial vigilance. These furtive attempts, with their perils, were but tantalizing to those who looked with longing on the tempting Spanish market. Licenses to come were much more desirable, and we have seen that, in 1634, under Olivares, they were sometimes issued. More unlucky in 1679 was Samuel de Jacob, who was thrown in prison, although he held a license, and we are told that, although those who held licenses could not be prosecuted as heretics, still, if they blasphemed or derided the faith, they could be chastised with fines, scourging, or the galleys, according to the resultant scandal, while attempts to proselyte incurred capital punishment. In 1689, special orders were issued to disregard an agreement which Don Pedro Ronquillo, under powers from the king, had made with an English Jew enabling him to land at any port in Spain. Such care was exercised to avert any danger of polluting the Spanish soil by a Jewish foot that when, in 1713, by the Treaty of Utrecht, Gibraltar was ceded to England, it was under the condition that no Jews or Moors should be permitted to reside there. The inobservance of this by England was a subject of complaint, but it is not likely that many intruders risked the dangers that attended an attempt of a foreign Jew to enter Spain. In January 1697, Abraham Rodriguez, traveling from France to Portugal under the name of Antonio Mazado, was arrested at Ledesma and brought to the tribunal of Valladolid. Two years and a half later, his trial was still in progress, but, though we do not know the result, the experience was not such as to invite imitation. When, in the general relaxation of the 18th century, the sternness of these laws was tacitly abandoned, embarrassing precautions rendered sojourn uninviting. In 1756, Abraham Seleucix, a Jew of Jerusalem, ventured to Valencia with a lion for sale. The shipmaster reported him, and a familiar was deputed to accompany him day and night, on board and on shore, never to let him out of his sight or to communicate with anyone. 
the count of almenara bought the lion and salasux was permitted to be in the count's house for a few days until a cage was constructed for the beast after which he re-embarked the same course was followed in seventeen fifty nine with a jew who came with merchandise from gibraltar a familiar never left him till his goods were sold and he departed while his books and papers were carefully scrutinized to see that they contained nothing prejudicial there were others who came in seventeen sixty one and seventeen sixty two who were treated in the same fashion then in seventeen ninety five a royal order was issued through the suprema to the effect that a jewish subject of the bay of morocco would come to valencia and remain for eight or ten days who was not to be troubled in any way the tribunal consequently took no notice of his coming and going these were all the cases that search through the records of valencia could find from sixteen forty five to eighteen hundred and their paucity shows how rarely jews braved the dangers of visiting spain those who tried to do so in secret took the chances of detection in seventeen eighty one jacobo Pereira landed at cadiz under a false name and concealing his faith but he was found out arrested and the seville tribunal at once commenced his prosecution it is true that a royal order of april twenty fifth seventeen eighty six permitted the entrance of jews who bore license from the king but these were sparingly granted and only on special occasions the question of greater liberality came up in seventeen ninety seven when the finance minister don pedro de valera as a means of reviving the commerce and industry of spain proposed that jews might be allowed to establish factories in cadiz and other ports but the council of ministers rejected the project as contrary to the laws apparently the discussion continued and in eighteen hundred the suprema called on all the tribunals for reports as to their treatment of jews seeking admission and the result appears in a royal cedula of june eighth eighteen o two declaring in full force all laws and pragmaticas therefore issued and ordering the rigorous execution of the penalties therein provided while any default in lending to the inquisition due assistance for this holy purpose was threatened with the royal indignation the confusion of the napoleonic wars afforded opportunities for enterprising jews which were not likely to be overlooked and fernando the seventh deemed it necessary august sixteenth eighteen sixteen to issue a decree renewing and confirming the cedula of eighteen o two it was easier to publish the decree than to enforce it the tribunal of seville june twelfth eighteen nineteen represented to the suprema its perplexities arising from the influx of jews at algeciras cadiz and seville who came to the tribunal begging for baptism they were indigent beggars and probably fugitive criminals but as occasionally there might be one whose object was really salvation to deprive him of this would be a heavy burden on the conscience and consequently the tribunal asked for instructions this resulted in an order of the inquisitor general july tenth to all the tribunals insisting on the strict enforcement of the decrees of seventeen eighty six and eighteen o two such jews as obtained a royal license were to be vigilantly watched and if the secular officials manifested lack of zeal and cooperation the inquisitor general was to be notified at the same time orders were sent to the commissioners at all the ports to observe strictly the old instructions as to the visitas de navios and to report as to the current practice barcelona replied that the visits were made only when there were jews on board alessante reported that the disuse of the visits had led to a rapid immigration of jews into mercia cartagena said that no visits were made but that if suspicious persons arrived the custom-house officers notified the commissioner cadiz and algeciras answered that the health officer notified the commissioner of the arrival of jews renegades and other forbidden persons when he took the necessary steps to revert the evil motril said that visits were made only when there was a jew on board santiago merely responded that it had the royal decrees of seventeen eighty six and eighteen o two and the recent instructions of the suprema evidently there was little attention paid to the enforcement of the laws by both the royal and inquisitorial officials but the government was determined to enforce the exclusion of jews and an order was promptly sent to all the royal officials that no jew was to be allowed to set foot on spanish territory unless he bore a royal license if he had one he was to present himself to the inquisition or its commissioner so that a record could be made of him and the tribunal was instructed to keep him under strict supervision the ministry of gracia y justicia communicated this august thirty first eighteen nineteen to the suprema which in turn forwarded it september sixth to all the tribunals with orders for its strict observance the inquisition came to an end a few months after this 
but the prejudices which it had done so much to foster postponed the removal from the statute book of the laws representing the fierce intolerance of the earlier time in eighteen forty eight we are told that although unrepealed they were not enforced and that jews could travel and trade in spain without molestation but when in eighteen fifty four constitutional cortes were assembled to frame a new constitution and the german jews sent dr ludwig philipson rabbi of magdeburg on a mission to procure free admission of their race his eloquence was unavailing it was not until fifteen years later when the revolution which drove isabella the second from the throne called for a new organic law that the constitution of eighteen sixty nine proclaimed freedom of belief and guaranteed it to all residents in spain and this was likewise applicable to natives professing other religions than the catholic this principle was preserved in the constitution of eighteen seventy six which forbade all interference with religious belief while not allowing public ceremonies other than those of catholicism it was a remarkable proof of conversion from ancient error when in eighteen eighty three the jewish refugees from russia sent by the organizing committees of germany were enthusiastically received although the experiment ended in disastrous failure the ancestral antipathy which they had to encounter was however still active as expressed by a pious franciscan who declared that bringing them was a sin of moral and political treason and that they would devour the whole spanish nation End of section 38. Recording by Robert Sherman, Jr., Washington, D.C., www.nyckidd.com. Section 39 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Chapter 2, Spheres of Action, Moriscos, Part 1. We have seen that, in the progress of the reconquest, as Moorish territories were successively won, the inhabitants were largely allowed to remain under guarantees for the free enjoyment of their religions and customs. These mudejeres, as they were called, formed a most useful portion of the population through their industry and skill in the arts and crafts. When, in 1368, Charles Le Moiva of Navarre granted to the mudejeres of Tadula a remission of half their taxes for three years, in reward of their assistance during his wars, especially in fortification and engineering, it shows that the conquering race depended on them not merely for manual labor but for the higher branches of applied knowledge as a rule they were faithful in peace and war during the long centuries of internal strife between the christians and of struggles with their co-religionists it was the jews against whom was directed the growing intolerance of the fifteenth century and in the massacres that occurred there appears to have been no hostility manifested against the mudejeres when Alfonso de Borgia, Archbishop of Valencia, afterwards Calixtus III, supported by Cardinal Juan de Torquemada, urged their expulsion on Juan II of Aragon, although he appointed a term for their exile, he reconsidered the matter and left them undisturbed. So when, in 1480, Isabella ordered the expulsion from Andalusia of all Jews who refused baptism, and when, in 1486, Ferdinand did the same in Aragon, they both respected the old capitulations and left the Mudejeres alone. The time-honored policy was followed in the conquest of Granada, and nothing could be more liberal than the terms conceded to the cities and districts that surrendered. The final capitulation of the city of Granada was a solemn agreement, signed November 25, 1491, in which Ferdinand and Isabella, for themselves, for their son the Infante Juan, and for all their successors, received the Moors of all places that should come into the agreement as vassals and natural subjects under the royal protection, and as such to be honored and respected. Religion, property, freedom to trade, laws, and customs were all guaranteed, and even renegades from Christianity among them were not to be maltreated, while Christian women marrying Moors were free to choose their religion. For three years, those desiring expatriation were to be transported to Barbary at the royal expense, and refugees in Barbary were allowed to return. 
when after the execution of this agreement the moors with not unnatural distrust wanted further guarantees the sovereigns made a solemn declaration in which they swore by god that all moors should have full liberty to work on their lands or to go wherever they desired through the kingdoms and to maintain their mosques and religious observances as heretofore while those who desired to emigrate to barbary could sell their property and depart it was the wise traditional policy of incorporating the conquered population in the state on an equal footing with other subjects and trusting to time to merge them all into a common mass holding one faith and owing allegiance to one country whether it was distrust of christian good faith that impelled them or a natural desire to leave the scene of their defeat a large portion of the grenadian moors including most of the nobles promptly availed themselves of the right of expatriation before the year 1492 was out, it was reported to the sovereigns that the Aben Saranges had gone, almost in a body, and that, in the Alpujarras, few were left save laborers and officials. The emigration continued, and in 1498, a letter of Ferdinand indicates that he was inclined to stimulate it. While there might be good reasons for diminishing the large population of those recently vanquished, who presumably might cherish hopes of independence, and had not forgotten the bitterness of unsuccessful struggle, this was accompanied with a readiness to increase the number of mudejares who had adapted themselves to the situation, and who were regarded as in every way a desirable element in the community. When Manuel of Portugal expelled the Moors who refused baptism, Ferdinand and Isabella welcomed them to Spain. Royal letters were issued, April 20th, 1497, permitting their entrance with all their property, either to settle or in transit to other lands. They were taken under the royal protection, and all molestation of them was forbidden. Up to this time, at least, there was no recognition of the political necessity of unity of faith, which subsequently served as jurisdiction for cruel intolerance and unwise statesmanship. Yet the statesmanship of the day, if not yet prepared to regard unity of faith as a political necessity, considered it politically advantageous, while pious zeal inevitably sought the salvation of the multitudes of souls thus brought under Christian rule. The third king of Spain, González de Mendoza, Cardinal Archbishop of Toledo, and other prelates at the court, urged upon the sovereigns that gratitude to God required them to give their new subjects the alternative of baptism or exile. Ferdinand and Isabella, however, turned a deaf ear to this advice, either not caring to break the faith so recently pledged, or to provoke another war. The work of conversion had already been commenced with fair prospects of success, and it could safely be left to time. Isabella's confessor, the saintly Hernando de Talavera, had been made Archbishop of Granada. He was devoting his revenues and his tireless labors to missionary work, inculcating Christianity by example more potent than precept. He relieved suffering, he preached and he taught all who would listen to him. He required his assistance to learn Arabic, and he acquired it himself. He won many converts, and there was a flattering prospect that his apostolic methods would bring the mass of the population into the fold. The process, however, was too slow for the impatience that looked for immediate results. Ferdinand and Isabella were in Granada from July until November 1499, and called in Jimenez to the aid of Talavera. His extraordinary energy and imperious temper soon made themselves felt. With liberal presence, he gained the favor of the principal Moors. He held conferences with the Alfaquias, whom he induced to instruct their people, and it is said that, on December 18th, 3,000 were baptized, and the mosque of the Albacine, or Moorish Quarter, was consecrated as the Church of San Salvador. The stricter Moslems became alarmed and endeavored to check the movement by persuasion, whereupon Jimenez had them imprisoned in chains. He summoned the Alfaquias to surrender all their religious books, of which five thousand, many of them priceless specimens of art, were publicly burnt. The situation was becoming strained, the Moors were restive under the disregard of their guarantees, and Jimenez grew more and more impetuous. Rupture, under these conditions, was inevitable, and Jimenez soon brought it about. Christian renegades, known as the Elches, were protected under the capitulations, but he argued that this did not extend to their children who, if not baptized, ought to have been, and who thus were subject to the Inquisition. From the Inquisitor General Deza, he procured a delegation of power to deal with them and used it for their arrest. 
it chanced that a young daughter of a renegade thus arrested while being dragged through the plaza of bib el bonot cried out that she was to be forcibly baptized in violation of the capitulations the crowd collected and from words soon came to blows the alguazil was slain with a paving stone and his companion escaped only by a moorish woman conveying him away and hiding him under a bed the agitation increased the moors flew to arms skirmished with the christians and besieged jimenez in his house he had a guard of two hundred men who defended the place until morning when the captain-general tendilla came from the alhambra with troops and drove away the mob for ten days talavera jimenez and tendilla parleyed with the moors who urged that they had not risen against the sovereigns but in defense of the royal faith that the officials had violated the capitulations the observance of which would restore peace then talavera with his chaplain and a few unarmed servants went to the plaza bib el Bano, where the moors kissed the hem of his garments as of old tendilla followed and promised pardon if they should lay down their arms as it should be understood that they were not in revolt but had only sought to maintain the capitulations which should be strictly observed in the future the city became quiet those who had slain the alguazil were surrendered and four of them were hanged the moors cast aside their arms and returned to work with such a population kindness and fair dealing alone were required to accomplish the desired results but the inflexible temper of jimenez had been aroused and he was resolved on the forcible accomplishment of his purpose the rumors of the disturbance had greatly alarmed the court at seville and jimenez was bitterly reproached but he hurried thither gave his own version of the affair and pointed out that the moors had forfeited life and property by rebellion so that pardon should be conditioned on accepting baptism or expatriation with fatal facility his arguments were accepted tendilla's promises were ignored the capitulations were cast aside the moors were taught how little reliance was to be placed on the christian faith distrust and hatred were to be rendered ineradicable and a religion was to be forced upon them which could not be but odious as the visible sign of their subjection from this false step sprang the incurable trouble which weakened spain until statesmanship could devise no remedy save the deplorable expulsion of the most useful and efficient portion of her population it was not without reason that the admiring biographer of jimenez admits that so imperious was his temper that he sometimes acted through fury rather than through prudence as was seen in the conversion of the granadan moors and in the attempt to conquer africa he returned to granada armed with full powers and offered to the people the alternative of baptism or punishment while a royal judge sent for the purpose sharpened their apprehension by executing or imprisoning the more active of the rioters the choice was readily made and they came forward in thousands for the saving waters of baptism instruction in the new faith was impossible nor was it wanted when they asked for it in their own language and talavara had the offices and parts of the gospels printed in arabic jimenez objected it was he said casting pearls before swine it was in the nature of the vulgar to despise what they could understand and to reverence that which was mysterious and beyond their comprehension he cared little for heartfelt conversion so long as he could secure outward conformity the number thus rudely inducted into the faith in the city and the vega was estimated at from fifty to seventy thousand and the process which converted them could result only in undying hate for the religion thus forced upon them although no outbreak occurred during this forcible missionary work the discontent which it excited was threatening and ferdinand returned to granada where he made no secret of his displeasure at the imprudent zeal of jimenez especially as it interfered with his designs on naples these had to be postponed to meet the imminent danger at home for although emigration had been large many had taken refuge in the alpujarras and were exciting the mountaineers to revolt to meet this he wrote january twenty seventh fifteen hundred to the leading moors assuring them that all reports that they were to be christianized by force were false and pledging the royal faith that not a single compulsory baptism would be made to reconcile those who had been baptized and to attract others he issued february twenty seventh a general pardon to all new christians for crimes committed prior to baptism and renouncing his claims to confiscation meanwhile he had been engaged in raising an army as large as though the conquest was to be repeated and with this he was engaged during the rest of the year in quelling the revolts which broke out in one place after another supplementing military operations with friars dispatched through the mountains to instruct the converts massacre and baptism went hand in hand until the alpujarras were pacified and the army was disbanded january fourteenth fifteen o one 
then there came trouble in the western districts of ronda and the sierra bermeja where the mountaineers rose in dread of enforced conversion another army was raised which suffered a severe defeat at caladui this brought a pause during which the insurgents asked to be allowed to emigrate ferdinand drove a hard bargain with them demanding ten doblas for the passage money and requiring those who could not pay this to remain and submit to baptism the baptized lowlanders who had taken to the mountains were allowed to return home surrendering their arms and suffering confiscation large numbers escaped to africa but more remained to curse the faith thus imposed on them to these new christians as we have seen expatriation was forbidden baptism imposed an indelible character and incorporation with the church subjected them to a jurisdiction which could not be shaken off it was vitally important that these new christians should be interfused with the rest of the population with the same rights and privileges so that in time they might form a contented whole but this was not to be one wrong always breeds another the disregard of compacts and the violent methods of conversion inevitably rendered them objects of suspicion and an edict of september first fifteen o one prohibited the new converts from bearing or possessing arms publicly or secretly under penalty for a first offence of confiscation and two months imprisonment and of death for a second an edict which was repeated in fifteen eleven and again in fifteen fifteen not only was this a bitter humiliation but a serious infliction at a time when weapons were a necessity for self-protection there was however another distinction between the classes favorable to the new christians for it was provided that for forty years they should not be subjected to the inquisition in order that they might have full time to acquire knowledge of their new faith yet like all other promises this was made only to be broken it was thus in less than ten years after the capitulation that the moors of granada found themselves to be christians in defiance of the pledges so solemnly given such a commencement could have but one result and we shall see its outcome something might be urged in palliation of this forcible propaganda in that it was unpremeditated and brought about in the turbulence of a settlement between hostile races and religions and that those who rejected conversion were allowed to depart all this was lacking in the next step towards enforcing unity of faith we have seen how the mudejares of castile were loyal and contented subjects living under compacts centuries old which guaranteed them the full enjoyment of their religion and laws to disturb this and convert them by a flagrant breach of faith into plotting domestic enemies without even a colorable pretext would appear to be an act of madness yet it was this that isabella was led to do under the influence of her ghostly counsellors among whom jimenez can probably be reckoned as the most influential in bringing about the conversion of granada he had cared for little beyond outward conformity and this could be secured among the scattered and peaceful mudejares without encountering the risk attending the attempt among the mountaineers of the alpujarras while subsequently the inquisition could be depended upon for what might be lacking in religious conviction god should no longer be insulted by infidel rites in spain and the land could not fail to be blessed when thus united in the true faith such we may assume to have been the reasoning which led isabella to a measure so disastrous that ferdinand's practical sense disapproved of it may be inferred from the fact that when he talked of similar action in aragon he readily yielded to the remonstrances of his nobles persuasion backed by threats was first essayed instructions were sent to the royal officials that the mudejares must adopt christianity and when the corregidor of cordova replied that force would be necessary the sovereigns replied september twenty seventh fifteen o one that this was inadmissible as it would scandalize them they were to be told that it was for the good of their souls and the service of the king and queen and if this proved insufficient they could be informed that they would have to leave the kingdom for it was resolved that no infidels should remain but four years had elapsed since the refugee moors from portugal had been invited to settle in castile and this sudden change of policy shows what influences had been brought to bear on isabella during that brief interval this tentative measure seems to have met with success so slender that more stringent methods were recognized as necessary and on february twelfth fifteen o two a pragmatica was issued shrewdly framed to give at least the appearance of voluntary action to the expected conversion it alluded to the scandal of permitting infidels to remain after the conversion of granada to the gratitude due to god which would fitly be shown by the expulsion of his enemies and to the protection of the new christians from contamination all moors were therefore ordered to leave the kingdoms of leon and castile by the end of april abandoning their children the males under fourteen and the females under twelve years of age who were to be detained 
the exiles were allowed to carry with them their property except gold and silver and other prohibited articles there was nothing said as to an alternative of baptism but the conditions of departure rendered expatriation so difficult that it was self-evident that there was no intention of losing so valuable a portion of the population under pain of death and confiscation exiles were to sail only from the ports of biscay they were not allowed to go to navarre or to the kingdoms of aragon as there was war with the turks and with the moors of africa they were not to seek refuge with either but were told that they might go to egypt or to any other land that they might select they were never to return nor were moors ever to be admitted to the castilian kingdoms under penalty of death and confiscation and any one harboring them after april was threatened with confiscation one exception was made in favor of masters of moorish slaves who were not deprived of them but they were to be distinguished by the perpetual wearing of fetters the involuntary character of the conversion which ensued is revealed in the fact that when zealous muslims in spite of almost insuperable obstacles preferred to risk the perils of emigration they were not allowed to do so but were forced to become christians during the brief interval allowed there was some pretense of preaching and instruction and as it neared its end the mudahares were baptized in masses a report from avila april twenty fourth to the sovereigns says that the whole alhama consisting of two thousand souls will be converted and none will depart in barajos we are told that the bishop alfonso de manrique the future inquisitor general won them over by kindness so that they were all baptized and took his name of manrique thus externally at least the kingdoms of the crown of castile enjoyed unity of faith but this was not accompanied with the desirable assimilation of the population the new converts continued to form a class apart and came to be known by the distinctive name of moriscos end of section thirty nine